also do you want to make more money? Hey, you should do this because <laughs> these are consumers, That's absolutely and we need to, yeah. and we have a responsibility right. in reaching out to these consumers. So, how do you decide what to focus on? Uh, we we present no, that we have a, we have a moderator, yeah. and uh, we send our presentations to them in terms of this is my title, okay. this is what I intend okay. to talk about. And and I can make those connections. Yeah, well, that's definitely you. Are you here for both days? Okay, well, I'm here too, so that's definitely My wife should be here tomorrow. She should be here tonight, I guess. She didn't make it last night. Exactly, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, let's talk. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, for me and my. Oh, it's been a lot of time I meet you. Yeah, I'm not the right. Test, 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 test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. It's to shorten the person first language or person with a disability. But that most people don't say the whole thing and they say PWD. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you because the community is so sensitive about a whole range of things. So they've tried to move away from that because it sounds like it's kind of objectifying some people. PWD, you're an actor. So they but, but look what they, what they changed. I'm a native speaker that helps a lot of Uh, but it's a, 
But anyway, it's um, it's a uh, ASEAN Regional Committee on uh, this uh, on on human rights. Acher, that's the name of Acher. ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. So it's called Acher. So within Acher, there is a disability component. Uh, one of my former students was. I don't know if he's helping to lead it, but he was he was advising them um, and uh, trying to help all of the ASEAN countries align their policy infrastructure with the CIP and so forth. But I think what you're doing with the studies is really critical because with the CRP, each country is coming and reporting on their progress, and then every two years the countries are required to submit a report, a written report, a state report, on their progress. But what you can do in your organization can also submit what's called a shadow report or an alternative report, which if you submit it to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, it sits alongside the government report, you have your shadow report. So let's say the government has a report that's supposed to be comprehensive, but you have a study that's like on the same website here. You can see that you can show with that study that the government has a lot of accessible data. And so, yeah, we can talk about this a lot. So please do right, reach out to me and stay in touch, because I, I love to oh. keep doing that. <laughs> and then we, we turned over all of our work in Southeast Asia to a network of universities that are part of the uh, ASEAN University Network. Yes. So I don't know what they've done. The first one is staying in touch with them. But the yeah. other one that I'm talking about, just the, the, uh, the, the commission that has been on church, I still am yeah. connected to them. So. Yeah, thank yeah. you for coming. I tried to too, but it's time for it. Me too. 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 Me you know, you just went to Clyde's and... Oh yeah, Clyde's is good. Yeah, yeah, Did you see the train? Oh yeah, I saw, you saw the train. My son loves the train. Yo, he loves it. He loves the train. Let's see, did I get my... Oh, hey. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. All right. So I'll send you an email. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We already have emails. So, so my wife just got back. She, she spent 10 days What are you Okay. Yeah. It'll, I think it'll be two weeks. Let me tell you what it'll take. That's something else that we can help us. We have the university. We have the university. I think you need to wire it up for a wire. If she needs a place where she needs classes. Well, I guess she's a school. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. To so provide that. But is it a lab or are you just being the handheld wireless? No. No, because I, I know another big professor from John Armstrong who also makes workshops in this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch my eyes. For now, let's go out of the way. She came back from the last initiative. Check. Check. Are we using Great. Awesome. And Joe will just tell you what the Let's figure out something. Definitely. I'm excited about that. Okay, where is the robot? Okay, where do we do with it? Do I leave it now like that? Hello? 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 Nice job. Do I leave it on like that now? Hello? This one? <laughs> There it is. There it is. Now it's on. Good day. Are these on? Turn it on. Oh,
I'm hearing them up there and I'm not hearing them in the room. Test, test, test. So it's a little quiet. But these should be working too, so. Test, 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 test. Test, test. That one's a bit quiet, so I need to turn it up. Test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. So they're all on, I need to just turn them up a bit. Okay. So we can just use these. Well, how, how many are you? Three? Three, and then Joe's going to be at the podium first. Okay. So, yeah, this one's Q&A. Okay. Alright, folks, take your seats. Alright. Let's get this panel. Uh, I figured. You're going to wait to bring people up after Joe? Yeah, here next. Are you connected or? Uh, he's going to bend slides. Okay, great. Uh, if you, are you going to do a. Do you want me to go up now? I can. Or? I think basically, yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right, everyone. Go from ICANN. I'll let you introduce yourself. Ready to go? All right. Well, thank you to NASIG once again for, for having me here. Um, my name is Joe Catapano, and I am the Senior Manager for Stakeholder Engagement focused on the North America region at ICANN. I don't think we've actually said what ICANN means yet. Um, so ICANN stands for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. And my, the first half of my deck here will focus on those last two letters, N and N. Um, I'm based here in Washington, D.C. Yes, ICANN does have offices, and we have one here. Um, it's slightly, it's uh, what we call an engagement center, so it's a slightly smaller office. Um, but uh, there are a lot of ICANN organization functions uh, that reside in that office, stakeholder engagement, communications, policy, um, just to name a few. So uh, I, I want to thank uh, Derek and American University. This is very uh, special for me. I am a proud AU Eagle, uh, graduate of the School of Public Affairs. Thank you. So being able to, to come back here and speak at AU uh, is certainly something special. When I, when I came out of graduate school at AU, I had a graduate degree in political science. My undergraduate work, which I did back in Connecticut, was in communications. And I was searching for something that blended those two fields. And it took a little bit of time, but eventually I found ICANN, and that was it. That was the perfect blend of those two things. So if you're younger, you're just starting out your career, or you're still in school, you're trying to find out where do I fit in this space, I'm interested in certain aspect of tech law or tech policy, but I'm not quite sure, please feel free to find me during coffee or lunch over the next two days, I'd be happy to, to talk to you. Um, 
I will do my best as we, uh, as we all uh, will throughout the next two days to spell out the acronyms. Sometimes we, we forget, uh, and if we do, call us out on it and have us spell it out. Um, and so with that, I think we can go right into it here. So, what is this? This is a URL, right? ICANN.org, that is the URL for the ICANN homepage. Next slide. Now, ICANN.org is the name. And then right above that on this slide is the number. And that number is called an internet protocol or IP address. And so the internet protocol is a set of rules that allows your computer, smartphone, or other device to find the correct location that you typed in. It identifies devices primarily by using a long string of numbers. Every computer and smart device has an IP address. Also, every website has an IP address behind the name. The numbers are not easy to memorize. So in the early days of the internet, a list was set up to map the words or the names to the IP address. Because it's easier for us as humans to understand and remember names than it is numbers. Next slide. So believe it or not, in the early days, when there were only a few hundred internet users, the names and numbers were kept on a actual physical paper list. It's hard to believe when someone, when I first came to ICANN and someone told me that, I was like, what? Um, however, that was the way it was. And this wonderful caricature here is of a gentleman named John Postel. He was a researcher at the University of Southern California and he single-handedly kept track of the names and the numbers in a handwritten database, if you will. Uh, sometimes you'll see, you hear it referred to as, as hosts, and the host is any device that has an IP address and is connected and reachable over the internet. Next slide. So today, of course, the internet has billions of users. There's no way that a handwritten list maintained by one individual could exist. I suppose it could, but it would be incredibly unwieldy and you need a lot of physical space for it. So because of this, the manually maintained address book was replaced by an automated and distributed address book system, commonly referred to as the domain name system, or DNS. And at its most basic level, ICANN coordinates the top level of the domain name system. Again, the most basic level. There are many nuances to that statement, um, and those are things that, that you'll learn about over the course of the next two days. And if you're joining us uh, at the ICANN meeting uh, downtown uh, over the next week, you'll learn a lot more about that as well. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so when you want to visit the ICANN website, you'll type ICANN.org into your browser. It's going up there. And your computer or device will send this information through the internet to find ICANN.org. Then your device will receive this information and then eventually take you to the ICANN website. And you can move to the next slide. I know, I apologize, we've got the hybrid environment. I mean, sometimes we have things that obstruct top and bottom, but there we go, awesome. So that's the simplest explanation. So to take the understanding of this a bit further, let's talk about how domain names end. So the ICANN website ends in .org. And there are many popular websites that end in Dot com, right, which would be uh, another one which has obviously a large number of registrations. 
And then there are more that are, and maybe there may be a, a couple of advancements there. There you go. Um, there are also some that have two letters, and those are what we call country code top level domains. The answer is yes, Pablo, that should have been .pr, and I will make, <laughs> I'll make sure to make that edit next time. <laughs> um, however, for the purposes of this slide, .au is the website for the Australian government, and that is what they use. So there are, in North America, obviously, we have .pr, um, .vi as well, and then, uh, of course, .us and .ca. Uh, next slide. Wonderful. So here is that kind of breakdown, right? So you'll hear the acronyms GTLD, which is generic top level domain, and there are examples of that. Probably the three most well known examples of a GTLD is up, are up there. And then, what, as I said, CCTLDs, and there's a few more examples here. Um, so th these are called top level domains. And they are everything right to the, to the right of kind of the, the furthest dot, or sometimes people shorten and just say to the right of the dot, but when you get kind of longer addresses, there'll be many dots. Um, everything to the extreme right. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So domain name registries are organizations that manage top level domains. They work with registrars to sell domain names to the public, uh, if you think back to Mr. Postel's, uh, Dr. Postel's paper list, uh, registries work with registrars to keep an electronic version for everyone who registers a domain name within the top level. So to kind of put it another way, the company that controls .com keeps a list of everyone with a .com domain name. The organization controlling .au in the example I used, keeps a list of everyone with a .au domain name, and so on and so forth. So ICANN works with each registry and registrar to ensure that the information is easily findable for everyone. Next slide. So now, these look a little different. And so you'll see two acronyms there at the, at the top, um, some blockage there, but so, new GTLDs or new generic top level domains and something called an IDN or an internationalized domain name which is going to be critically important to what the panel is going to discuss after I step aside here. So in 2012 there were new domain names, top level domain names introduced into the, what, the root zone of the internet. And those obviously differ from some of what are, you may hear called legacy top level domains, which are the ones that were on a couple slides ago, .com, .org, and there are, uh, there are several others. So the goal of the new GTLD program is to foster competition, innovation, and choice in the domain name industry. It was an internet community driven initiative that enabled the largest expansion of the domain name space. The new GTLD program was managed by ICANN and it took shape through the policy making process that is, as Derek mentioned in his keynote, multi-stakeholder in nature. And so now there are over 1,200 new top level domains. So if you look at the example here, um, I'll take the GTLDs first, right? So there's dot XYZ, I apologize, there's an extra dot there. Uh, it's not supposed to be there. Um, that's kind of a generic. There are what we call branded generics. So an example here is dot BMW. It's not an endorsement of BMW, although I hear they're wonderful vehicles. And then there are uh, kind of uh, location-based generics, if you will. An example here being dot NYC. It's not an endorsement of New York City. However, my parents were born and raised in Brooklyn, so if there's an issue, please come see me at lunch. <clears throat> now, more germane to what uh, Susan and Saramat are going to be talking about are the internationalized domain names. And so here, 
I pulled a few examples. So these are actually country code top level domain names, but they're in uh, local scripts. So this here is uh, on the left is Cyrillic for uh, Mongolia. And then in the middle, we have Arabic for Pakistan. And then uh, finally, uh, Ch a Chinese script for Singapore. Uh, if you could advance me to the next and final slide I have. Uh, other way. Yeah. One more, please. Wonderful, thank you. So, enter universal acceptance, which is going to be the subject of the panel. So, the DNS has evolved. But the checks used by a lot of the software application used to validate domain names and email addresses remain outdated. So universal acceptance is considered a technical compliance best practice. And it solves the issue by ensuring that all valid domain names and email addresses, regardless of script, language, or character length, can be used equally by all internet-enabled applications, devices, and systems. So we have internationalized domain names out there, and now we need to make sure they work seamlessly. So in a way, universal acceptance, or more specifically, the adoption of universal acceptance, really brings the promises and benefits of IDNs to fruition, and that is what your experts are going to talk about now. And with that, I will hand it over to Kathleen. Test. Just make sure this works. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Kathleen Scoggin, and I'm the program coordinator for the Tech Law and Security Program here at AU, and also work um, with the ITP, Inclusive Tech Policy Program. Uh, so happy to have you all here. I've had the pleasure of being part of the NASIC Planning Committee for the last couple months. So thank you to everyone who made this event possible. And thank you to Joe for giving us um, that great introduction about domain names generally. And now we're going to dive a little bit more um, into universal acceptance. But first, I would love both of my panelists to introduce themselves, tell us who you are, um, what your role is, a little bit about your background, and how you got here. Uh, good morning. My name is Susan Chalmers, and I work in the Office of International Affairs at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is part of the United <coughs> States Department of Commerce. Um, I've been with NTIA for about seven years, I guess. Um, uh, I started my career in internet governance uh, in New Zealand, actually, uh, with the administrator of the .nz country code top level domain. Um, and, uh, and moved to, to NTIA about seven years ago. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, universal acceptance is really a very interesting but a critically important topic if we want to have a uh, an inclusive and multilingual internet and so just thank you for having me um, so my name is uh, Sarmad Hussein I'm with uh, ICANN um, I uh, involved with the internationalized domain names and universal acceptance program at ICANN um, and um, before I can, I was uh, I've been in academia. I was a professor of uh, computer science um, um, back home. I come from Pakistan, um, and um, um, have uh, always been interested in language technology, and uh, um, that's sort of my area of uh, specialization. And that's also, I guess, what I do at I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. We're very grateful to have both of you here and excited to jump into an interesting discussion. <coughs> so my first question for both of you is, what is your definition of universal acceptance and how does it relate to domain names and email addresses? Okay. 
Well, I will I will leave it to Sarmad to address <laughs> to address this in any any more technical way, but basically we understand universal acceptance um, to serve as the foundation for a multilingual internet. It is um, uh, I think consists of some technical uh, standards, uh, but it, collectively um, it is uh, that which is necessary uh, for people to be able to um, engage online, to visit websites in their own native scripts, uh, and it is a very um, important uh, topic that we need to be discussing and coordinating, and I think coordination is the one of the key um, uh, uh, factors here in promoting UA. Uh, thanks, Susan. So I'll build up a little bit on that um, and get into some technical details. Um, so um, as Joe was uh, sharing earlier, um, that. Um, uh, you know, we've um, in, since two, 2012, uh, there have been many more GTLDs which have been introduced in the root uh, of the internet. Um, they, uh, these top level domains um, have uh, certain features um, which um, these strings didn't ha uh, used to have before. So all the technology which uh, was developed around um, supporting domain names and email addresses which are which also include domain names, um, was, built, um, built, was built around certain assumptions. Um, one assumption was, for example, that top level domain would be two or three characters long. Um, um, and then some people uh, had even more significant hard coding of that assumption. They said only these 22 or 23 strings were allowed as top level domains. And a lot of that technology is um, sort of uh, since those top level domains like au, .au or uh, .com or .org, uh, they've been around for many, many years. Um, that that is, um, those assumptions actually got built into software. Uh, and that's uh, <coughs> caused a problem because uh, since 2012 now there are many more strings and they, these strings uh, can be categorized in three uh, buckets, I guess. Uh, you can have new strings like dot sky, uh, which are still three characters long, but they're not part of that 22 or 23 uh, quote unquote legacy uh, top level domains. Uh, there are also these longer strings, which are um, no, you know, not two letters or three uh, letters, but uh, much longer like dot photography or dot technology or dot international. Um, and then uh, there's these uh, strings, uh, top level domains, uh, which are um, in local languages, um, like the examples you saw um, shared by Joe earlier <coughs> in, in different languages and scripts. And um, the technology um, was, or is still in some cases, just not ready. And when, so when you enter a domain name or email address, they're expecting uh, some of the older kinds of domain names. And when you type in these new kinds of domain names, um, the technology, web, the website uh, says that, you know, this domain name or email address is no longer, is not valid because the rules they're using to apply, uh, they're applying to check for those domain names are still old. And that causes what is, you know, we, we would want universal acceptance of domain names and email addresses. And this is what is really causing the problem of universal acceptance, which we obviously want to address. Yeah. Thank you so much for the technical <coughs> background. I know that we have a good number of non-technical people in the room, so it's great to get some background on that. And you touched on this already a little bit, but what are some of the historical and cultural factors that contributed to the lack of UA in the initial development? And how have these factors overall impacted the development of the internet? Okay, so, um, <coughs> uh, you know, when, Computing was starting out, right? We, we had real challenges um, uh, about uh, memory and processing power of computers. And, um, you know, in, in that era, I guess, so to speak, um, um, 
normally when they started processing information uh, letters for example um, they used about uh, seven bit uh, or eight bit uh, codes um, this is uh, just because um, uh, you know the number of you know as I said the memory um, or the processing power was very limited when we started out um, and um, just to translate that into uh, you know what that means um, if you're you have a seven bit code you can create about 128 possibilities out of that uh, and uh, 128 possibilities when when people were using these to create uh, for example um, letters which uh, people could use uh, beyond just you know numbers for computers uh, it could only encode uh, 120 128 uh, characters which meant and then obviously this this was being uh, started out um, and uh, done in the you know in the US so the first thing was to of course encode uh, letters and characters which are being used locally um, uh, so so that's where we started right we we started encoding um, uh, letters as, and since we had only 128 or 128 slots we encoded uh, A, B, C the letters which are used in English uh, symbols and uh, numbers which were used in English as a starting point it was uh, certainly uh, not uh, I guess probably intended to just do it uh, only do it that way um, but uh, because of limitations of technology that's where uh, the starting point was um, as um, uh, of course, um, computing internet went broader beyond, of course, the um, borders of uh, US, I guess, uh, um, and uh, into Europe and into other parts of the, um, you know, other parts of the world. The community very quickly realized that uh, you know this is uh, a limitation which needs to be addressed, um, and um, that obviously started, uh, um, I guess, the next stage. But uh, you know, since your question was on more of historical uh, context, uh, you know, th since uh, the work started from here uh, initially, and there was limitations in computing, and there was limitations in processing uh, storage and processing both, um, you know, that was sort of the, I guess, best starting point uh, in yeah. that context. So just to <coughs> build a, a wee bit on, on, on Sir Mud's excellent history there, I think, you know, as you mentioned, well, the internet was born in the United States, and so it makes sense that it, the DNS primarily catered to, to English. But I think it's fair to say that progress towards uh, internationalized domain names um, was relatively slow going um, for the rest of the world. We saw at the International Telecommunications Union in 2002 a resolution introduced uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, multilingual domain names. And that was really, I think, reflecting frustration among countries whose native or official languages uh, were essentially absent uh, from the internet. Um, and until late 2009, the Internet's DNS was available only in Latin character languages, but it's important to note that progress has been made. Today, there are 91 uh, generic TLDs and non-ASCII scripts, and there are 61 IDNs, uh, IDN country code top-level domains, which Joe had showed earlier, uh, representing global communities online and native scripts. So I think the more important question here is what steps can we take now, today, because, because of the evolution of, of computing and because we have the technical solutions, uh, and where, do we, where do we go from here? Yeah, I think that's a really great point to address the progress that has been made. And I think that a lot of what Joe had brought up and what both of you brought up as well um, was ensuring meaningful access to the internet. Not simply that you're able to access a website, but that you're able to use it in a way um, that is most comfortable to you. So would you all be able to expand a little bit on what it means to have meaningful accept or, um, use of the internet and how universal acceptance kind of plays into that? You already touched on that, but. 
Um, sure. So I think uh, meaningful expanded connectivity via a secure global digital ecosystem, um, which is built upon a multilingual internet, will drive economic prosperity, raise standards of living, create jobs. Um, and so the foundation there uh, is a multilingual internet. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and the multilingual internet is based upon, is built upon universal acceptance. Um, uh, when you have, when you're able to engage with the internet in your own script, in your own language, and there's so many opportunities that are now, that are yet unrealized now for folks um, to connect more meaningfully with government services, uh, to promote the development of local content online. Um, so those are just a few examples, I think. So um, I'll um, give you, start with an example. Um, I have a colleague uh, back home who uh, went for graduate school not very far from here to, um, 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 I guess, um, a university in D.C. Um, and um, um, he's now back home. He's in academia, um, teaches computer science. Uh, every day he, you know, opens up his laptop and uh, goes online to read the news. And, you know, even though he is fluent in English, he opens an Urdu newspaper and online and reads uh, news in Urdu, you know, um, even though he can very understand everything in English. It's a cultural thing. Um, and um, it's a, you know, I think uh, when... Um, when we're talking about um, uh, you know, internet, um, uh, there's a you know uh, great quote um, that uh, you know internet uh, connects uh, people; it doesn't connect machines. Um, and when uh, people uh, are connecting with each other, uh, one of the main thing, or I guess, uh, um, a mechanism to connect is to use language, um, and. Um, you know, normally they're most comfortable in uh, the, their own mother tongue. Um, I guess that's the example I was uh, giving. So, so when you are actually using internet as a vehicle or as a tool to connect people, uh, you for, for meaningful access, I guess, uh, what you really need to do is ensure that uh, this, um, um, I guess, tool does support um, the method of communication people prefer. Uh, and which is their own local languages and in, in their own local scripts. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, not only that, I guess, um, even those who are um, uh, speaking English, um, uh, meaningful access uh, goes, you know, I think, one of the reasons uh, or one of the ways the Internet expanded in 2012 with the top-level domains uh, was that um, people wanted to... Uh, use top-level domains to identify communities, for example, uh, or identify, so we saw example of .nyc, .london, .berlin, there were many geo-TLDs, there were also many community uh, TLDs, uh, there are also some uh, professional, uh, so, you know, you, uh, spaces or uh, I guess other spaces like .technology or .photography, uh, which um, defines people's interests and people want to associate with that. Um, so top-level domains provide people, um, you know, choice. Uh, they also provide people access uh, broader in their own languages. Um, and uh, meaningful access uh, means that people should have uh, that ability to use those top-level domains to associate with the right top-level domain, I guess. Um, and uh, be able to navigate the internet in, in a language they're comfortable with. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to touch a little bit more <coughs> on what you said about education and awareness. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people who speak English as a first language and are doing <coughs> a lot of innovation in the US uh, might not think of universal acceptance um, when they're thinking a lot of these issues. So I want to ask about the role that ICANN plays in education and awareness around UA. So, um, um, basically, um, 
there are, um, I would say, there are three um, levels of um, interaction or three uh, layers uh, which we would uh, want to uh, address. Uh, when we're talking about uh, universal acceptance, um, the starting point is awareness. Um, but I think the, uh, it doesn't end there. Uh, the next uh, step is uh, uh, understanding the technical details on uh, how this actually could be achieved. Um, and then this last step in the process is actually um, not just uh, understanding the technical details, but actually adopting those technical details to ensure that universal acceptance is actually integrated into the systems. Um, all the relevant systems around around people. Uh, so when when we are working at ICANN, we are uh, we are trying to work at, at all these three layers. Um, there are um, places where we want to go, uh, and I'll um, give an example of uh, recently we celebrated uh, Universal Acceptance Day on 28 March, uh, where we actually try to reach out to communities across the globe. Uh, in, in this particular case, uh, we uh, supported and collaborated with communities in more than 40 countries and held more than 50 events. Um, um, and uh, the aim was to raise awareness of what universal acceptance is. We're uh, following up with uh, many of uh, our um, partners, collaborators, um, and uh, taking it to the next level. Uh, so next uh, level is to engage with them and start doing technical training. <clears throat> um, a, a great example of that is uh, as part of a Coalition for Digital Africa initiative, uh, which uh, ICANN's uh, involved in. Um, there is a project uh, which we've started with the uh, uh, Association of African Universities, uh, where uh, uh, we are uh, working with AAU to make sure that uh, uh, the systems, uh, websites, email servers, uh, for services for these uh, more than 400 partner universities of AAU across Africa are universal acceptance ready. Uh, so we're doing a series of trainings uh, with them. <clears throat> and um, then, um, you know, we eventually the idea is to take it to the last level where uh, people are not only just aware um, and not just capable but are actually actively ensuring that the technology they're producing and using uh, is uh, UA ready so that uh, yeah. the local communities can actually um, benefit from, from, uh, from that technology more than they can actually at this time. Yeah, yeah. making sure that those technologies are something that <coughs> can actually be used. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, Susan, uh, with the different constraints of the government, different structure, uh, what is NTIA's role in promoting UA? How do you see that? And how does it work together with other organizations to do so? Sure. Well, um, <clears throat> I think NTIA, it would be fair to say that we pro promote universal acceptance because NTIA, broadly, we support digital inclusion. Um, there's an incredible amount of work being done by NTIA, not in my, my office, but uh, to promote connectivity um, through, through very, very impressive um, um, broadband connectivity programs. Um, but it's, I think it's that policy piece where we're supporting a multilingual internet, not only, um, uh, I, not only at home, but I would say um, more broadly, uh, that we, so we've worked in the past with ICANN, we've collaborated with other people, other organizations who are interested in universal acceptance. We've promoted this at the IGF through a number of different workshops. Um, the focus of which has really been to kind of crack the code and answer the question, why isn't universal acceptance being taken up as a priority issue um, by governments um, around the world? What are the barriers that are standing in the way of that? Um, and through all of the discussions that we've had over the years, something that we found is really just a lack of coordination. There's so many different um, players that could be involved in promoting universal acceptance, but they're not really speaking to each other. So um, 
I think one of the key challenges for any um, person in the government who is focused on this policy is how do you raise what is assumed to be a purely technical issue, how do you translate that and elevate it into and communicate the importance of it to, to meaningful connectivity, to providing um, government services to your citizens in, in their native language? That is, I think, one of the key challenges. And just as an experiment, um, uh, so NTIA, we have our own different uh, listservs, and um, was just trying to consider what would be the most effective and efficient means to bringing this to any any um, any CTO's attention. And after some time, we discovered that submitting a bug report um, <laughs> it would be the the most direct way to get uh, to get uh, your colleagues. Um, to look into universal acceptance, um, because it can be very hard to explain this to um, to CTOs are, uh, within government departments who don't necessarily have a lot of time. Um, but I think it's it's really the coordination piece, and I'd like to we can we can talk more about that piece. But um, but I think at least now that because of the excellent work that ICANN and Sarmad have done, the Universal Acceptance Steering Group at ICANN, and we've just heard about all of the activity that is going on with the Coalition um, for Digital Africa. Uh, I think you know the, the future is, uh, is bright when it comes to this issue. We just have so much more unexplored, uh, unexplored ground to cover. Yeah, I think that's a really important point as well, that even if you have all of the parts ready um, to make something fall within UI protocols, uh, that each part is not always communicating. And so even that can be an additional barrier, an additional um, thing you have to overcome. So my next question is for both of you. Um, how do you ensure that universal acceptance is implemented in a way that respects cultural and linguistic diversity and what role do local communities play in this process? I think that that's an important question in the theme of digital inclusion and accessibility of this conference. Um, well, I, so I actually haven't been on the ground where UA has been rolled out in um, in a non non ASCII language country, <laughs> think of a m more elegant way to say that. Um, but uh, I would imagine that first and foremost, you'd be looking at the scripts themselves, making sure that you understand um, how the scripts are used, um, and being sensitive to that. I I don't know if to, uh, but to be honest, I don't know if. Um, cultural sensitivities. I'm, I'm trying. I'm tr I'm trying hard to find kind of a, an issue set there because I'm not familiar with one. But perhaps um, um, Sarmad and people who have experience on the ground uh, can speak. Let me can pass speak it to, to you, Sarmad. Sure. Um, so um, I think um, uh, just uh, making things universally, you know, uh, make universal acceptance uh, already addresses, um, I guess, uh, cultural needs. Um, but um, I think uh, going a st one step beyond um, uh, is, uh, you know, there may be some uh, script-specific um, details, uh, which, um, as uh, Susan was also pointing out, which need to be sort of taken care of. And uh, that's something which um, uh, obviously I can has been very cognizant about. Um, so one of the things which uh, I can has done since um, uh, 2012, um, um, this is um, I guess um, right after IDNA 2008 came out, which IDNA. A 2008, by the way, is uh, the underlying uh, protocol or standard. Uh, it uh, stands for Internationalized Domain Names and Applications uh, Standards, uh, which is based on a set of RFCs uh, developed by 
Internet Engineering Task Force that lays the technical basis of how uh, internationalized domain names are implemented. Uh, what uh, IDNA in 2008 does is it uh, algorithmically suggests um, uh, some um, baseline mechanism where um, any particular script which is encoded in the Unicode standard can be actually used uh, within, within the domain name um, system. Can you uh, just explain Unicode really quickly for okay. people that don't know in this room? All right. Um, so taking briefly. one one step back, uh, when when we were talking earlier about um, um, these uh, um, encoding schemes for um, um, computers, where um, computers obviously uh, use numbers, but um, in computers you can use numbers to represent certain letters. And as we started out, uh, the first encoding scheme uh, was, uh, uh, one of the first ones was ASCII, which is American Standard Code for Information in Interchange, which mapped the 128 uh, uh, code point spaces onto letters A, B, C, and so on. Uh, we just talked about that. But um, to encode uh, all the different languages of the world, you need much bigger space. Um, and uh, one of the things which uh, in early 90s, all the uh, large technology companies like Microsoft and others did um, was they came together to form what is called the Unicode uh, Consortium. I guess um, uh, Unicode Consortium basically wanted to put make a very large code page um, which had uh, letters not only of English but all the languages of the world. Um, and uh, so it, instead of 128 limited limit of 128 characters, Unicode has actually a limit of more than 1 million characters. Uh, currently, they've filled in about 150,000. Uh, so there's still plenty of space plenty left. Of space left. Um, uh, but those 150,000 characters currently support 161 scripts around the world, Latin only being one of the 161. Uh, and then there's Arabic and Cyrillic and, you know, you can, you know, okay. I can not possibly. We can uh, go on for the rest uh, of the uh, Yes. Uh, but there are 161 scripts, including Egyptian hieroglyphics, for example, which is now extinct, but still used by researchers, for example. Um, so, um, so in any case, um, <clears throat> when internationalized domain names were being uh, developed, uh, they, uh, you know, they couldn't base that um, onto ASCII, which is obviously a limit. They had to base it on uh, some level of uh, a code which could in support all the languages. And natural choice, of course, was Unicode. <coughs> so um, um, IDNA 2008, the protocol actually is based on Unicode, and uh, it sets a baseline. Um, but, um, you know, I can, and the uh, standard itself says that it is a baseline and registries and those who are using this IDNA 2008 standard need to do more to address uh, user confusion, um, uh, to address uh, some of these uh, things. Uh, just to explain what, you, what could potentially cause user confusion, um, you know, there are letters, even in English, which can sometimes be confusing. Uh, so, for example, sometimes capital I and L uh, could be confusing or letter digit one. Uh, similarly, when you extend those characters to 150,000 from about 128, uh, the degree of confusion can increase potentially. Um, IDNA 2008 already puts in some levels of uh, safeguard. Uh, by not allowing everything, uh, for example, not allowing punctuation marks and um, um, symbols, for example, in domain names, uh, but um, there, it stops there. So what I can realize was that it's only communities which can actually determine what what's the right way of using their script in domain names. We at ICANN or you know we can't tell. So. So what we did was uh, we actually worked with communities. We've uh, over the last ten years or so, uh, we've developed um, expert panels for all the different communities. Um, just to give you an example, the Arabic uh, panel, Arabic script panel had uh, 35 members from 22 different countries. 
um, uh, and so on. So we actually de develop uh, supported panels where those script communities actually um, um, sat down. Uh, they included linguists, community members, DNS experts, and they actually devised the standard and um, mechanism to identify how their script should be used in the domain names. And uh, so, so I think um, that's in one way we're trying to address the cultural sensitivity moving forward through IDNs that we are making sure that these are used safely from the perspective of the community which is actually using the script. Amazing. I just wanted to touch on a couple more questions before we open it up to Q&A from the audience. Um, so one of the things that's often said about UA um, is that you need to balance it with innovation and new systems. So how do you balance the need for innovation and progress with the need to maintain compatibility uh, with existing systems? Okay. I'll go. <laughs> so um, I think UA, <coughs> excuse me, um, UA is trying to, um, in some ways, address something which is already innovative. <coughs> um, basically, um, uh, you know, making internet multilingual is, you know, it's a great innovation. Uh, it unfortunately doesn't work seamlessly um, because uh, uh, technology needs to, I guess, upgrade itself uh, to, to become compatible uh, with this new sort of requirements. But, but interestingly, from an interoperability angle, <coughs> There's already some of this innovation built into the uh, internationalized domain name standard itself. Um, because, uh, you know, going back, uh, as I was sharing, that uh, humans would like to see things in their native script and language, which is Unicode. Uh, Internet was built on an infrastructure which was relying on seven or eight bit encoding, which is largely based on ASCII. Um, Unicode um, normally is, uh, I guess, um, so, so when we wanted to transition from like a, a ASCII-based internet into a multilingual kind of internet, um, there was obviously a choice that we just switched to Unicode, but that meant that we would have to undo all the infrastructure uh, within uh, of uh, internet which was already there. And that obviously didn't, wouldn't really fly because that would be just too difficult. There was just so much out there. Uh, so what the way people uh, at Internet Engineering Task Force innovated uh, was that they said that, okay, what we'll do is we'll keep the back end as ASCII and we'll take the front end applications or application layer, which people are looking at. Uh, machines don't care where, whether something's in Unicode or in ASCII, right? They, they'll just process whatever data they get. But humans would need to see things in their own language. So what they said was that, okay, we develop a standard which has a face for humans, where humans will see things in Arabic or Chinese or Cyrillic or whatever script they want to see in. They'll, the complete interface will be in local languages. When they type something, what the browser sends back is doesn't need to be in that local language. It can actually convert that into what is called an ASCII compatible encoding. Uh, so it sort of maps it into an, um, what is normally referred to as an A-label. Uh, and that gets sent on the wire and get processed internally. So it's very innovative that suddenly everybody's seeing what they need to see, but using the same backend infrastructure, uh, which do then doesn't need to be upgraded anymore. So. Yeah, I think making sure that people can type in their languages and end up in the same place and that you don't have, you know, yeah. conflicting two sites in two different languages that send you two different places um, is a really interesting portion of this. I wanted to ask you, Susan, uh, in terms of government implementa implementation, um, how do we ensure that UA is implemented in a way that's transparent and accountable and, like, what role does that play in achieving UA? Um, well, first, I'm not sure, so I'm not sure if the, the immediate focus, at least for NTIA, is seeing UA 
implemented in the states because we're not the primary stakeholders sure. there, right? Yeah. So, um, but I, I think when it comes to the work that will be done by um, governments when they're implementing UA, they're already following a trend and a standard that is just part of um, the multi-stakeholder development of policy, which is that, I mean, if you go to the UASG website, everything is available. All the documentation is available. Um, I don't see many challenges to transparency or accountability um, because I think that the approach that's already been taken, that's just part of the process of standards and sure. um, uh, mul open standards development. Um, I think that it is very important that it's an important thing to note that the development of standards that support universal acceptance, it seems to me that that work has already been done. It's been done at the IETF. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, being looked at at ICANN. Um, all of the impressive panels, I hadn't, any idea about the panels, Sarma, that you were speaking about earlier, such, um, such robust participation. I think as long as we follow those kind of principles um, in these venues, uh, then that's the important thing. That's the, the best yeah. starting place. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask one more question before we bring in the audience. Um, so what do you both view the future of universal acceptance to be? What are challenges, opportunities, and how can people um, in this room, online, otherwise, get involved? Um, so actually, if um, we look at the DNS itself, you know, I think that tells us the motivation of universal acceptance, right? Because internet started as a numbering system. You know, you started with computers which had numbers. Um, but early on, people felt need that numbering system is not natural for us. So they added this naming layer on top of the numbering layer, which then needs to get resolved. So um, even in English or when it started, uh, people realized that we really need to have some mnemonic system, not the numbering system, which will make this work better. Um, I guess uh, universal acceptance is just taking it one step further, right? We are saying that, sure, the naming system is great, but the naming system needs to go one step further and be in languages of people which are actually using the internet. And now everybody's using the internet, so it really needs to be, the naming system now needs to be in uh, the language of the people, right? <clears throat> um, I think um, eventually uh, it is, um, what we, you know, sure. So we we have many different stakeholders from a UA adoption perspective. Uh, we work with U Universal Acceptance Steering Group, which is a uh, community um, uh, set um, community steering group, community driven steering group, um, uh, focusing on universal acceptance. And they've identified uh, um, uh, government as a stakeholder to technical te technology and tool developers. Um, as stakeholders, academia as stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> uh, so they've obviously identified um, multiple set of stakeholders and we obviously are working with all the different stakeholders uh, to address universal acceptance. Uh, but uh, I guess a message uh, for us here is eventually it boils down to us. Uh, you know, is the website I'm making universally, uh, user, universal acceptance ready? is the email server or my email server universal acceptance ready. Um, if I can make uh, my technology, because that's under my control, it's not in anybody else's control. And uh, earlier people uh, used to say that, sure, you know, I can make myself, my technology, you, you were ready, but I don't have the tools. But now over time, um, the work by UASG, um, um, uh, it, you know, we have clear documentation that now you can actually develop technology, host uh, email servers, which are UA ready. So there's technology out there. We actually have documentation. So I think starting point would be that um, 
we familiarize ourselves uh, with uh, what the requirements are and then talk to our tech teams and make sure that our technology is UA ready. I think that would be a starting point. Uh, whereas, of course, USG, ICANN, other organizations will continue to reach out to big tech organizations and other, I guess, stakeholders to raise that awareness. Um, but, um, you know, we should really start from ourselves. Yeah. Thanks. So I think the opportunities of the global internet, if it were truly multilingual, are bound only by the limits of our imagination. And uh, the, so just to, on, um, to build upon what Sir Maud was saying, I think at the institutional level, there is an opportunity for some unprecedented coordination that can happen between, between ICANN, the UASG, um, the ITU development sector, um, and perhaps UNESCO. I mean, we're looking at, we've just entered the decade of uh, indigenous languages at the UN. Uh, in, in 2019, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution proclaiming the period of 2022 to 2032, the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. How can we build upon these types of initiatives and foster collaboration and coordination across these institutions that are crucial um, to internet governance and to the promotion of um, a multilingual internet and I think that's that's what we'll be focusing on yeah thank you so much for that I want to open up to the audience both in person and online if anyone has questions we'll go over here first yeah <laughs> oh, we can get you a mic too as well I probably don't need it okay <laughs> up to you <laughs> How's that? Is that good? All right. Thank you, panel. This is very good. I have a question for both of you. A lot of the, well, first, I'm kind of a techie myself. I've been doing technology for a long, long time. How responsive have the major tech companies like Microsoft and Red Hat IBM and Google search engine technology been to the requirement or the need to do this and if they've not been as responsive as you'd like or hope they would have been what can be done is there any kind of carrot and stick or as a if you use the American idiom um, is there any kind of thing we can do to say hey Google you know you really need to get in here and if you do so it's going to be worth a lot of money to you I know that most of, in my, let me put it this way, in my experience, it takes money to change things. To actually cause change is more about how much money someone thinks they can make or is available to cause the change. Where are we? Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Okay, if I start. Um, uh, so, uh, we're seeing good progress, um, uh, both uh, in the proprietary side of software technology and also on the open source uh, side of uh, technology. Um, we, you know, we haven't reached where we can say that, we, yes, we are UA ready or mostly UA ready. Just to give you a few examples, um, Google's Gmail, um, for example, uh, you can now send and receive uh, uh, emails in any script and language. Uh, so they've been what we call level one UA ready where uh, they can send and receive emails, but you cannot create an email address, for example, in your local script. Uh, so you cannot create a Chinese email address, but if I send an email to a Gmail address in Chinese with using a Chinese email address, it will go uh, and will be delivered and you can actually, and they, you will be able to using your Gmail address, respond back to the Chinese email address as well. So they're level one ready, they're not level two ready. Um, the uh, Microsoft also um, uh, uh, recently, uh, so Gmail's been uh, 
AI level one ready for many years now. Um, and uh, Microsoft is also, um, their email products are uh, supporting uh, AI, again, uh, at least level one. Um, and then uh, recently, Apple also uh, actually announced that uh, they are also supporting. So, so you know, some of these large tech companies are already leading the way, supporting UA, uh, partially at least, uh, as I said, not level two. Uh, eventually, I guess they'll come to level two as well. Um, there's some obviously technical challenges going to level two because email addresses are now also used as identifiers, as usernames, uh, which is used beyond email in many other technologies. So they actually have to be a bit careful about how they allow for, for example, Arabic or Chinese identifiers versus... Uh, um, so those are things which obviously I'm sure they are working on. Um, uh, so um, uh, on the open source side, uh, we see that more and more of email tools, for example, are now uh, supporting... Uh, uh, SMTP UTF-8, which is the flag which is used for internationalized email addresses. Um, so there is a good support which is coming in open source uh, technology as well. Um, uh, uh, courier, Postfix, some of those uh, tools actually do support uh, EI already. Um, so we are increasingly seeing uh, support. Um, eventually, uh, it uh, comes down to business, right? If there is a user requirement, if your client or customers require a feature, they would prioritize that feature and uh, uh, support it. Um, and I think that then boils down to all of us as well, that once we start using our email addresses, domain names in local languages, more and more, and people see more and more traffic of these internationalized domain names and internationalized email addresses, uh, technology, uh, businesses will automatically, uh, I guess, move forward and adopt these and provide support for these more and more for their own interest uh, as well. Uh, so let me stop here. Yeah. Um, very, very uh, straight and short and sweet answer. Uh, government procurement policies. And, and that's... Uh, I, I, I think that is, when it comes to these questions, when we're talking about standards, I think that applies not only to universal acceptance, but to IPv6, uh, DNSSEC, government procurement policies, I think, should be the most effective means to at least generate um, promotion of these standards. Awesome. Anyone else? Do you have a question over here? Yeah, I'm Siva Subramanian. There is a certain policy dimension of uh, IDNs and universal acceptance uh, that may require uh, some more attention. One is that, uh, for example, uh, IDNs are good for Egypt, uh, for Egyptian users, and it will bring more of e Egyptian users to the internet, those users who do not speak English or write English. But at the same time, uh, um, an Egyptian IDN would also lead to an Egyptian web of uh, web space of uh, users who are uh, who speak uh, Egyptian language who are connected to one another and and who are connected but we are not connected to them because uh, their uh, URL is an Egyptian which we don't uh, speak or we don't write and uh, uh, and the content is going to be an Egyptian and so. One slight possibility is that um, while the objective is universal acceptance and universal connectivity, there is an element uh, that uh, could be could have a contra effect that of uh, not actually connecting users to the internet but disconnecting users to the internet, disconnecting users from one another, disconnecting one community from another. Is enough being done to promote uh, human level acceptance. A lot of lot is being done for uh, the technical acceptance of uh, technical universal acceptance. But on the human layer, is it uh, uh, is enough done to promote trust of uh, one script 
among users of another script. So I'll try to answer that um, um, in a couple of ways. Um, first, at a more higher level, I think um, um, internet or you know this online um, space is sort of a virtual world. It it is it's a, it's sort of a reflection of our our physical world in a way, right? We want to project, um, you know, um, um, so. You know, for example, this uh, concept of avatars, right? It's sort of a projection of us into a virtual space. Um, so at the end of the day, we want the virtual space to be as um, realistically close to our physical space, right? Um, and um, when we talk about things um, um, at on the ground, right, you would not expect people in Egypt, for example, to speak, start speaking in English to each other, right? You would want them to continue to speak in Arabic, you know, that's the reality of things. Um, and uh, so, so the way we normally exist uh, in the world, we are communities. Uh, when we are talking within a community, we communicate in a local language. When we are talking across communities, like we are doing here, we speak in a language which is perhaps commonly understood. Um, um, you know, you can, uh, for example, go to some place which is more francophone and English would not be the right language. You would probably want to speak in French. You want to go, you go to Latin America and you may want to speak in, for example, uh, Spanish or uh, some other languages. So, so there's no one universal language, right? Eventually you would want to, uh, depending on the community you are articulating with, uh, you would need to represent or articulate in in their local language. Um, and I think that should really be left to the people to decide. Um, it's not for us to regulate uh, that what people should communicate in. Um, so so as, as technical folks, we need to make sure that we provide people opportunity to represent them in, in, in you know, yeah. themselves in any ways, uh, any ways they would like and let them choose what is the best for them, uh, rather than us trying to stipulate anything. Um, I sort of go back um, to, um, and then when you, you know, um, we, we've got tons, we have significant technology, you've got Google Translate, you've got uh, many other technologies which are allowing you to, for example, on the fly, access content across barriers, you know, language barriers. Uh, so I think some of that is already getting addressed. But um, um, the idea would be to enable technology to make that seamless rather than to try to limit people. Thank you. Yeah, I think we'll just take a couple more questions. We're at the end there. You're, 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 That's right. You want to be the first? So go ahead. No, you're next. Thank you. Uh, my name is Juliana. I'm a digital rights activist in Brazil. And I, and I would like to understand a bit more about the multilingual strategy and what the goal, uh, the main goal of it, the um, challenges. And specifically, in the case of Brazil, we have a huge indigenous community. And I was in Brightcon last week when we were there discussing about accessibility and infrastructure. I mean, we need the education basis of some vulnerable communities to uh, implement the real digital rights because, I mean, if I give my cell phone to some indigenous people, maybe they don't know how to use it. So I guess and I believe in the digital education and, of course, the infrastructure that they need to do in the region, for example, in Brazil that I'm talking about. But, of course, the language would be important to the to have the access, the real access. Because I mean, I can speak now in English, but of course I understand more in Portuguese or maybe in Spanish because it's near to my uh, own language. So I'd like to understand better the um, strategy by itself. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, oh, I, would, I would invite you to, <coughs> um, to look into what has been discussed at the Internet Governance Forum um, and 
we have NTIA has submitted a, a workshop proposal for this year's uh, IGF in Kyoto in 2023, but I really think that the work there um, will give you kind of a bird's eye view of the folks who are involved in this promotion. There's no kind of centralized strategy, right? Um, I think people, and I think maybe part of that is, is the issue that we need greater coordination at the institutional level around this. But, um, but yeah, I can, and I can dig around for some links even to send them to you. But if, if, if you spend time with those workshops, it will give you kind of a better impression of what's going on. I, um, in 2021, we did organize a, a high level workshop at the IGF and did invite a, uh, an indigenous speaker from Brazil um, to, who presented her um, kind of her concerns about universal acceptance and, and language and preservation of her language too. So it would probably be very relevant for you. Um, just to add one more uh, resource to that list, you may also want to look at um, some of the work UNESCO has done. Um, there was uh, this uh, uh, multilingual in cyberspace, uh, they had some initial uh, work which came out in early 2000s and they've done a lot of work since then as well. So that's another place you should actually go and uh, take a look as well. Thank you. Uh, so we got one more question uh, with the microphone there, but then we'll, uh, uh, we're going to take questions in the hall. Yeah, I've been waiting for Okay, okay. Is, is the, did you not have the microphone there? Where is oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so um, my question is um, from the perspective of a small business owner and um, startup founder, um, with these new domains that end in otherwise than like .org or .com, like my company's name is Technologist Computers and so our website is www.technologist.computer. Um, we've had a lot of issues with compatibility, you know, just like trying to sign up for accounts with large companies, whether it's American Express or Chase Bank or, you know, so I wanted to know like what guardrails and what resources are available to ensure compatibility of these newer domains that are coming on board and what resources can organizations use to make sure that their systems are compatible, you know, with these newer domains. Right, so I think this um, again leads to what um, we were discussing earlier that universal acceptance is not just a multilingual issue. It is also an English uh, issue, so to speak, uh, or ASCII issue, uh, to be technically correct. Um, and, um, um, you know, it's not just about, um, you know, having these domain names in local languages, but also these domain names like dot .photography or dot .technology, which uh, just don't work because there's just uh, old technology which is currently being used or reused uh, to develop websites. Uh, so for example, if you go and sign on, um, the example you were saying that you go to a website of a particular um, organization and um, uh, sign on it, um, and they say that, you know, even though you have a valid email address it, they, or domain name, they say that this doesn't look right. Um, so that's exactly the universal acceptance problem which we're talking about. Um, uh, what could you do in that particular case? Uh, of course, um, there are quite a lot of uh, technical companies out there and we obviously need to get this message to eventually ev everyone. Uh, we are obviously working with the community to get to as many of them as possible. But uh, if you get stuck with any particular one, first of all, you should do is make sure that you file a bug report with them or raise a complaint with them so that uh, they know that this is a problem with their technology and they fix it. Uh, you could also reach out to us. Uh, so, you know, email us at uh, uh, basically, you know, info at uh, usg.tech or get in touch with us uh, 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 at uh, uh, uaprogram at ican.org and uh, we can also try to, uh, you know, help uh, reach out to those organizations. But uh, um, we, I guess, all need to keep at it because there are quite a few organizations out there. We are um, working with the community to raise awareness with as many as uh, possible, but uh, of course we haven't reached out to everyone yet. Thanks. A 
thank you to both of you. We appreciate your insights so much. And um, thank you for being here and sharing with us. So. All right, everyone, that's an hour long uh, break for lunch. Uh, we'll take thank everybody you. back here at 1 o'clock start. And uh, back in the where we were for breakfast. Yes. Can we get one picture lunch. before we off? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Or we the short answer is not that
Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Yes, yes. just about. Uh, yeah, it's, it's on for me. Except I'm getting an echo. Who's that, who's that talking? Doug Dawson. Oh, that's good. You're, you're the who I really need to test. What I'm trying to test is if, if my mix minus works. I'm going to switch to that. Okay, very good. Um, okay. Although the echo cancellation does appear to be working. Yeah, I, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing myself one second after I talk. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, just say something else. Yeah, I'll keep talking. No, hey, it's, it's still doing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now I'm going to switch inputs on this thing. Uh, Robert Gomez says he's getting feedback to Let me try again. Yep. If you, you got it, Doug, it doesn't sound like you. I'm sorry. Did you, did you get a? Do you have a cold? It's uh, you sound a little hoarse. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's allergy season, and we have the uh, the smoke from Canada. <laughs> Okay, now I've switched to Okay. Oh yeah, it's not doing it now. I did it. You can hear you can hear me now? Yes, sir, very well. Okay, so that's the mix minus, which means that you know you are not feeding back into Zoom. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um Dino, who's one of the panelists, will be joining remotely too because he's sick today, so he should be joining here soon. So that's someone who needs to be allowed to so that's yeah. got a panelist invite or Yes, he got a panelist invite yesterday because he's ill. Okay. He was he was planning on being there, but and uh, and you're going to have a camera on as well. Yes, I let me turn it on just to show you. Yeah, there's my camera. Okay, so when you come to it, adjust it so your face is in the middle of the frame. Well, do. Yeah, I can't see my frame right now. Yeah, well, you're 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 doing Murphy was here. You know what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's better. That's better. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay. All right. So uh, that's good. So Thank you, you. So you can you can mute yourself and relax. Okay. Okay. Well, Doug, the, the only thing we didn't try was going on to original audio, which depends on how much background noise you have. I'm in a pretty quiet office. Yeah, well, if you go into audio settings, you can, you can switch on original sound for musicians. And where is that? You go to, down to the bottom to buy a little <laughs> microphone, audio drop down. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the bottom of so yeah, at the at bottom, the bottom left of your Zoom, thing, okay, it should have an next to your audio should be audio settings. Yep, you should have original sound for musicians. Uh, let's see, original sound musicians. Okay, that's I just changed to that. Okay, let's hear you. Okay, is that better? Yeah, it is a little bit better. Okay, very good. Is that something I should keep all the time? Is that make it if better? If you don't for have people? a lot of background noise, sure. You oh, know, great. It, it cuts out the zoom noise cancellation, so it. 
Oh, you know, yeah. It doesn't clip you so much. Yeah, I'm in a quiet office, and I got I moved my cat, who's very loud. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, Dina, are you, Dina, are you on here? Dino Thompson, is that? Yeah, he should be on. He says okay, online I'm that gonna, he's here. I'm going to promote the panelist. Okay. All right, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We hear you well. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'll be right back in one second. I have another question. Uh, are either of you guys going to do slide presentations? I'm, I'm not, no. Dino is not. That's good. So I'll just spotlight you in Zoom once we get going. Okay, thank you. This mic is a slightly better mic than the only yeah. other. Part. Okay, I'll take that one. Then. Nobody has slides, right? That's correct.
That's right. This is one o'clock session now. Jola, do we know if they've dialed in yet? I'm. They've dialed in yet? Yeah, we are here. Can you not hear us? Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I'm just getting myself set up sure. here for the live stream. Doug, you're still a bit low in your in your frame. If you could lower your camera a bit, now you're too low. You know, there you go, sweet spot. All right, very good. Dino, you want to show yourself? Um, I 
Uh, yeah, you would have needed to stop at the registration desk out there. But I wouldn't worry about it now. I'm ready to roll whatever you want. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, welcome back. Oops. Welcome back, everyone. I guess it's on. Uh, thanks, everyone. We had a good uh, uh, lunch and met some new people. Um, we've got uh, lots of time in this uh, program for networking, so uh, you should never be afraid to come back to the room on time. Eduardo. Um, so, I mean, Jefe. Okay, so. <laughs> So in this session, we're going to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships. <clears throat> My name is uh, Jonathan Zook, and in addition to being the MC, I'm the moderator of this session, and I also know the least about it. So I'm going to let the speakers do most of the uh, do most of the work here, and I'll try to craft some creative questions. Um, so what I what I thought I would do just to get things started, I went through the bios of the speakers, but wasn't sure how to reduce them down. So I thought I'd go to each speaker and ask you to introduce yourself and also kind of give the aspects of your background that are relevant to this session, if you would. What are you doing? What are you working on? Um, I know in some cases it's the telecom space, uh, agriculture space, et cetera, and, and how it relates to this issue of public-private partnerships and accessibility and inclusion. So I think I'll just start uh, with my own bias toward the room, uh, you know, even though it's beyond being there. Uh, so, uh, Andrew Mack, why don't you start us off, tell us a little bit about um, yourself and, uh, and the work you're doing that's relevant to the top. Sure. Um, okay. Can everyone hear me? Great. It's nice to see some, uh, some faces I haven't seen in a, in a couple of years. It's good to see you all. Um, my name is Andrew Mack. I am the CEO and founder of Agromobile, which is a, um, it's a, it's a platform that, that connects small farmers with markets around the world, connects them to big buyers that want to see them. And so it's a, it's a data platform that relies on connectivity to reach between the edge and buyers in the center. I come out of a background of, uh, of a combination of private sector and public sector. I worked at the World Bank for a number of years where I was one of the World Bank's first public-private partnership experts. I then left the bank to start up a company called AM Global, which I ran for about 15 years, which was all about setting up partnerships between companies that wanted to get into emerging markets and emerging parts of developed markets and the big donor agencies like the World Bank, like the Inter-American Development Bank and bilaterals. And so, Public-private partnership has been basically a huge part of everything that I do. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Dino, why don't you go next? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I am actually in PR and marketing, and through that road, I focused on minority groups. And, all, and then I came upon um, some projects with technology, and it became a passion. And I've worked with Microsoft and various different organizations on discovering why we have the digital divide and what are the roads we need to take to try to close that. So I've done a lot of studies and a lot of talking with a lot of folks across the country um, and worked with different ch you know, chambers of commerce and different organizations trying to get to these pockets of the community that don't have a voice and finding out what is really happening in those uh, communities that they don't have proper connectivity or the devices needed to succeed. And um, so it's been a long journey, but we're making some change and we do have the ear of big tech right now because we've been able to prove that aside that it's the right thing to do, there's money to be made. So people are listening. Uh, that's great. Uh, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I'm Doug Dawson. I'm the president of CCG Consulting. Uh, I'm an infrastructure guy. And, and so I have been an ISP in the past and had 100,000 customers. Uh, my consulting firm has 1,200 clients. That's about 500 ISPs and about 700 municipalities and counties and cities. And so I spent a whole lot of my time putting together public-private partnerships. 
Uh, I, I just started a list this morning of, I came up with a dozen different kinds of partnerships I've seen in the last five years. So the, the world, the broadband world, uh, ten, 10 years ago, I could have named all the partnerships on two hands, and now there's that many being formed every month. So it's, it's a really exploding part of the, of the broadband environment these days. So it's, an, it's a really good time to talk about it. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, what I might do is go back to you uh, first, Andrew, and just actually the crowd here, um, since you were World Bank's, one of the World Bank's first experts on public-private partnerships, um, give us a kind of working definition of that. What does that mean? Sure, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting term of art, and it certainly has changed over the years. I mean, in its broadest sense, a public-private partnership is any time that you get governments or quasi-governmental organizations working with the private sector to try to solve a problem where both have an interest and neither necessarily has all of the answers or all of the finance necessary. Uh, one of the first big partnerships I worked on was in, uh, was in uh, a place, place called Cabinda in Angola. And the idea behind the partnership was to create a mechanism whereby both government and private sector could invest to rebuild that, that, that part of Angola in, after, the, after the civil war that took place. The basic guts of a public-private partnership, though, are that it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a joint action where both the, both the private sector and the public sector are invested and where they make a huge effort to try to understand what are their common goals and what are their common rules of working together. That's really the, the big, big gist of it. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, Doug, you said you're a uh, infrastructure guy, and I, and I, I guess Dino's question is for you as well, wh whoever wants to answer. Um, I think infrastructure comes up a lot in the context of public-private partnerships, but that's probably not the only vector of public-private partnerships into this question of accessibility and inclusion. So I'm wondering if well, really anyone on the panel wants to speak to some of the other kinds of public-private partnerships um, that, that might speak more directly to this notion of um, expanding the people engaged. And I mean, broadband's obviously one of them, but um, where else do these public-private partnerships find themselves? I'll start, but I suspect Dino has a more deep answer than me. The, 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 we're starting to see a lot of partnerships aimed at digital equity folks putting together plans to get computers into homes, to get people trained on broadband. This is driven by grants, you know, which really kickstarts the idea, but for this to be permanent, we're gonna need these partnerships. So this is brand new. We didn't see many of these till the last couple of years. So um, I, I, this is what Dino does for a living, if I understand. So I'll hand it over to him. Well, um, this is a, a really good question because it, 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 it um, it kind of unveils what's going on. So aside from the issue that you have with connectivity and not having Wi-Fi to certain parts of the community, you enter a complete different set of, of, of challenges, which is these communities not knowing how to work technology. So um, we have these partnerships that are being set up around the country where folks are um, living in communities that are teaching this because we're finding the barriers of language, we're finding the barriers of technology, we're finding the barriers of, of, of certain, you know, aging, and all those things come into play, and you just can't give somebody a laptop and tell them, here's your free Wi-Fi for a year, and expect that to take off. So we've created different um, tracking devices on the, on the devices we're giving them with their consent, obviously, so we can see what happens when that device goes home. Is it being thrown in a drawer? Is it being sold because they need to pay the power, you know, power? Um, or are they actually using it for the what we were hoping they were going to use it? But we've forgotten that important step. They don't know how to use it. So what happens? We're, there's that gap that we've created yet again. So we're looking at how to close that, and we're doing that with partnerships between you know a, a different organizations and big tech. So that's, uh, I, I wonder if that answers your question somewhat. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that I completely um, know the nuances of my own question. I, I, you know, a part of the, um, my understanding is that a lot of public-private partnerships sometimes come out of the areas of business that are engaged in corporate social responsibility as well, that, that, that sometimes they are, in fact, PR exercises that have this side benefit of doing good uh, as a result of the work as well. And I wonder if whether accessibility and inclusion have become sufficiently a part of 
co corporate social responsibility efforts such that um, you know basic accessibility and and inclusion of, of underserved uh, you know um, regions or communities are, are now part of those kind of PR efforts that happen around the world to to um, help make things more inclusive I hope that question was clear I think I understood what you said and, and I um I think your question has to do, besides doing good work, are they also uh, making money? Is that what, what I heard? No, I guess what I was, is, are the CSR efforts in companies beginning to take on this issue of accessibility and inclusion? In other words, folks with uh, handicaps and disabilities, uh, et cetera, is that part of CSR? Are you seeing that around the world at all? Well, there's definitely that effort. There's no question about it. But in my personal experience, where I've really seen the effort go full force is when in the background there is gain. This is a capitalist country and we've got to talk the way, way I, the way I see it and the way most of us working in this, we see that very clear defined line. Are they coming forward with that? Obviously not, but we don't care because we're getting this work done. So, um, but there is that code that that uh, that coexistence. There's no question. Um, did that kind of answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I could I could speak to that if you'd yes. like. So um, w so we did as part of the firm that I launched when I left the World Bank. We did a lot of work with the CSR departments of big companies, Chevron, Motorola, Oracle, you know, Fortune 100 companies. The CSR budget that you're talking about is is incredibly small in most instances, and. Whether they talk a good game or not, most corporates still are not very well oriented toward trying to capture social good. So one of the big things that we focused on was trying to help them take the thing that they had said they committed to and turn it into a part of their business such that it could, would have the sustainability, it would keep going. If one person who was in charge of it got promoted, you wouldn't lose the initiative. Or where it's often the case, you mentioned, the, you mentioned a PR exercise, oftentimes what there is is the launch of a paper or a big PR exercise where there's a, a very big, big press conference and everybody shows up and then there's really nothing else. There's no staying power within the company. So I, I, I definitely agree with, uh, I think it was Dino who said that, that, um, that it has to have a grounding in the basic business principle of the company. If it's not connected to how you make money, it likely will not last. So that's one thing. The other, but, but, but by the same token, it's very possible to do. That's where a lot of the time you bring in government. If you're on the corporate side, is you say, okay, this is something that's a positive outcome that you know, t 10 years down, down the road, I know I want this externality to happen. We did a, a big project in road safety with Chevron and two parts of the World Bank and three parts of the Nigerian government and 10 other corporates when I was just starting out my firm in, in, in 2006. And uh, you know that was all about Chevron knew down the road it was very meaningful for them to have better road safety. They have products, they have people. That was a, that was a big issue for them to try to tackle. But it was a too, it was too big an issue for them to tackle alone, and it wasn't front and center enough for them to tackle it without other pe leveraging other people's resources. And so we worked very very hard for all of the private sector companies that were involved to try to to pull out of that. What were the economic interests that they were going to address by investing in this program? How they were going to be able to keep it going? How they could leverage other people's resources? How it fit with the business, in this case, a big project that the uh, roads project that the government and the World Bank were doing? And as a result of that, you have a very strong sustainability. That, that, uh, that group that we put together is still 16, 17 years later, still working. And none of the people who are originally involved in it are still part of it. So that gives you, once you, once you reach to the, to, the, to the core of what the corporate is all about, you connect it to their business process, then you've got a really successful partnership. Um, now, uh, let, let me give you a, let me oh, give you a different perspective on the same question. Um, we have a big expectation in this country that the ISPs, the internet service providers, will go out of their way to make sure that people are connected to their networks. And so there's there's federal funding programs. The ACP is one that gives low income discounts. And and but what I have found in real life is the ISPs only give it lip service. Only one or two ISPs that I know are signing anybody up for real. They most of them are participating in these programs. And if you call in and ask to get on it, they will work with you. If it's not too hard, they will give up on you fairly easily. And most of them are participating in name only, and they barely sign anybody up. 
And that's because it's go back, it goes back to what Dino said. It, it's, it's not, it doesn't make them any money. They put a lot of effort into signing up a low-income household. The government pays a $30 piece of the bill, but the ISP doesn't make a penny more than they would have made if they had that customer without the discount. And so we're just seeing them not stepping up and participating in this. But the program was designed with them to take charge and make this work, and they're, and they're not making it work. They're not signing people up. And so we have, uh, the estimates are, you know, 30, 40 million homes that could qualify for this discount. And we don't, we have only a small fraction of folks actually getting cheaper internet, so. Yeah, um, uh, Doug, you mentioned um, a, a lot of this was grant-based work that you were working on. So the, the kind of obvious role for government in a public-private partnership is money. But I'm wondering if, if you or Andy or, or Dino can share some of the other roles the government might play to help facilitate a project. I can imagine a traffic project needing a lot of uh, regulatory help and things like that and a broadband project. And, and there's a, is accountability, for example, one of the, the roles that government ought to play in these, in these public-private partnerships? So I can, I can speak to that if you'd like. Um, the government really does play a lot of roles. One of the most important roles that government plays is a convening role. Oftentimes it is more difficult for a corporate to say no when government asks, and it's also safer for them to say yes and for them to bring their, 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 their themselves together with the community. A corporate may be able to have a, a, a conversation with a community that's underserved with government in the room that they couldn't have otherwise, that may, maybe makes it safer, it maybe, maybe, maybe lowers the risk from, and we, th we don't think about it, but corporates are larger, are, are, are typically large organizations, they tend to be very conservative and risk averse, right? So one of the, one of the best things that government can do is to help de-risk a project, right? Um, the other thing that government can do is government has a long-term time frame. When you look at the corporates, corporates oftentimes have to you know, report out quarterly earnings. They have to report out quarterly progress. They have to report out if they, if they receive grants or loans, they have to, they have to report out on, on a regular basis. Government has the ability to think in two, three, five, in the case of Singapore, in generational terms, right? And what that does is that gives you more balance. I'll give you an example of something that we're doing right now in Tanzania, which is really interesting, and I think it, it's very much the same as the conditions that you might find in in uh, um, uh, you know uh, northeastern Mississippi or the Central Valley, Valley in, in in California in some places, where we have rural communities that are mostly agriculturally based, and they are they 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 struggle because there isn't quite the level of connectivity they they need, and yet. We know that within five years, everybody will have a smartphone because there will be no more dumb phones sold in the developing world. And so government, which has the ability to look at these five-year plans, says, okay, I'm going to seed some of that money to help the private sector to get into these areas. We forget how much a lot of the models that undergird our society are actually density-based models. Think about the banking system with bank branches and ATMs. Think about the old telephony systems where you're close to where all of the big cell towers are and things like that. So if you work together with government, you have that ability to, to leverage research, to re leverage resources, and to leverage their convening power. And in the case of Tanzania, their government, similar in Colombia, where we're also working in Colombia, they're, bring, they're being very aggressive in trying to help the private sector get out into those rural areas because they know that down the road, if they can convert those rural people into rural data customers, they've actually got a, vi a potentially viable business model. Um, let me give you a real example. Uh, there are cities in the U.S. who are stepping up big time. West Des Moines, Iowa just decided they were going to build a dark, they were going to build a conduit network to every home and business in the city. And in having that discussion, they, ha they said there's a very reasonable chance that they never get all their money back. So, th so they know that's something that the private sector was not willing to come to town to do because that was a very expensive undertaking. It's 100% buried, the most expensive kind of construction. But they knew that once they built it, that ISPs would show up and serve on it. And in fact, ISPs have shown up and are serving on it. Google Fiber is there. CenturyLink decided to get on it. There's probably going to be three or four ISPs on this network. But, the, but they spent the money to get it done because they said the long-term benefits that come to the city from having everybody connected far outweigh any any costs that they would lose on bond financing over the years. And, and they came to that conclusion by looking at cities who have already done it. I mean, Chattanooga, Tennessee did a, 
built their own fiber network and showed a several billion dollar benefit to the community as a whole from doing it. So West Des Moines, Iowa said, look, we'll spend the money. It's not really a partnership in that they spent all the money and then they hope somebody would show up for it. Uh, but, but they took that big bite, as he just talked about, to, to say, we, we will be the infrastructure provider. Uh, in the long run, we know people will take advantage of it and we know our community will be better off. And that's becoming a more interesting and widespread model but it's very hard for local politicians to jump over that cliff. I mean, that's a that's a very brave thing to spend money on something that you know loses money, except we do it on stadiums every year. But. <laughs> and, and along with both those things you just stated, um, I want to reiterate the factor that one of the newer issues is what are these new communities doing with these devices and the connectivity? Are they using it? Do they know how to use it? And that's an issue that we're identifying that's pretty prevalent in, in all these different communities we're going into. So we have an active movement right now to not only teach them the basics, teach them how to figure things out themselves. Um, and that's the movement we have going on. So I, yeah, again, I guess um, we we talk a lot about connectivity and broadband, and that sort of that that infrastructure rollout, that infrastructure investment is is sort of foundational to this notion. Um, but I'm also wondering the extent to which, um, once that infrastructure is in place, how we might think creatively about this notion of inclusion. So I I I, I have the most familiarity with uh, Andrew's business because it, because if you think of Farmers that don't have access to transport, for example, uh, that prevents them from being engaged in a central marketplace. And so I, I, I'm interested, have, have public-private partnerships played a role in, in non-sort uh, of broadband-based uh, uh, projects, but that are in fact uh, then exploiting broadband to, to work on a different type of inclusion? If that makes yeah, sense. sure. I mean, I can, I can certainly speak to that. If you think about the basket of services, so, so about a billion and a half people around the world are in small farming, okay? Most of the people in most of the countries, it's a larger population than China or India if you take all of the world's small farmers together and those communities. And it's true, I mean, they have, they have to get to markets, but there are a whole basket full of other services that they're missing out on because they're off the data map, right? They're missing out on access to finance. They're missing out on access to healthcare. They're missing out on access to education. And one of the things that we've seen is, is that there are companies, for example, credit unions and banks that want to deal with those people. But if the cost of client acquisition is too, too high, the cost of servicing someone is too high because you have to ride on a motorbike all the way out to the edge of the road two hours and all the way back, that's a, that's a long time to make a $2,000 loan. So if you're interested, for example, in microcredit. And so what we found is, is that that actually makes for a very good public-private partnership. Because the data, the, the, the government cares deeply about making sure people are more e successful economically, because that's their tax base. They are very interested in making sure that they're more successful in terms of their health, because that's their worker base, right? And so what you're starting to see is that the infrastructure piece is just the leading edge of a whole basket of services, which you might say go into making uh, a, a, a more productive, more engaged, and frankly, more economically successful and probably less unstable citizen base, which every government on earth wants. So part of this is about reaching out into the countryside, and part of it is about reaching into some of the underserved urban areas, but they have a lot of the same basket of services that, that government wants them to have and that the private sector probably can't do just on their own. Now, interestingly, in this country, private sector's out in front on farming. Land of Lakes, John Deere, a whole lot of different of these groups are putting together entire giant software packages, drones, I mean, all this stuff. And of course, it's only working in places that have the infrastructure. So the farmers are ready for it. I talk to farmers every week. I talk to farmers who have gotten connected, and I'm talking to farmers who are desperate to get connected. In fact, farmer, a farmer just told me this week he's not a farmer anymore. He's now an IT specialist. So. But, but, but a huge amount of farms don't have the connectivity. And so the second they get it, those, those training packages are there for them to use it. So, so the private sector has leaped out ahead of that. Of course, their incentive is they make money selling all these various 
pieces of, and of equipment and, and, and software that go along with that connectivity. But, you know, it's, it's the inner city and poor neighborhoods and large apartment buildings where our problem is, you know, private sector is taking care of farming in this country. That Around the world, that's not true, as you mentioned. But here, here they're, they're all ready for broadband, so. Um, but, Doug, let me follow up with that. Is Once the broadband's in place, is there a role for government to play in partnership with the private sector to make the use of these new technologies, um, I, I don't know if it's training or, or, or implementation, or is the private sector really in a position to just take care of that once the broadband's in place? Is there, is there, once, once everyone has broadband, is there no longer a need for public-private partnerships? Oh. There's a huge need, just not for farmers. Farmers are going to be trained by those large companies. Now, there is an interesting agricultural need here. Um, one of the one of the one of the you know stakeholders who's just been ignored are migrant farm workers, and and that's become a very competitive market just to get them to come to your farm in the first place. So having broadband is essential to get them there, but they also need help in using broadband. You know they want to they want to communicate with home every night and do all those things that that you want to do on the internet and so there's a in north carolina there's a there's been a group formed exactly for that purpose to, to train those folks and to get out and work with them uh but you know i don't the farmers don't need it now dino's talking about also there's millions of people who need it it just doesn't happen to be farmers so, I would, yes. I would, I, it, so with, what are some examples uh, outside of agriculture for, yeah. for where public private partnerships will come into play once broadband is in place. Well, how about Native Americans? That's a yeah. big issue in this country. Uh, you know, I do a lot of, uh, I did a study with them and you have entire reservations that do not have any connectivity and they need to get off, get out of the reservation and probably go down a couple of miles and connect at McDonald's. So we have a, some big issues out there in other, in other uh, groups. Yeah, I, I guess I would I would disagree with you a little bit, Doug. I think that there are an awful lot of places, especially in in communities of color out in rural areas, where there isn't very good connect, uh, connectivity, and there and there also isn't very much uh, you know digital nativeness, right? So people haven't grown up with the technology as much because they've been off the map for a while. Um, but to to your point, Jonathan, about what other industries or what other sectors, uh, a really good one is uh, is rural healthcare. Uh, I was reading a statistic the other day that said that 50% of all of the rural hospitals in the United States have gone out of business or are going out of business within the next two or three years. So um, we need to, cl clearly there's a role for telemedicine and things like that, but you still have to figure out what the business model is for that. You still have to make it work with in-person medicine and you have to have, give people the ability to, to be informed consumers of whatever it is they're getting. I mean, that's one of the things that I think we, we take for granted is that we've grown up with so much technology in our lives that we know how to manipulate it. I, I even look at the difference between myself and my 11-year-old son and he, he guesses right when he's searching for things more often than I do because he's grown up with it. Uh, I think that there are there are things like access to social services, especially healthcare, which are mission critical, where the uh, cost overlay co uh, cost outlays are are very sig uh, significant. Where I don't think we've really solved the problem yet, and there will for sure be a role for government down the road. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would add to that that in the context of of healthcare, some of the issues has got to be regulatory because right now uh, the the industry, the healthcare industry, is led around in many respects by what Medicare and Medicaid are doing. And so unless they uh, accept reimbursements or do reimbursements for remote care, then the health insurance companies won't uh, either. And so just um, uh, government's playing a role in changing the way we think about how doctors are compensated is going to be a big part of, uh, of remote health care for sure. What do you think? Yeah, let, me, let me go ahead. Let me, follow, let me follow up. Um, I mean, there are there's probably 40 million people who are below the digital divide. I mean, we have we have a huge number of people in both cities and rural areas who don't have any digital knowledge. They've never used a computer. I mean, so I was talking about farmers. When you go to if you go to a rural place where they've never had broadband before and bring it, you need to train almost everybody. It's 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 really uh, I mean, it, it's a massive one-time effort to get those folks up to speed. I mean, I talked to a rural county in in uh, in Missouri, where half of the residents have never 
use the computer at home of any any sort of digital device at their house. They, they simply don't have the base knowledge. Uh, in fact, th since they've never done it, they don't think they need it and they don't want it uh, until they get it. Then they they quickly change their mind. We know that, but yes. So, but well, we don't even have to go rural. COVID taught no. us that um, it's everybody yeah. productivity, even in big cities such as Manhattan, we couldn't get a third of the children in Manhattan to connect. Right. To and then we had another huge issue where you were mentioning healthcare, where social workers could no longer reach their, their clients. And these folks could not download apps to get medications and do the things they needed to do, even though these uh, social workers who had been blocked from visiting their clients by law uh, were desperate to try to help them. And we actually lost people uh, due to that. So th th that healthcare uh, element is extremely important. I'm so glad you guys brought it up because this is affecting people in all sorts of ways. It's not about getting online and getting on Facebook. This is healthcare. This is banking. This is education. This is survivalship. I, I don't, the technology is no longer a luxury. It is a human right. And, and, and that's what I think we need to get in everybody's mind at this point in a country like ours. Um, so what do we need to be doing differently? What, how, how do these programs need to be structured differently to be more effective? Is it just about promises being kept? Is it about accountability? Is, do we need to th approach these public-private partnerships differently than we have been historically to make them more effective? What's the next step? What should we be pressing our representatives uh, and, and, frankly, corporations to do differently than they're doing now? Well, right now there's a almost a three billion dollar grant program to give communities money to establish digital equity programs those are only going to be effective if they keep on going after the one year of funding runs out so what we have to do is everyone involved in those has to you know if you just get those program and you put 10 trainers out to go to people's houses and teach them to use broadband but a year later you go to zero trainers that's not really going to make any long-term change in the community but if those programs are set up in such a way that 10 years from now, there's still people going out and training people. That's the long-term solution. We're not gonna run out of people who don't know how to use the internet. New generations come along all the time. And so um, so we just we, we have to find a sustainable model. Government, nonprofits, and a little bit of corporate is, are the ones who have to do that. It's mostly nonprofits and government to sort of have to make this work, so. Yeah, it's a point of this of this panel, I think. It's it's definitely looking at how to form these partnerships, make them sustainable long term, and also um, be aware that technology is changing all the time. So this education factor does not just stop. It is a long term thing. We're gonna people start aging out and their technology skills are also aging out. So we have to look at the real picture and not just from a capitalistic uh, view. We have to refocus our view on a more humanistic view, I think. Um, I, and is, and uh, is anyone I, doing uh, that? Are there examples that folks here can be looking to for where it's being done right that others should be following? Or is there really just new, uh, the, you've got a lot of folks in academia here. Are, there a lot of, are, the, are these areas of research for folks? Are, are, do the exam answers exist and we're not just not doing it? Or do we not no, know no. how to do it? There's not been nearly enough of it done, but there's some very good examples. Um, in Chattanooga, there's a, there's a nonprofit run by Deb Socha, and she went to the, the city has their own broadband network, but they never did any digital inclusion. They never trained anybody. And she went to them with a proposal to give her some funding. She raised the rest elsewhere. And she, and she, she announced to the public that she was gonna have training schools. She thought she might get a couple hundred people and she got like 5,000 people signed up. I mean, the need is really drastic there and and they had no idea it was that big. And so, you know, they've not been able to train that many people yet, but, but, the, but her system is really working. And, and what she found works is you have to train each person on what they're most interested in. If, if you want to go teach my grandmother how to use internet, teach her how to use how to use knitting patterns because you got her hooked, man. And if somebody else, it's going to be how to get on a social network. For someone else, it's playing games. 
And if you teach each person what they most want to do, they learn all the rest on their own. That's the, and so we know the training methods that work, but we, there's very few of these programs. Hopefully these grants will kickstart hundreds of new ones, but there, and there's been very good, there's been very good systems. There's a, there's a place in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, who has given out something like a hundred thousand computers to, to, to homes that don't have them and to homeless students and that sort of thing. And so they really have it down to an art form. They actually raise the money. They pay high school kids to refurbish the computers. So they make a good living wage and learn a skill. They get them out to, to people and they train them how to use them. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, there are a few programs around, but unfortunately, you know, I, you know, it's probably not a list of more than a hundred. I mean, I, I'm just guessing, but it's not gigantic, unfortunately. But but we now know the models that work. So, so I, I think I, I could speak to this. There are there are three principles, if you will, that I think are really important. One of them is urgency. There needs to be some urgency in what we're doing. There needs to be in the case the case of the work we we're, we're doing with farmers in in uh, uh, Tanzania, Ghana, and Colombia. Their their urgency is they have crops that they need to get to market. And if they don't get them to market, they lose that money. So that they're trying to feed their family, they're trying to make a better life for themselves. That is that is a real real time urgency, right? The second thing is trying to find the right partners. It's not just the, necessarily the people who want to be up on the stage with you. It has to be someone for whom there's an economic benefit. If they're not, if the private sector is not going to make any money doing this, then that's going to be a, that that's going to be a, a a miss over the over the medium term for sure. And I think the third thing that's probably the most important thing is having some real clear goals that, are, that people can, can call you on. Because what we've seen in a lot of instances is exactly the kind of program that you mentioned, where there are commitments that are being made, there's a ceremony that takes place, there's TV, a couple of people put it on, uh, on their LinkedIn profiles, and then nothing really happens. And if there is, if we have concrete goals where we can say, this is something that needs to be accomplished, Here's how we're going to measure our success. Here are the people at the table and, 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 and constituents, citizens and NGOs and the press and others can go back and look at that over, you know, six months down the road, two years down the road. They can see whether there's been progress or not. That's really meaningful. Too many things get started. Too few get finished. Uh, the urgency argument, there's one, one, one thing that's uh, also an Africa example in this case, but it's very, very, uh, I think it's r related, is, is during COVID. As you may remember, there, were, uh, there, was, a, there was a mad scramble when COVID first started to, to figure out who, who got access to the vaccines. And wealthy countries bought up a lot of the vaccines and were not interested in sharing them in any meaningful way. And some of the very, the most important business and, 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 and commercial leaders in Africa started talking to the Africa Exim Bank and the AU, the African Union and, and others. And, and, and three or four, I think it's four or five of the, the most important actors on, on the continent got together and they'd call each other every night to say, okay, we need to solve this problem. It is urgent. We can measure what it means to get these vaccines to people or not, right? We're tracking this stuff all the time. And they knew that they so they, they knew there was an urgency around it, and that it was ultimately about the economic future of the continent. And they came together and they solved the problem for Africa. And Africa made it out of this uh, uh, out of out of the, the biggest health crisis in the in, in recent history. So it c certainly can be done, but it's got to be done in a way where it's not a short term. Let's get a let's get a PR event and and move on to the next thing. Um, <clears throat> Doug and Dino, I, I, you guys work more domestically, I think, than uh, Andy does, um, and but you may not work with these folks. So one of the one of the um, organizations, if you will, government agencies with which I have some experience is uh, economic development offices at the state and county level, and I feel like historically they've been very focused on basically trying to poach uh, a factory or a manufacturing plant from another state or county to move to them to create basic employment. Is there any kind of a um, light on the horizon with those economic development efforts to steer away from this sort of old world way of thinking and steer in terms of you know, entrepreneurship and, and other areas? Because that seems like an area um, that would be right for public-private par partnership. Because Amazon, for example, is, has every desire to get rid of all of its employees, right? So they don't want to be called on to employ more people. But I think be, they would love to be part of an effort to train more people to be entrepreneurs, to be online sellers, to do things like that that are 
as, as you say, economically beneficial to both parties. And I'm just wondering whether or not you guys have had any experience with these economic development offices and whether there any movement in that direction or are they still sort of ensconced in this bring a factory here and I'll give you a tax break? Interestingly, they, that model's broken. That hardly anybody does that anymore, except, except you can't. You can't turn down someone bringing a gigantic car manufacturing plant, right? But, but communities have, for a large part, stopped poaching each other. In fact, the biggest in the rural counties, who I work in a lot of rural counties, the number one thing they are stressing is work at home. People working at home flood their economy with good paying jobs that they're making from an employer in another state. And when you're in a county where the where the average household income is a third of what it is in cities, you know, getting people making fifty, a hundred thousand dollar jobs in their communities is 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 revolutionary. They could they make more money getting a hundred people in that county with good paying jobs online than they do bringing a factory, and you know, so and so that's really been the new thrust. And of course, they need broadband to do that. But there are a lot of communities that are really working towards that. Some of them are paying people to come there to work at home. You know, once they get a fiber network in their place. So I think that I think a lot of local economic development folks have recognized that broadband is one of the two or three keys to their long term success. I mean, that you they will tell you that. So. Um, so, yeah, there, we just don't see. I mean, I'm sure there are still communities doing the old style, but I've talked to 100 of those agencies in the last two years and hardly any of them use that model anymore. So, are they going beyond yeah, broadband? I keep trying to. Are they going beyond broadband, though, to the work itself? In other words, like I said, to, to helping people figure out how they're going to uh, work from home or what they might do once the broadband's in place. I can give you a clear example. What, what we have Maybe done. Maybe get is closer to your have, microphone, uh, if so, you would, Dino. Thanks. So um, I can give you a clear example of of this working in the right direction. So. We reached out to different organizations, one of them being the, uh, the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which is one of the largest in the country. And they, and you know, it's all dependent on who's in the helm. And she got this right away. And what they've created is um, a subsidiary to the chamber uh, called the Business Center, where they became very active and still are on educating the entire state um in different you know online by going there in person and making sure the technology is part of the latino um education educational forum uh, it's not just about this that and the other but they've recognized the importance of technology and they put it in the forefront so they also recognize the impact it's going to have economically in the state by having these folks well educated going forward as we know that the latino community is going to be the biggest in, in, the, uh, in, in the country in the next 20, 25 years. Um, so I've seen the positive and folks that are getting engaged and getting prepared for what you just asked. And that's a beautiful thing when you have the white people behind the helm that recognize and understand and can see forward and are visionary. Great, that's thanks, thanks a lot. I'd like to open it. Do you I'm going to open up for questions. Just, just, just a one tiny little addition, which is that nowadays, if they were, if someone were to go, when, when, when Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi got into fights over who was going to get the next car plant, uh, one of the things that came to the fore really early on was you can't even get a job in a car factory anymore unless you're pretty good with technology because the jobs are becoming more and more sophisticated. The cars and whatever it is you're manufacturing is requiring more and more or else it'll be done by a robot, right? So uh, I think that uh, I think that that's, that's also, it's something that's happening right now. There's no way around it. Thank you. Uh, questions from folks? Well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I heard you guys talk about, um, you know, using work from home as, you know, a better, perhaps safer option um, for people. But we have CEOs like Elon Musk talking about how, um, you know, um, working from home is morally wrong. 
We know that the vast majority of people of color have jobs that they do, they are forced to do in person, which we saw, which is why our, our communities were decimated by COVID. You know, what, what are organizations and governments doing to encourage, I mean, like to encourage people to be able to work from home and, and, and by setting up these types of infrastructure and protecting the right to be able to work from home when possible. And this just this is my personal opinion. This is Doug. I don't think the government's doing anything for the Elon Musk's of the world. But a lot of governments are letting their employees work at home. In fact, a lot of governments have completely embraced that idea. And so, uh, and so they, you know, that that's a really good start. So, um, but you know, it, it would take an act of Congress to mandate, you know, that a corporation has to let people work at home. That's probably not even constitutional. So, um, so I don't know that we can stop the very largest corporations, but an awful lot of corporations have completely fallen in love with the idea and they're not going backwards. So I think, I think this is one of those over 10 years, you're just going to see it spread out the more and more of the economy and it moves downhill. And I think that, you know, at the, fa the very fact that it's a permanent movement probably gets it to a lot of more people over the next decade. I, that's my own guess. So. I think we have a question online, to, um, but I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out who it is. Do, do you want to uh, turn on your microphone and ask your question? Although we're in webinar mode. <laughs> a question? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, yeah, no, I'm just trying to get the online question okay. if I can. I appreciate that other people have them. It's your question. That's the online question? Yes. Okay. I thought it was Wilfredo, yeah. <coughs> no, um, th there, are, there, there are many positives about public-private partnership, but at the same time, there is a flip side as well. Uh, I, I, we feel that a multi-stakeholder model is much better, and I, in public-private partnership, there is a danger of uh, uh, the business actor uh, progressing uh, his influence to the point of uh, writing government policy with his ink, with his paper, with his pen. It has happened in many sectors in many countries. And so why do we still persist with this public-private partnership terminology? Even if you have improved it, it could mean the same thing for many people in many countries. So certainly, a public-private partnership is a tool, and it can be used well or it can be used badly. I think it depends a lot on the, public si the, the private sector partners and on the strength of the government. What we find is a lot of the times where governments are weak and the private sector is strong, especially in resource-focused e economies, it's harder to create that right mix. I will agree with you completely. Isn't that what multi-stakeholder model balances? So there is a public, there, there is government, there is private sector, and then with civil society, it balances the whole thing. Um, I, 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 I can see that working in some instances, but definitely not in all. Uh, I can tell you from some of the experiences that we have had, what we, what we end up seeing is, is that government and, and private sector actors come together to form an NGO which actually does the work. And in some instances, that's a nice, that's a nice way to go. Uh, but I really think it depends on the individual uh, case. All right, I'll, I'll read you on my question. And in broadband, we're seeing that. There's a whole lot of communities I'm working with right now who are using some government funding, some commercial funding, and they're creating cooperatives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a business that's going to be the ISP for the community. They're going to make sure everybody gets connected, every household. They're going to make sure everybody gets trained. And so that's the middle ground between the two pieces. Unfortunately, that's a rare model. You have, you're, you're exactly right about that, but it's a great model. So That's a good segue into Wilfredo's question. Um, what is the key difference between a public-private partnership and a private finance initiative? Can both coexist in a project and in terms of public-private partnerships, after a project is completed, who owns it? Well, for the financing and the operation are just two different things. You're absolutely right about that. And, and the answer is there's every, there's, I've seen examples of those two things working well together and of those two things conflicting. It just depends on the circumstances. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the private finance initiative, to, it can really be a wonderful thing when it works right, so, yep. A question? 
But it goes back to the earlier question, who's in charge of it? I mean, that's what it really boils down to. So. Well, and, and, and I think it goes back even further. If you set up the partnership in a way that is largely transparent and is goal-based, where everybody knows what their role is and where external parties are, are read in at the very beginning, then your, your risk of elite capture is really much lower. Uh, but if you don't have clear goals and there's a lot of fuzzy talk at the, at the beginning, you may never have any action at all, or if you do, there may be, there may be the kind of action that you don't want. And you just described the number one problem with PPPs in this country. People don't talk out the, the pros and the cons on day one before they start. They, they, nobody likes to talk about the downside. They only want to talk yeah. about the, the good goals. <laughs> so. Okay, so uh, my name is Shadrach Ankara from Ghana. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from a country where we face uh, yeah, a lot of um, these uh, connectivity uh, um, issues. So when it comes to the rural communities in Ghana, especially the northern part of Ghana, we have uh, issues where um, people, uh, farmers do not have uh, the devices um, to get connected and um, network infrastructure sometimes in some of the communities, it does exist. And if it does, uh, you have um, a limited um, uh, connectivity. So um, here is the to the telcos, they are not um, interested in um, communities where the population is... Yeah, you're cutting off. Um, they are not interested in uh, communities where connectivity is uh, uh, Sorry, um, the population is very low. Uh, in that case, they will not be able to get... Uh, um, I can't hear anything. Investments. Mm. So they are not willing to provide connectivity to those communities. And in instances where the government is not able to come in, to assist communities. Um, and we're not. We're not hearing. The, we're not hearing the question. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I can, do, you, do you understand the question? Yeah, I can. I can. I, I, let, let me paraphrase the question. He's talking. Okay. He, yeah, he, he's talking about. He's from Ghana. He's talking about the the fact that there are. There are low density communities, especially in rural areas, where the business model that we have in the city may not work as well, and as a result, that there's no real economic logic around connecting those people. Um, I, I work in Ghana. I have a team in Ghana. So um, I can tell you from personal experience, I understand the problem. I can also tell you that when there's enough value at the end of the line, people have a way, especially Africans who are immensely entrepreneurial, right? Have, have a, find a way to make it work. So what do we see? When I first started working in West Africa, there were about 20,000 cell phones in Nigeria. Now there's, a, now there's a cell phone for every man, woman, and child in the country of over, uh, over 100 million, right? So what it means is, is that you, we have to connect up the economic logic. Sometimes government can help do things that need being done. In the case of Uganda, government said, with our three cell phone, lic cell phone licenses, national ones, we're going to say that you need, we mandate that you have 4G coverage in 90% of the country. So everybody bidding for a license made that commitment. But then government needs to stick with that, and they need to think in advance, okay, is there an economic logic for making a cell tower work? That what I think is what I think oftentimes happens is is that the, the barriers to entry of a public private partnership on the private side private sector side are, are too low. They haven't thought it through. They want the they want the access to license. They make a promise, and if they know that no one's going to be holding them holding them to it, then it doesn't matter. It's got to work in the end for all of the partners, or else it doesn't work as a partnership. So in the case of Ghana, you have to figure out why are, the, why, why are we trying to connect these people? What are they going to do with the internet? To, to the earlier point where you were, you were talking about what's going to be the, it, you know, if it's, if it's not knitting for his grandmother, right, then what is it? It's agriculture in the case of Ghana. If you're a sorghum farmer, you need to get your stuff to market, right? Full stop. So that's your entry point. But we haven't done enough thinking about the business model, and that's really the next frontier, I think. All right, uh, last question here. Hi, I'm wondering if in the actual brass tacks of implementation, finding these, making these work, is use of local economic development offices uh, viable? If you walk into uh, the local office at, uh, you know, I don't know, Loudoun County, I don't know where, but and say, hey, is there anything you're trying to get accomplished? Are there goals that you have that a public-private partnership might assist? Or is it just, you know, you got to go in there and sell them everything 
from ground up? Well, the answer to that is if you want to put those offices on a scale of one to 10, there's a bunch of ones, there's a bunch of tens around, and there's a a lot of people in between. Some economic development offices are just amazing. They have completely grasped these ideas and they're out promoting them. Other ones are sort of placeholders and they don't get very much done. It's, a, it's back to the accountability. So, and so, yeah, we, we see every possible range of, of good to bad of those offices. Good ones can make a giant difference. I mean, here I'm, I'm in Western North Carolina. They're extremely active to make sure the most rural people here get broadband. That's that's their number one goal for the next three years. So, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. So, but other places are not at all effective, so. All right, we've reached the top of the hour. Really appreciate, um, uh, join me in thanking uh, Doug Dino and uh, Andrew for their uh, participation in the panel. Thank you. And this is now the start of a 30 minute break and uh, we'll be back. Uh, is it not? 15 minute break? Oh, I have until 2.15? Why? Oh, I didn't think my schedule said. We can ask another question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yep. <laughs> Trying to do two jobs. I, I'm Kosi. I'm a senior one from Benin. My, my suggestion is to move from the data internet we have now with our operator to free internet available. It's not possible for us in our country in Africa, I don't know what is the situation in Europe or another place in the world, but when we send, you buy data for one gig to just up upload something it is not economic ec economically uh, usable for 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 something we need to make research for example I, but is it possible to have another model of business on this area is it possible when we we discuss with the people who provide internet in our region this every time we say global internet connectivity is very much the cost is very much for them why can we do why uh, the second thing is so also is training if you don't know what to do with internet you just put your money in the, uh, the town uh, internet we use it for necessity and need internet, for example, to make research and so on. There's some people in my area need only internet to make WhatsApp. That is not normal. We, suppose we need to educate our people. Training also is something. Can we have fun to train people to, to let them know what is important for them in the internet area? Anybody want to take that? Well, I, I can answer the first question. I actually do quite a bit in Africa myself, and I, I think you know I work in Nigeria a lot in the last couple of years, and Nigeria has probably the most creative um, wireless economy in the in the world. You can buy internet for a minute. <laughs> you can buy it for one use to upload a file. You can buy it for an hour, six hours a day, three days a week, every single possible way. To buy connectivity is there, and for the little uses, they're really cheap. I mean, they're literally pennies. And so, and so the so the the, the cellular carriers have really de determined how to monetize it so that it, everyone is affordable. And so, and, and and now we're seeing they're building up, they're starting to build fiber networks uh, in Lagos, and 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 those folks are adopting the same model. So students are buying three days of high speed connectivity for their exams and then dropping it again. I mean, it's a really interesting model uh, to, to match the needs to the way that the, that the providers are selling it. I, I don't see that model in a whole lot of other places. So um, I think we all been talking the whole time about your second question. We all think the world needs a ton more training. So I, I think you'll get us all to agree to that. So. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would. Microphone? No, sorry. Um, I, I would compare uh, Benin to uh, Rwanda, okay? 
which are uh, rough, roughly speaking both small markets, both both you know, not, not very big economies. And yet Rwanda has taken a very, very aggressive posture to try to become an IT hub. They've got a lot of leadership. They've marketed themselves very, very aggressively so that people know Rwanda now. They have made, made a, a huge point of integrating with their neighbors because they recognize themselves as being a small market. And as a result, Rwanda does a lot of IT for their neighbors, right? Uh, when, you start to when you start to drive more usage, you start to drive down the cost of anything right? The, the more frequency there is. Uh, the, so, so a combination of vision and integration with, with other larger players is likely what's going to get the costs to go down uh, along with regulation that supports that. I don't think that there's anything that can keep, uh, keep Benin from being the next Rwanda. There's no difference between the Rwandans and the, ben the Beninois that I know. I think the difference was simply that 10 years ago, Rwanda said they were going to make that their almost their number one economic priority, and then they did it. So. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean about having the vision yes. and sticking with yes. it. You said it. 10 years, they stuck with that vision. And yes. now it is easy for me to invest in Rwanda and hard still for me to invest in Benin also. Um, Andrew, I, I had a question, believe it or not. It, it's how you that are so um, involved in other countries. Uh, I, I happen to be Colombian. Um, how do you deal with corruption or the red tape in these countries to get things done? You don't have to go overseas to get that. Yeah, yeah, I, was gonna <laughs> say, I, I think that that is a that is a misperception that that only exists in other countries. But um, uh, what we what we tend to do is we tend to focus on we tend to focus on on the individual, right? And the indiv and the drivers of the individual. The, uh, the closer you are to the edge, the closer you are to the citizen, the, the, the harder it is to, to, uh, to, to, to pull off corruption. And what we've seen is at scale and at, at, the, you know, at the personal level, uh, you, you ha people have the tools to get around corruption. All right, last question, uh, actual last question here. Hello, um, Ali from Pakistan. And my question is about the uh, when we are talking about the public and partnership, uh, uh, pu private partnership to uh, bridge the gap of connectivity in the rural areas. Uh, actually, the rural areas in every country mostly is uh, the most difficult operation uh, operate, oper to operate, as well as there is a uh, less revenue generation from that particular community segment. So uh, mm, clearly, it looks like a loss from a public sector they, they are going to bear, and how much uh, they are going to sacrifice the the there is a regulation cost, operational cost, licensing, etc., and uh, then private sector. How? Uh, what are the? Well, I mean, uh, gap uh, which government can sacrifice and the private sector can make so that there is a service uh, which enough. Uh, there is a clear that the demand is there in every country. The rural community is growing, the, uh, and the demand side is there, but the supply side. Uh, how? What? What could be the key benchmark? Uh. We have that. We have that exact issue here. The vast majority of the surface area of the U.S. has terrible broadband, and so this country is throwing a forty-two billion dollar grant program. We threw another hundred billion dollars of what's called ARPA local funding to help get this fixed. The government has to subsidize getting the infrastructure in rural places. The commercial companies are not going to go out and build networks where nobody lives. The problem is that's not a sustainable model, back to the word we keep using, because somebody's got to pay to keep that running over the years. And so we, we're building them now, and let's hope over the next decade we figure out how to make them sustainable before they deteriorate and don't work anymore. But, uh, but it, the answer is the government has to step in to solve rural infrastructure problems. There's, there's no other way around it that I know of. So. Those are great uh, words to end the session on. So once again, I'll ask you to thank Doug, Dino, and Andy for their presentation. Can we actually leave this time, or are you going to ask us another question? <laughs> All right, I think we're done. Hey, good to meet you, Dino. I'd like to talk to you sometime. Yes, sir. He's running to the airport.
gotten up all day long and got connectivity. Don't jump around too much. It's not actually a break. Let's go right in the Yes, we also on Zoom, so they won't hear us at all. Is this the one that's going around? That's the yeah, and then there's one for you. He's gonna need the mic. What do you? <laughs> okay, that's okay. I'm going to start learning Spanish tomorrow, I promise. Hello, hello, hello. I just want to make sure that... Okay. Folks, folks, don't leave. This is not a break. Stay seated. We're going to go right into the next panel. Yes. There will be detention for those that are not present for the session. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, yes, I don't, you know, yeah. want to leave space for after you have a ton to say. Yes. But, hmm? Yes, I think we should have yeah. discussion. Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right, do you want to... Um, and there's a microphone here. Started. On, here. Oh, right here. Oh, Jolie. Uh, yeah. Is the one that oh. we no. have to share? Uh, no, we, had, we each got our own microphone. This is a high rent with an operation. Yeah. yeah. So this one here? Or no, we have to use it all uh, the time. Well, because of this, this one will be used for Q&A. Okay, uh, just use, use that one there. Use that one. Use that one. Yeah. And I'm going to... I just want to check the channel. You were able to bring the bottom. Yeah, no, this one was cutting out, so maybe it was. it's a problem with the channel on the... On the thing. Yeah. And there's a... There's a I think so. A small table here, kind of. Okay. Anything yes. you want. Okay. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, to those in the room and to those who are following from wherever you are online. Um, we'll move right into the next session, which is titled The State of the Nation for People with Disabilities. My name is Filippo Trevisan. I'm the Associate Dean in the School of Communication here at American University. I'm also the Deputy Director of the Institute on Disability and Public Policy, which is one of the co-sponsors of today's and tomorrow's event. Um, now, a lot of my work has to do with um, technology, people with disabilities, and in particular political participation at all levels, from the local level to the global level, and uh, in various countries as well. So I'm very excited here today uh, to be helping facilitate uh, this discussion and conversation. And our two speakers um, today are going to be Greg Shadan and uh, Manolo Alvarez. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them in just a second. But we had a really good conversation as we connected a few days ago to talk about today's panel. And I think I see our conversation around um, the state of uh, internet access and accessibility for people with disabilities around the world today really revolve around three main themes that uh, I think are going to drive this conversation today. One of them is, of course, regulation and legislation. Another one is culture, and another one is technology. And you know, there are various stakeholders, of course, involved in each one of those, but I think everything we're going to hear from them, and I'm looking forward to your questions as well, um, really are going to sort of overlap with those three themes. Um, let me, I'll, I'll give a, a brief introduction, but let me just say that I think that their perspectives, I think, are very complementary, uh, and they'll, they'll provide, uh, you know, 
a legal perspective as well as a user perspective, a teacher's perspective, we'll hear a lot of that. And uh, you know, we only have an hour, so I don't want to take up too much time. We'll get right into uh, our first speaker is going to be Manolo, and let me tell you um, a little bit about him uh, before I hand it over to him. Um, so Jose Manuel Alvarez Caban, better known as Manolo, He's a blind person and he truly believes in social inclusion and has dedicated his life to promoting equal access to technology for all. He is an innovator, developer of apps, educational software and video games for blind students, podcaster, researcher and professor at the Faculty of Education at the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. He teaches assistive technology courses and has offered courses in accessible technology at the graduate level as a visiting professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He has also conducted digital accessibility workshops at universities in Panama, Mexico, the Dominican Republic, and Spain. The NASA Johnson Space Center, um, he joined a team there developing software for blind students to learn science. He's a member, uh, he was a member of the U.S. Federal Communications Commission Office of Engineering Technology Advisory Group. He was also a promoter of the creation of Law 229, which guarantees the accessibility of web pages of the government agencies of Puerto Rico and offered assistance to Puerto Rico State Elections Commission, as well as participated in the work team that developed the first talking ATM in Puerto Rico by Banco Popular. He's a graduate of State University of New York, the University of South Maine, and California State University at Northridge. So please join me in welcoming Manolo, and uh, we look forward to what you have to tell us today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to start uh, with a question. Uh, we are talking about uh, accessibility inclusion and the internet. And my question is, uh, is right now the internet accessible for persons with disabilities? That, that's a very good question. And I will give you my answer and my perspective, and I will divide that answer in two parts. First, uh, this morning, the panelists has already talked uh, a little bit about it, and is that they are uh, standards. WCAG 2.1 are guidelines that um, just do that, guide the process, enable that web page can uh, comply and uh, be accessible. And that's important. We need uh, standards. Uh, so we can um, uh, assure that that web page uh, can be accessible. That's one one of part, and the other part is usability, the user experience. You must need that person with disability navigate your web page. You must receive feedback for person with disability that use assisted technology. I will then uh, do a, a very, very uh, short demonstration. I am using a braille display. This is a technology that I connected to my iPhone or through my computer, and everything that is screen reader talks is presented in braille. And uh, the technology that I will demonstrate it right now is my iPhone that also has a screen reader integrated and uh, it is a voiceover and I will give you a very short demonstration because what I want to do is a relationship between the standards and the usability. So you can understand and uh, maybe at the end I can answer that, that question that I, uh, I, I make myself. It, it is uh, accessible or not right now the internet for persons with disabilities. Okay, so standards, let's go to the first part. Uh, WCAG 2.1 is right now the current standards are divided in four principles. The first principle is that mo uh, all information, digital uh, uh, information must be um, perceptible. And for example, uh, the, the, that's the most important, one of the most important guidelines, the 1.1 that say that every image must have uh, alt text, text alternative. That's what the standards say. So that, that's an example. That there's another guidelines over there in perceptible, the contrast of colors. So if you have a video, you have to put closed captions. So that's an example of a guideline that you must follow. 
The second principle is uh, make the information operable. Uh, for example, you have uh, a form in your web page. So a, a, a person that uses a keyboard, like a blind person, to access the web page does not use a mouse, can uh, follow very easy by pressing the tab, uh, the order of that form. That's another example of make uh, information operable. The third uh, principle is understandable. We have to make our uh, web page uh, based in some guidelines. Uh, for example, a structure make uh, using uh, headings there I go. that uh, have hierarchy. So I can navigate it. I will show you uh, an example that have all of these right now. And the uh, fourth principle is robust. So if you, we, we comply with that, uh, person with assistive technology then can access that, that information, that the standards. Let's then make a very short demonstration so you can see that standards of a user perspective. So I will activate my screen reader uh, of the my, my phone. I have it here. Oh, let, let me put uh, slower, please. Give me just a second. Spanish always sounds fast to me. Okay, 40% that, I think that, that, that that's a slow that you can understand it. That this voice also is a very robotic uh, voice that is my preference. Uh, technology have on uh, very, very natural now, right now, text to speech technology. But see, since I learned that, that technology so way back, I get used to, to this voice. So that's something that's a preference uh, that of a person. So <laughs> I am running in a web page. Uh, I create just uh, a web page. So uh, with this, all the things of those <laughs> guidelines that I just say to you, and we will explore, navigate very quick with my screen reader. I am now on some image. And I, that image does not have all text, the text alternative. So you, I want you to hear what happened with a blind person. A person that uses a screen here will find. Image, 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 image. Do you hear what I said? Image. I don't have any idea. Just imagine if I am on a university and I said, uh, please select or choose our university programs and it says image link image link image link i don't uh, and i have to start to guess to trying to find the information but that that's not accessible and that's what the guideline the wcag said you must describe with text or image because if not what will happen this is the user experience and the, um, it is not fair that uh, a person cannot access information, uh, a blind person, a, a person that uses assistive technology, because the web page then it is not accessible. So it, th that would be a barrier created by um, the, the technology and the person that does not uh, do that. So technology always promote inclusion, not segregation. So that's a very uh, short example. Um, I told you that uh, with the forms, it's very important uh, every time you create a form that that's uh, uh, principle one. Principle two, uh, operable, uh, is quite important in a form to follow a reading order. I uh, have uh, so many times visit a form and I say, I hit tab and my screen reader read first name and I, hear my, I write my first name, Jose. And I press tab and say address to. And I press tab and say email. And I press tab and say uh, last name. That's not follow the guidelines. The reading order is very important because I have access uh, forms 
that have, uh, I don't know, 40 fields. And it is no way that I can, at the end, um, make that information uh, correct. And on top of that, when I find uh, the button to submit, if that button does not have the text, well, I will just hear button, button, button. I have uh, completed forms that have two buttons at the ends. And I said, my screen reader, button, and button one, and button two. And I start to guess again. And I, when I press, I say, well, my logic say that button one must be send. And I, would, I press it, it says cancel. <laughs> so there's another guessing because that web page first does not follow the rules, the guidelines, and second, does not pass by a manually review of a person with disability. I have found buttons that have an image and the person put the alt text and when I found the button, it said magnifier. And that button, it, what really means is search. But the correct way to put is search button, not magnifier. But uh, that, that's also important, the context, when you describe the, the alt text relationship. Um, when we are talking about the third uh, principle, it is about understandable. Our information must be understandable. Um, using headings, and I uh, want to show you an example here that is very common. It is um, language. Internet is globally, and person that create contents web page must specify the language of the web page. And if uh, have, are more than one language in one page, must specify a tag. This is in English, this is in Spanish, or whatever uh, language it is. I will make my last demonstration related to that topic so you can hear what happened when you find a web page that had more than one language uh, and what happened with the screen reader. I will put, for example, I will put the voice in, in Spanish right now. I use a better quality voice, and then I will go to. Okay, I will visit a web page that I have that is uh, HTML uh, editor, so blind persons can uh, programming a very accessible web page. So I will navigate this web page. Inclusion code here. Home, Viz download, link, documentation, link. So this is uh, the navigation bar, and I said home, download, it is read in English. Well, here now. Espanol visitado, el hace, final de lista. Now there's the option for Spanish, but say Espanol in Spanish, because the web page is correctly tagged in the language. So if I keep continuing with that page, an educational HTML and markdown editor. He keep reading the information in English. Let's go to the Spanish version. Español visitado. Elace. Final de lista. Inclusión code. Tira. Inicio. Visitado. Elace. Descarga. Elace. Documentación. Elace. English. Un editor de HTML y markdown accesible y educacional. So they c the, the technology can then put automatically the language and I can correctly. If I use a braille display, that I use a braille display all the time, what would happen if, if the la attack language is not correct presented, then the braille, it would be presented, the text in English and the, or the text in Spanish with the signs in English. For example, upper uh, in braille and uppercase letter in English have the dog six. In Spanish is four or six. And all the signs changing. So if I access it with a braille display and the language is not correctly presented, that it is not understandable to me. So what will happen again? I have to start to guessing. And that's not fair um, in this era that um, the the best resource that I can have accessing as a person with disability a web page if that I guess in right. And uh, that's something that if you follow the guidelines and if you use 
a person with disability to test your web page, then it's the best practice in being able that then we can define that that web page is accessible. I will conclude now my presentation and later on I'll be uh, more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Manolo. It's, um, you know, always interesting to hear and learn also from direct experience as well as all the wealth of experience you have teaching and working in this space. And, um, you know, many questions, but I think we should move on to um, Greg and uh, hear from him because I think your perspective is going to complement very well what uh, Manolo has been sharing with us and then we can open up for a conversation uh, with everybody. So let me tell you a little bit more about Greg's experience. He's a lawyer, 35 plus years of experience in intellectual property, technology and transactional law. He has practice, his practice focuses on intellectual property and technology transactions, internet law and policy, IP protection and web app accessibility under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, he advises clients on various internet law matters, including ICANN and the new GTLD program, internet governance, website development and content, domain name acquisitions, transfers, disputes, and online policing and enforcement of IP rights. He works with clients on resolving compliance issues relating to accessibility for websites and mobile apps under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and has worked with clients in entertainment, consumer goods, technology, internet, apparel, accessory, fragrance, financial services, manufacturing, pharmaceutical, and publishing industry. So a wide range of different clients and experiences, um, helping them work towards more inclusion online. He is also a resident of Greenwich Village in New York, plays the saxophone, and is a lawyer as a graduate of Columbia Law School as well as the Wesleyan University. So thank you very much, Greg, for being here with us, and we look, look forward to learning from you. Thank you. So, uh, as as uh, Filippo said, I'm a lawyer, and about 15 years ago, uh, one of my colleagues noticed that I did, uh, you know, technology law and that I was involved with uh, ICANN and internet matters and said, you know, can you help me with this web accessibility stuff? I've been doing bank ATM litigation over accessibility, but now that the litigation field has moved to websites, I don't know anything about it. And the rest is, is kind of history. Um, at that time, there wasn't much in the way of litigation. It was mostly compliance counseling. Um, since then, things have changed a lot. Um, and this is an area that in many ways is defined by litigation or, or the threat of litigation. Um, and it's, uh, but the litigation al almost often, almost always never actually occurs uh, because the cases are settled um, very early, uh, typically before any papers are filed uh, by the defendant. Uh, so we've got a little robot here. Um, <laughs> In any case, it's, it's a robot Glenn from Canada. <laughs> Just as long as he doesn't bring the wildfires with him. In any case, um, the plaintiff's bar um, has gotten hold of this uh, issue over the last several years. Um, so a lot of the litigation has been brought um, in a very high volume. Um, the uh, in, in the last year alone, in 2022, there were over 3,200 lawsuits filed uh, involving web accessibility issues. Uh, and of those, over 2,500 were filed in New York. Fortunately, I practice in New York. <laughs> uh, number two um, is uh, Florida. Uh, California has been number three for federal litigation, but it's dropped down a fourth. And, and Pennsylvania, um, is currently fourth. Um, and when I say fourth, it's fourth with like 20. So the difference between New York and uh, almost any other place is, is uh, astronomical. Um, you know, in part that's because the courts in, in New York have been more um, friendly to uh, keeping plaintiffs' uh, lawsuits uh, alive. Uh, but typically these cases get settled you know, very early for a fairly modest sum of money very little of which is seen by the plaintiff. Uh, in most cases, the plaintiff is essentially an employee of the lawyer rather than the other way around. 
um, and they might get, say, $1,000 out of, say, ten or $15,000. The rest goes to the, to the lawyer. Uh, there are still, of course, litigation by disability advocates and disability advocacy rights organizations. And um, the plaintiffs, you know, in many cases are disability advocates themselves. They're not merely plaintiffs for hire. Uh, one of the most prolific litigants is actually um, a woman who has filed or had filed for her over 600 lawsuits, um, almost all of which involve accessibility and the web, but not web accessibility as we've been discussing it. Her cases are almost all against hotels and against what's called the, the reservation rule. What she looks for is whether the website has information about uh, accessibility features of the hotel. And if it doesn't, she brings a lawsuit. Um, now, she may claim that she is interested in going to 600 different hotels. Um, that might be stretching things a little bit. Um, and then indeed, for the first time in 18 years, the Supreme Court will be hearing a case involving accessibility, and it is involving a, a case involving uh, Deborah Lawfer, uh, who uh, is a resident of Florida, but will sue wherever she needs to. Uh, so she sued a hotel in Maine, actually uh, a little kind of bed and breakfast with three or four cottages uh, called the Coast Valley Inn, which um, actually it's not accessible, which you know is a different problem, um, but uh, also did not have any information about whether or not it was accessible on, on its uh, rather simplistic website. Um, and the uh, district court in Maine ruled that um, Lawford did not have standing to sue because she didn't have a uh, realistic um, desire to go to the hotel. So she was essentially classified as, as a, what gets called a tester. Um, and she actually amended her complaint. Initially the complaint, that, uh, the answer that the was filed, or there was a motion to dismiss filed, um, saying, well, look, she wasn't going to go to the hotel, so she doesn't have standing, because it doesn't even say anything in her about wanting to go to the hotel. So she filed a, an amended complaint, which said, I want to go to the hotel. Um, and the uh, district court in Maine said, you don't have standing, go away. She appealed. The uh, Court of Appeals, or rather the, uh, the circuit court, um, said, no, we think you do have standing. Um, the injury is in not having the information. Um, and, and it doesn't, in essence, it doesn't matter. Um, that's obviously this simplifying long complex cases. You know, you're always going to say something that isn't quite right, but, and I'm telling it in a very, uh, you know, gossipy sort of way. So, you know, but the ultimate truth is essentially where I'm at. So that now, uh, that creates what's called a split in the circuits. There already was one, but it created one more relatively high profile case, which was enough to kind of create the uh, interest you know, on, on the Supreme Court. Um, and the, uh, so now the uh, First Circuit, which includes Maine, and they, you know, came out and said that they believe that um, she has standing that is um, even that the issue of having a significant cognizable harm is uh, sufficient we met here. So the Supreme Court's taken the case um, and the initial briefs are being filed, um, amicus briefs are being filed. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. The, the ultimate result of this case will either be that there will be, it'll be even easier for plaintiffs to litigate, uh, bring litigations, or it's gonna be somewhat harder. Um, and that you're going to have to demonstrate more of a real and good faith need to, uh, you know, to, comp to uh, patronize the, the, inst the establishment. So it'll be very interesting to see. And though, even though this case only involves the reservation rule, it will really redefine the whole landscape for you know, regular web accessibility cases about whether the website itself you know, has the features that we've been discussing here and meets the WCAG guidelines. Now, one of the interesting facts here is that the WCAG guidelines are not regulations, of course. They're issued by the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, and 
they are really uh, kind of technical standards. They're not real, they're not actionable developers toolkits either. So they're not great for developers, they're not great for lawyers, but <laughs> they're the only thing we really have. Um, now there are obviously, you know, a lot, a, there's a lot of guidance um, for, for developers, not as much as there should be, but, but there's really nothing else that substitutes for this in uh, litigation involving private parties. Um, under the Rehabilitation Act, um, the WCAG guidelines have essentially been adopted, which, and then that covers federal uh, websites. Um, but again, it's not perfect, it's not really regulatory language, but you know, it'll have to do. Um, and there's a reason why the WCAG, why there is no regulation. The, web, the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act was, came into being just before the World Wide Web really caught on. Um, some of you may remember a time before the World Wide Web really caught on, and others of you may not. But in any case, um, the, there was the regulations only really speak about you know, brick and mortar establishments. And at, there have been, f there was about 15 years of attempts to get a regulation set in place for the web, and thousands, tens of thousands of hours of work were expended. But the problem is that technology moves much faster than the regulatory process, and they kept having to pull the regulation back and rewrite them. And then the very last thing that happened under the end of the Obama administration, they pulled back a notice of proposed rulemaking and instead threw out 100 questions for everyone to answer about what we really should be doing. Then Trump came in and Trump said, I don't like regulations at all, and killed the entire regulatory framework. Um, put it on his list. He had, loved creating this dead regulations list, and he put uh, dis uh, you know, web accessibility right on it. Uh, so that's where it so stood for four years. The only thing that the uh, Trump administration did was say, WCAG guidelines are not the law, and what matters is functional accessibility. Uh, and, that's, you know, and you can be flexible in how that's interpreted. So that left people with even less guidance. Um, and meanwhile, the uh, Trump Department of Justice did absolutely nothing in terms of web, web accessibility. Uh, any type of enforcement um, you know, it was just essentially shut down. Uh, under the current administration, Department of Justice has woken up again. They are uh, enforcing the, uh, the ADA with regard to websites. Um, the uh, Department of Education has issued what's called a Dear Colleague letter uh, telling uh, higher education institutions they need to get their act together. Um, of course, they've been told that in one way or another for the last 20 years, but uh, we, we live in hope uh, and, you know, Institutions do continue to improve, but it's a, uh, it's a, it's a battle. It's always a battle. Uh, and then they've even started a new regulatory uh, process, but this time they've started with the part of the ADA that deals with state and local governments, which is called Title II. Uh, what we've really all been discussing here without saying it is Title III, which is, relates to public accommodations, which means places where the public is welcome. Uh, title II deals with um, state and local governments, and Title I deals with places of employment, and that's actually dealt with by the EEOC. So if you wonder why your intranet is not covered by Title III, it's actually covered by Title I. And what does the EEOC do about um, ADA uh, compliance and enforcement? As far as I know, absolutely nothing. Um, maybe that'll change, too. but. Um, as we've discussed and as you've heard repeatedly, there's a lot of good reasons. There's moral and capitalistic and uh, legal reasons. I think Professor Cogburn um, gave the, the list of the troika of reasons. Uh, and yet, why are we falling down? Is, are we all morally bankrupt and um, legally uh, atavistic and capitalistically uninterested? No, none of the above. Uh, maybe the moral bankruptcy. Uh, but in any case, a lot of the reason is that nobody knows who is supposed to care. Um, let's look at how a website is developed. Who gets involved? The marketing department, the, an outside developer usually, um, legal might get involved, obviously the business owners, the in-house IT staff. None of them are tasked with accessibility as a um, as a role. What you need to cut to the chase, and since you don't want to listen to me for three hours, um, you need an accessibility czar. You need somebody in 
inside for whom accessibility is their job that if accessibility fails, they are a failure and they get fired. So they're j they, they need to have skin in the game and they need to have the executive suite have their back and they need to have access to the executive suite. So what you really need our, uh, I call it czars and champions and, and C-suite um, representatives all involved. Some, somebody has to get that started within a business um, in order for them to be inspired. Uh, and you know, a litigation that can be settled for ten or fifteen thousand dollars might not do that. Now, of course, the other part of the litigation is that you have to get your website compliant within a reasonable period of time. Um, but there's a problem there too, unfortunately, that has arisen, which are um, accessibility uh, widgets and overlays. Uh, now, if you're a business and you have a website and you've been told that it needs to be remediated, you could probably figure that the cost to re to remediate it rather than replace it, to, but to make it fully compliant, could be somewhere between 30 to 50% of what you spent on the website or even more. Um, and you probably don't have any budget for that. Your, your, your maintenance budget, probably 10% of that at best. Um, now, what if somebody says that for $49 a month, you can get an easy widget that you can just place on there, a little button that looks like a little uh, Leonardo da Vinci man accessibility symbol, and you press it, and voila, magic, your website is, is compliant. Well, oh, and, and you don't have to talk to your lawyer about it, or your developer, your in-house IT guy can probably put it on, um, or even we'll come in and do it for you, just like a vacuum cleaner salesman, we'll make it happen for you. And so a lot of businesses turn to that, and then they get sued anyway. In last year's suits, at least 200 said they were directly because of accessibility widgets. but even with the number 3,200 website lawsuits, that's still only a fraction of a fraction of the number of websites out there just in the US. And imagine the rest of the world doesn't have a litigation crazy culture like we do. So solutions are, are gonna come from different areas. So it's a bit of a mess. Um, the disability community, as I read it, is generally very opposed to the widgets and because they don't work. They actually can interfere, particularly with screen readers can um, actually conflict with, with these, these widgets and overlays. And they still, they, and you may not know that the button is there. Um, it may not be in a place that's navig easily navigable and findable. So it's created basically a distraction almost. And I have to tell you know, clients in a nice way, you know, this is maybe better than nothing or maybe not, but what we really need to do is get you a website that is accessible by design really should create a new website that is accessible from the ground up. Let's you know, work on that. And also let's, at a code level, solve what I call the low hanging fruit on the website. And you need to get a team together, all those people I mentioned, and now they all have to care about this. And part of that is that they need to understand, again, really the, the diversity, equity, inclusion, the need accessibility is, 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 is integral to that. And you know what? Even if you're opposed to DEI, which seems to be fashionable in certain political circles these days, accessibility is it's good business, and it's, it can still, you're including people who really need to be included and who aren't, who don't, they're not different from you. And if, if, what, if your problem is that you don't want Democrats to be involved, well, that's not your, that's not the problem here. So, don't, don't make this about DEI. If you don't like DEI, just think about it as accessibility. If you do like DEI, think about accessibility as a, as a leg of DEI. But whatever it may be, it really is you know, an imperative. What? Thank you. Uh, yes, anyway, um, technology, friend or enemy. Uh, so, frenemy, in, indeed. Well, and that's really a problem in this whole area. You know, the, the web is, you know, one of the great inventions of the last, you know, few decades, and yet it's created all of these issues. We're here talking about issues which are, you know, opportunities, but they're mostly challenges. So, I'll wrap up here and say that, you know, what is really, you know, the concern is to get a beyond litigation uh, and to 
convince corporations, um, businesses that operate websites, and developers, particularly, frankly, developers, and I'll just say for a minute, from the developers that I've talked to, there are some that are really have bought into accessibility as a very important aspect, but a lot of developers traditionally have not wanted to design accessible websites. They've avoided it on purpose because it limits their, it cramps their style. If you like green and gold as a combination, there is no good combination of green and gold that will um, pass a co contrast checker that will have the proper ratio. I've tried it. It looked awful. You end up with very pale wan yellow and a green that's almost black. So if you like green and gold, or if your, your, your school colors are green and gold, you know, you're going to have to do something different with the green and gold. Make it some stripes. Make it some decorative elements. Um, similarly, a lot of what Manolo is referring to when he's saying image, 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 it, well, two things. One thing, that could be an image. Of a, it could be a photograph, a picture, or a drawing. But it could also be an image of text. That's a huge problem. If you like fancy looking fonts and stuff like that, a lot of times it's basically a picture of text. It's not ASCII, it's not any key, it's, it's unreadable by a screen reader because it's just a picture of text. It could be a flower pot, you know, as far as, as, as the screen reader is concerned. And yet you have this, you know, cool heading and all your cool headings that say all these cool things in these wonderful fonts with, you know, gremlins coming out of the middle of the O and whatever it might be. That's just image, image, image. So, and the same thing with navigation. So that's why web designers, the aesthetic ones particularly, don't like it. But you know what? They got to grow up. And they need to become, they need to be told, they need to be brought on board. They should be advocating for this. But they also should feel that they will lose their job if they don't advocate for it. So we need to create a greater culture of accessibility as a sine qua non, as a given. Um, and part of that is just acknowledging, first off, that some of us are becoming, you know, to an extent disabled as we age. I've now got two different sets of glasses in my bag. You know, I didn't even wear glasses, or I didn't admit that I wore glasses until a few years ago. So um, that's not going to get any better. Um, so, but at the same time, too, it's just, if this is a world that we want to go in one direction or another, I think we want to go in the direction of being a better world. And if we don't, this is so essential. And part of this, too, is that, to use a word uh, more figuratively than literally, um, you need to see, access, uh, see people with disabilities as visible and not ignore them, not look at them as a speed bump. You know, they are, they are us. They're, they are my brother-in-law. They're the guy sitting to my, to my left. They're... Um, you know, the husband, the, you know, the, the mother of a friend, whatever it is. You know, it's just a concern that needs to, at a, at a kind of base human level, about, you know, who are we anyway? It really needs to, and I'm a little worried from the current climate in the U.S. that we don't, that the culture of cruelty um, might, you know, interfere with this too. But in the end, you know, I think that because there are good reasons even for cruel people to be kind in this case, you know, in the right measure, that... We, we know we need to move forward and you know find whatever reason works for people but the end result really needs to be to get to the point where accessibility is taken for granted and i'll be back in 50 years to discuss that thank you um just some very fascinating you know um points of overlap and I think again this idea of understanding the experience of other and appreciating that and uh, you know particularly what you've said about um, widgets and overlays and in my experience as well working with political parties and uh, political campaigns it's easier sometimes to have that entry point in terms of culture when it's a new organization and a new website and it's very very interesting to see how that develops so that can become then an opportunity as an example for others who you know otherwise might be tempted to use the widget which to me also brings up this false sense of security from the point of view of the organization of thinking oh we've done what we needed to do we are you know accessible between quotation marks so to speak so um, 
I, you know, I'd like to uh, welcome any questions you may have. I certainly have some, but I want to give uh, those in the audience an opportunity first. Please. Do we have microphones going around? And can you put your hands up again so I can see them? Yeah, okay. All right. We'll start from wherever you want. Well, let's start from over there. And then we'll calm down here. Thank you both, or all three of you. This is really interesting to me since I've been on. It's on, it's on. Hello, is that better? Okay, I said this is really, first I said thank you, and I mean that. And this is interesting to me since I've been around since long before the web. Um, but I was wondering from a developer's perspective, are there any classes or certifications because in high tech certifications are you know the big thing hey, so i have this certification that supposedly proves i can do something but are there any certifications that say okay yes joe has shown that he can develop websites that are accessible so i could take a developer and say okay joe developer i want you to go to this class i want you to pass this test and you are going to be used I'll try to answer first. Um, the answer is yes and no. Uh, there are some organizations um, that have put forward um, training programs. Um, there are you know, a number of resources out there, but there's no accepted standard. There's not like in the, in the privacy area, there's one you know, accepted standard, at least in the US, that you know, if you're a CIPP, C -I -P -P, you know, uh, that's the only that's the only standard you really need, CIP US, CIP EU, whichever one it is, and that's kind of understood. It's, but there isn't, there's no winner yet, and I don't know that anybody's put forth something that's intending to be the winner. There's no kind of, you know, Microsoft certified um, version of a, of a certification, as far as I know, that, you know, and I'm not a developer, I don't even pretend to be, a, to be one, but my understanding is that it's still an, un, an underdeveloped, so to speak, field. Yeah, I, I would like to add uh, something I agree with you. Uh, we have a challenge that uh, most, a, a lot of the web page that are now created are created using CMA, uh, CMS, uh, like WordPress. As a matter of fact, uh, last time I revised almost 38% uh, of web page of from around the world, I created what by, web, by WordPress. That means that there's a lot of persons that are creating web page that are not developers, mm -hmm. that does not have technical knowledge. And when you're creating with WordPress, you cannot even have access to the code if I tell you, Ah oh, well, you, you can do that and you can do this HTML code or CSRs. So that's a challenge that, that we have also. And that's uh, something important to, to take uh, in, in mind that a lot of persons create web pages right now and uh, does not have that technical skills. I'll also mention that WordPress um, has some accessible templates, but not all of their templates are accessible. So you have a choice to go on there and pick a template that's accessible or not, and you, the, you, you may not even know that that's something you should be looking at, is whether or not it's accessible. And there's also other companies like that. I see Professor Cogburn in the back, who I think you know, I'd like to maybe you know, let him cut the line and, 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 and add, add a view here, but I'll say there are other in addition to WordPress, there's um, e-commerce engines like Shopify that they'll provide some advice uh, on it and they'll provide some tools, but Shopify's view is that if you want to get anything more than basic Shopify, you have to go to a Shopify partner, which is a developer, and some of the developers are um, you know, friendly to, um, to accessibility and others aren't, so it's still a crapshoot out there with, with that. Do you want to add something? Sure, just to, just to one? add, I think, yeah. thank you very much and great question. And uh, I think you're, you're absolutely right in terms of a, a standard that everybody has agreed to. But what I think within the industry, 
Uh, I mentioned earlier the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, IAAP, and that came out of the disability community, the CSUN conference, the annual technology and disability conference, and it has become a very strong uh, certification uh, with about four or five different paths to go through from web accessibility to document accessibility, uh, the built environment, and a couple of others. So if, if there's one place that I would recommend if you were thinking about where do you send this particular developer uh, to prepare for and take a certification, that would be one potential uh, path that's very well accepted now nationally and around the world. Thank you. Um, let's come here to the front. And that goes back to the point you were making, Greg, about having a, an accessibility czar and somebody who may be responsible. And, well. Hi, first of all, uh, um, my name is Juliana. First of all, I would to compliment for the panel. It is super Im important to have this kind of discussion. Uh, I just want to add a comment about uh, the things that I believe. Um, I guess public sector and private sector and the civil society as well, like the um, civil sector, need to build capability of developer in some points of view. For example, um, disability people need to have the right of uh, freedom of speech, for example, and the, f the right to have access of information and to be a citizen and a real citizen, you need to have like a politician's uh, information and this kind of things that you can have a knowledge about the democracy and about your role as a person. So when you build a software or when you are like building a service or product, you need to have like the total user experience and have all kinds of people in in your point of view. So I work with public policies in Brazil and I strongly believe if we have like kind of standards or frameworks um, putting some of the responsibility of having some uh, fundings of building cap capacity of the software developers, this kind of stuff would be important. And yes, this is my point. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have any reactions to that or... Um, I agree. Yeah. And certainly, you know, I've seen it again, you know, working with certain organizations, particularly in the political space. Leadership buy-in is really fundamental, as you were saying earlier on, Greg, right? And that's really the way to make change happen. There is another so recommendation I'm going to make, but I want to keep that for the end. Any other questions? I saw more hands up. Okay, up there. My name is Samik Karel. I'm from Nepal. Um, uh, you, you talked about um, uh, going beyond the litigation and convincing corporations, businesses uh, to design accessible websites. And um, who will do that convincing? Um, what does it take? Has it started? That is my first question. And, and about creating accessible websites, you know, like what's stopping these designers? Is it the cost factor? Um, are, aren't there expert designers to do it? Or don't they have the acumen to do it? And how do you balance aesthetics and accessibility? I think both are very important. So, yeah. Well, uh, first, I think you can achieve both aesthetics and accessibility. You just need to be a little more thoughtful about it. Cost factor is part of it. You know, these are usually very tightly budgeted projects. And even the, say, 10% that it might cost to make a site accessible versus not, you know, can appear to weigh on um, a, uh, a, a company. Um, at the same time, I'm looking forward to the day when that trade-off would, it, it sounds unthinkable. You know, that it would be as unthinkable as, you know, excluding women from the vote in the, in the United States. Um, so it really, you know, shouldn't be, be a trade-off, but it often is. And I think, you know, the develop I went into earlier the reasons why I think developers don't want to do it. Uh, I think there needs to be more organizations that are looking to work into corporations um, and, you know, find... Um, 
the right people, whether it's a DEI person or it's a tech person or whoever it might be, to try to bring them into the accessibility world. I'm not sure. I mean, there probably are. I'm sure there are other organizations that do it. I just don't see them having necessarily a lot of budget or profile uh, to do it. Um, but I think that you know, as long as we bring it together, um, you know, hopefully there'll be something in, in the future that will will do that. Thank you. Um, question here in the front. We have many questions. Hands up there. Hands up over there. Hello, um, this is Bibik Silwal from Nepal. So uh, thank you to Jose, Greg, and the moderator for an amazing session. So my question is related to the accessible devices. So that wasn't really amazing display. But is the devices really accessible in terms of cost to all the corners around the globe? And since the technology is not very abundant, is it open source uh, software or devices or has any attempt to be made? because? You know, this is not a device that being marketed in a large scale. So can a startup in Nepal actually build from open source that's provided? Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Manolo. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask that question. And that's, uh, that's a challenge. Uh, and my question can be, uh, uh, let's see, um, have uh, co some co controversy. So first, um, the cost of creating this technology is high. So without any doubt, the cost of the technology is a barrier. Here in the United States, there are some agencies, Department of Education, Rehabilitation Vocational, um, accommodation in the world that more has uh, assigned some money to, to buy that, that technology that is really expensive. But on the other hand, uh, as a uh, developer, I can tell you that creating this technology is cost. And when you sometimes I have participated in a lot of projects in Latin America that we want to create um, technology that is low cost, but uh, that uh, open source, that then you need that the person, the compromise. And when open source, a lot of people do it voluntary and they, they gave off after a, a certain of time. And if there's no way that you can have uh, free technology with the latest integrated and uh, do it in a voluntary way, because that's not fair either for the user that maybe need an update, but that since the person that created only have uh, good intentions, open source, if there's a community, a strong community that uh, it is, uh, then can do it. Uh, I will tell you an example, NBDA is a free screen reader but free, you have to put in quotation marks. It is not that that story that two blind programmers do it voluntary. They receive a lot of money for uh, Adobe, gave money, Microsoft gave money annually, Amazon gave money annually. So they have, uh, that can receive money to uh, make this just great technology that, uh, as I tell you, technology, and be able to create this technology, you need uh, a knowledge to have to, to implement it. I think also say that Apple has actually been adding more accessibility features as, as they move on through um, the iterations. And I just read about iOS 17, which is coming later this year, which I think is going to have some significant accessibility advances in it. Okay. Anyway, uh, Apple Apple's adding stuff, especially iOS 17. Looks like it'll be a real uh, advance for accessibility. I think that's a great comment in terms of you know clearly affordability it's key, but also keeping pace with technology and technological advances. And if you look at the early days, particularly of social media, for example, a lot of accessibility around those came through. APIs and third-party applications that were developed by some in the disability community themselves. And then, you know, technology companies start to be more responsive to their needs and so on. And the need to have that embedded within technology development really is important because there might be all sorts of get-arounds and, you know, different solutions, but they are always going to be catching up, first of all. 
And then the trend that we're seeing with platforms in particular, the likes of um, Twitter, but we could name others as well, closing off their environments to APIs from third party, um, third party applications really is going to be a problem for certain parts, in, in particularly of the disability community, not knowing what the development of that technology going forward is going to be. And so it really, you know, it's, it's really a cultural and business issue that needs to be addressed within uh, the business sector first and foremost. Twitter also fired their entire accessibility team, but that's a different story. Uh, we have a question over there, uh, and then uh, we'll go to the back. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It's really woken me up to quite a lot of factors that I don't always pay a lot of attention to, and I, I'm really grateful for this. Um, and I think that many uh, like website developers or folks often focus really quickly on minimum viable products to get very quickly out the door. And I don't know that this is something that there's a great prioritization given to. I heard some wisdom from the other side of the room earlier about the commercial benefits, maybe as the attractors that might be helpful to you know jingle some jewelry in front of uh, the people who prioritize projects that might help this. Um, uh, but my question was, uh, Professor Cogburn had identified that we might be intimidated by the speed at which those who are visually impaired listen to audio. And I have a question for you, Manolo, is you slowed it down to about 45% for the benefit of us in the audience, but what is the typical speed at which you're listening to the, the vocals? Well, the speed, uh, the speed of a, a speech synthesizer, um, it is the, the words per minute that the synthesizer can... Uh, Say, and right now, uh, one uh, forty-five percent. It it could be about about one hundred uh, uh, words per minute. I use it typically uh, three hundred and fifty uh, words per minute. And th the important is is not that is uh, the important is that you can understand it. That's the important thing. It is not that it's more fast or more. For example, I understand it, and if somebody sends me an email, I can read it in 40 seconds. But if I put it more slow, I will have two or three minutes to read it, and that affect my productivity. For me, that, that, that's something that is flexible and, and is, some, uh, is individual, and uh, that's assistive technology. Assistive technology must be individualized to fill the needs of each person. Uh, anyway, New, York, New Yorkers speak 350 words a minute, so I don't see why it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we need one of those customized dials, you know. The, the question there in the back for New Yorkers too. So uh, some of you know me, my name is David, David Mackey. Um, not sure everyone knows my background. My background is I'm a developer. I've been, a, uh, so I, I wanted to possibly bring a perspective which is, uh, which can be hard to, to, to describe if you're not a developer. Um, and I don't want to sp be speaking on behalf of all developers, but I am a developer with a person in the past who has not had disabilities. Um, and I, if I can bring that voice to this conversation, I, I hope I add something to the conversation. Um, we've touched on a, a, a number of things, both with this conversation and the previous conversation and the conversations from this morning, which are relevant from my perspective as a developer over many decades. It's not, e there's, if you don't have an, um, access to that, discipline, it's possible that you may not appreciate the difficulties required to maintain knowledge in that space, keep up to date with what's going on, and continue to develop what I would consider uh, new learning new languages within the development space itself. So it does uh, present a challenge as a, as a well, quote unquote developer to, to um, uh, produce software that's valuable to a wide range of people. And uh, I wanted to highlight what was said um, uh, sort of tacitly or, or sort of uh, indirectly 
which really does boil down to the costs associated to maintain the knowledge required to create tools that uh, uh, reach a broad range of people. So um, I, I do believe the development community, and again, this is, I'm re-emphasizing what was said with this panel. Um, I do think the development community benefits with conversations like this where you can, um, when you're outside the development community, if you can highlight what are the guidelines and focus our attention on what are the things that we need to do for you as an end user and p which particular end user community. So I, I, I don't have a question, but I, I did want to be speaking from that perspective. Hopefully that adds value to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I know we are at time and I'm, uh, you know, I appreciate all the questions and, and contributions, but I'll just say to that point, yes, again, in the political space in particular where I work, what I've seen is it's been collaboration between developer and in particular blind owned and operated user testing organizations. But there needs to be the willingness from the client to make all of that work, right? And so I'll just close by saying one thing, because we've talked a lot about changing culture, and I think there is a big, you know, role for that to um, to play at a small level, at an everyday level. So I'll just give you an example. Every week I, I put together and send out a newsletter about what my wonderful colleagues in the School of Communication here do. And it's, you know, great to get pictures with that sometime. But six months ago, I said, we need to start doing this different because people were just sending me pictures. And we were plugging them in. We changed the platform we used. Now we have more functionalities to make it more accessible. We're not just sending an email anymore. I said, if you want a picture to go together with this, here are some resources to write an old text um, description for it. And everybody was a little bit freaked out by it. And it's like, what is this? How does it work? How is it different than a caption? Um, and I said, I'll help you, don't worry. But, and so I started getting requests like, oh, can you just write it for me? I'm really busy, I don't know how to do it. You're clearly better than me. I said, no, 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 we're not gonna learn anything here. You take a first go at it, then I'll help you. It's fine, I don't mind you know, correcting it, giving you tips or whatever. And that's what we're doing now. And very quickly, people just became better at it and they started doing it and now, whatever other organization they might be involved in, suddenly they have this experience and they can bring that up if they're doing things different on their website, on their communications and so on. So sometimes these little small changes, that's really where it all needs to start. I'm not gonna say it's gonna be solving all problems, but certainly it's gonna bring this point to the table and maybe it wasn't there before. Greg and Manolo, I don't but know if you have any final. I'll just say that I think that's a perfect lesson that the culture is you and the change is you. Each and every one of you can do what Filippo did and take a little step with what they do to make a change uh, to promote you know, awareness and accessibility. Uh, I just want to thank to all of you and you have a new friend. If you need that, uh, you need that, have to, I can check it out your webpage and uh, I will make recommendation. More <laughs> happy, I'll be very glad to do that. Thank you so much. Let's give them a final round of applause. All right, I believe there is a short break now for about 15 minutes. So try to come back at half past. Thank you.
Test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Hello. Test. 
Test. Test. Test, test, test. Ron. I'm gonna, I actually have the print out.
Test. Test. Oh, I haven't got it turned up. Okay, you'll turn it up. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes. Yes, yes. Excellent. And Jonathan, you're the you're the man that can help round them all up if they I try, they're getting more and more unruly. <laughs> As the day goes on. I know, you shouldn't have had two minutes as you did. Oh my god. This is the time of day when it's too long. Yeah, their attention spans. Oh, yeah. Okay, folks, let me get you to sit down. We'll take your seat. <laughs> you can wrap them up. We can. Hello, everyone. If you could take your seats, we would love to get started. You have a, a, a one minute warning. Grace is handing out some handouts. No, no, that's all good. <laughs> Donde esta? There she is, okay. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go! Woo! All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Jane Coffin. I'm the moderator for this fabulous panel of broadband strategies in the United States and Canada. Thank you to the organizers of the event for having us all here. Thank you to Jolly. We must acknowledge that because he's helping us live stream. Thank you, Jolly. Round of applause. I'm going to do two second uh, intros because we have the bios of these wonderful panelists on the website. Grace Abu Hamad is the chief of staff at NTIA. She has a long career at both NTIA and ICANN. Uh, Marita Mall is president of Telecommunities Canada. She's a member of the North American Regional at Large Organization, otherwise known as NARALO. And if you're going to ICANN next week, you're going to find out more about the Rallos. Uh, Ron Da Silva. Ron is an executive leader, international board member, advisor, and internet technology expert, 30 plus years of proven business, and also someone that's well known at the ICANN space. I'm not well known at the ICANN space, but I have been in the internet space for over 25 something years, was at the Internet Society for 10 years and work for a startup right now. So I'm going to try and speak slower for those of us who, who've come in from other places and points beyond. We're going to, here's how the panel's going to run. We have up until about 4.45, and we recognize there's a panel directly after this one. So we're going to give a little grace to the other panel, give ourselves probably around until 4.40. And 
Marita is going to speak first. She has some slides. Grace is second. Grace has handed out a doc to you, and it's going to be useful to her presentation. And Ron will speak after Marita. So Marita has some slides, and I trust that the slide master will help us get the slides up. Is that Eduardo? Are you doing the slides? Yeah, yeah, we and. The slide, the Okay. <laughs> All right, while we wait for the slide coordinator. Hi, everybody. Um, it's getting towards the end of the day. Maybe turn that mic yeah. on. Yeah. Okay, let's move it up. This one here. I'll just do this. It's getting towards the end of the day, and everybody, everybody is probably suffering from a bit of information overload. I usually am by the time I've seen a few panels uh, all day long. So I hope that you can stick with us. Um, I've, this is a panel about Canadian broadband and America and U.S. broadband strategy, but I'm very conscious of the fact that this is not going to relate that well to many of you who are here. Um, you have your own broadband issues at home and strategies that you're trying to build or have been built. Um, so what I've tried to do in uh, in my presentation here is to put it in a much larger framework. Uh, I was involved in back in the 90s uh, in Canada when we were talking about broadband strategies and those things uh, and everybody was really excited. Uh, we, we had research groups running research, you know, studies and workshops talking about, sorry? Someone needs to share the screen to Zoom. Okay, gracias. Okay, we haven't started that yet anyways. <laughs> um, so we were developing um, various ways of rolling out internet um, access at a time, at that time, when government was just as confused and befuddled by what was going on as the rest of us. How were we going to deliver this stuff to people? So they were, we were actually getting some airtime. People were listening to us at that time, uh, researchers and public policy advocates were really playing a role in how, um, in how people thought about these things. Didn't actually work out that things were rolled out that way, but, uh, at that time, it was pretty exciting. So I'm, what I want to do here is, is, is show you this particular slide. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Anyway, this one is not indicative of the weather outside. No. Next slide. Yeah, it's a rainbow. <laughs> well, it is it's sunny. It is that sunny. It hasn't been raining. Uh, we developed this in um, some of us in the research uh, space uh, to describe what needs to happen if you're going to have an internet access strategy in a country. Uh, and we put it together as seven different layers of things that need to be developed, many of them at much, very much the same time, or all of them, or quickly after another. You'll see that the very first one is carriage facilities, and that's all about, you know, getting the broadband uh, to where you are. Uh, and, and that's a biggie, it's a huge one, and that's the one we're still mostly talking about uh, 20 years later. Uh, but the second one then is, you know, you, the fact that you actually have to have the devices, you have to have the laptop computers, you have to have the mobiles, you have to have all those things to use what you're going to get in the number one carriage facilities. The software tools, the web, the, you know, the, the browsers and all that, that didn't even exist when we started this. Um, and you need to have that, that's the next layer that comes up on top of it. You need the ISPs, the people who are going to come to the market and, and, and make it possible for you to have these, th these services. You need the content. Why would you have it? It's got to be some content. There's a bit of a chicken and egg thing here. What comes first, the access or the content? Um, everything pretty much comes at the same time. Um, you've got 
Then you've got something called literacy and social facilitation. People were talking about that in a previous panel and how important that was, that you couldn't just put it in there and walk away, that you had to have a strategy for really delivering this and sustainable strategy because these things change and people need to be, continue to be, to learn their way through this kind of a change. And over the whole thing, you have the big one, the big red, ooh, all right, we lost our rainbow, but it's okay. It's the same thing. You have the big red governance. Do you want to go back one? <laughs> okay. We're just practicing here. Oh, it's okay. Oh, okay. Anyways, over the um, over top of all those other six layers, you have the governance layer. You had to have the government role in helping to make sure that all of these things get delivered to the people who need them. Uh, and so that's a whole lot of stuff that needs to be done in order to get universal access to everybody. Here's here it is. Now uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, where are we now? So the goal of all of this, anyways, is universal access. It's not just broadband <coughs> strategy. And I think we've fallen into the, you know, the loop of just talking about broadband strategy for a long time now and, and not talking about all of the other layers that need to come together, which means that often they're not totally funded or supported in ways that they need to be. It's not that people don't want to do it, you know, but it falls off the radar. Obviously, you know, the, the first band, those access facilities, it's got to happen. It's taking a long time to get up there for the people who are a little more remote, but we have to have the governance side of it and government up there making it an absolute priority. I love the, the public-private partnerships panel in that um, there were just so many really great uh, examples of how some of this is being delivered right there on the ground. It never occurred to me that there were some countries where you were actually able to buy one minute access, you know, like real pay-as-you-go, um, or, or a five minutes just to upload or download. There's all kinds of various models going on out there. Not that you know we necessarily want that, but it gives some people access who really couldn't get it at all otherwise. So that was great. Um, so there were lots of good models out there, but they all fit. All of this fits in somewhere in this access strategy, this seven layer strategy of universal access. So when I go through these different things, what I thought was I'm gonna give you the Canadian examples, but I hope that you can Look at wherever you are, wherever you're coming from, whatever context you're in, how does that look in your country, in your area? You know, if it's, um, if it's, if it's the governance session, what kind of groups are out there, you know, advocating for that in your country? I'll give you a list of ours, but, you know, that's, that was my intention here. So here, oops. <laughs> I think you have to carry on without the slides for a sec. Sorry, <laughs> right. I'm just, just going to keep on going here. The Canadian federal government broadband program, and whenever we get the slides up, you'll see each one of these. I've highlighted where on that seven-layer strategy this falls. The Canadian federal government program falls in the carriage facilities, the number one and shortest part of that rainbow. Um, yes, we have in Canada, uh, uh, um, and we, we say we have 98% of Canadians connected to high-speed internet by 2026. We think we now have about 90, 93 or 94%, and the plan is to have 100% connected by 2030. Um, what does that mean, connected? It's not fiber optic connection, obviously, but it does have a definition, at least 50 megabits per second download and 100 upload. So 5010, it's not fabulous, but if you're living 
way up in the in the in the woods in northern Ontario, you know, it's it's way better than what you've got. Um, and the other part of it was to have access along major road corridors, so people would be able to communicate um, when they were traveling, which is a big deal for us, big country. Okay, we're still not there. Sorry, it's, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. I think everybody's following me. They don't need to see the pictures. Um, there are some specific federal initiatives. Um, one of them is a $585 million initiative to deal with the last mile for 975 rural communities, including digital indigenous communities. One thing I wanted to say here is that um, I was going to bring this in in the, in the public-private partnerships uh, panel, but I, I decided to leave it for here. In Canada, anyways, um, the indigenous, some of the indigenous communities really took the ball at the very beginning and said, no, we're not going to do public-private partnerships. We want to own the, you know, we want to own what goes on here. We're the ones who are going to run the project. We don't want the money to come out, go out of our community. We want it to stay in. We will contract. We will contract the tel, you know, the telcos, and do the other work that needs to be done. We're going to organize it and manage it and control it. And some of them have done a really, really good job of that through hundreds of kilometers of of northern Ontario. You've got a major network called KNet that started way back in 1994 when they made that decision they were going to own it. We've tried to do a lot in Canada, talk about community-owned networks, but, you know, as was indicated in the panel before, it's a hard road. You know, you have to have everybody motivated and on the same page. So a lot of these things are being done by public-private partnerships. And um, it just, uh, that's just the way it either, in many times it happens or it doesn't. Uh, there's a big universal broadband fund, uh, 3.2 billion altogether for rural and, uni and underserved communities. And then there's a special fund for the First Nations, which I just described in, in, our, in our country anyways, is in many places operating quite differently. They're the ones who are owning their own infrastructure. Um, there are also some other communities who do, but they're, they're, it's hard and they're much fewer. Um, broadband timelines, um, as I said, by 2030, the government is hoping to have 100% of Canadians uh, up there uh, <coughs> accessed up what they call high, what they define as high-speed internet, and um, uh, everyone hopes they'll get there. But it, it's you know these are aspirations. Uh, we've come a long way in in, in the years in between the uh, mid-90s and now. So we're almost there, but there's still quite a bit to be done. Um, there are other little projects going on in Canada on the federal government side. You've got a Canadian satellite company uh, who's providing connectivity to the far north. You've got uh, the Canadian government giving software tools to small businesses. Um, to upgrade their digital technology. So that kind of falls into a different part of that seven layer structure. Uh, if you're talking about software tools, that's, you know, that's like number four or something. It's not just the carriage line, which is mostly what we're talking about. And then there's also the issue that the federal government really does carry the big load of the ball when it comes to governance, obviously, and they are uh, doing a lot of work around legislation, re content, um, and affordability issues. Oh, look at that. That's the wrong one. But anyways, <laughs> let's go with it. Just run. Run with it. Keep going. Let's go down to about, push it down. Push it down. It's the same slides. It doesn't matter if that one's crooked. OK. Um, so we have got now, yes, we talked about that. We also have in Canada a regulator, um, which is called the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission. Um, uh, certainly in the U.S., there's a heavy-duty regulator. I'm not and in Europe; they have them. Don't know if they happen in all the other countries that are represented here. Um, 
the regulators also heavily involved in that governance stream that overarches uh, all the other parts of the universal access rainbow. Um, in Canada, one little interesting quirk is that the, um, the regulator actually has a $750 million fund which they're devoting to access carriage issues. But that money is actually coming from the telecommunications companies uh, and it's part of their public interest commitment uh, to providing access. It's, it's, not, it's not as much as that federal government is providing in their plan, but it's kind of an interesting little tweak that the regulators doing this uh, speaks to what we used to do in Canada many years ago around the telephone uh, in that we subsidized uh, access in rural areas with some of the, you know, the, 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 the funds that were coming into the, the telephone companies from the urban areas. And this is, this is sort of a vestige from that. And people were talking about that at the time in the 90s. Why are we not subsidizing um, with the government, through the government, uh, some of the rural and remote access issues? We're finally doing it, but it's taken a long time. No, we're still not there. And we Am have I about a minute left. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm almost there. So we had an Auditor General's report uh, recently in uh, March, uh, which uh, told the federal government that um, really they had to hurry up and do this, that the numbers weren't as high as they said they were. But the other thing that was really interesting about it was at the level of families, the Auditor General in Canada said the government needs to assess affordability in the context of household incomes when rolling out the access programs. So it doesn't matter if they all have this when they can't afford to do it, when they can't afford to buy it, they can't pay for it. That was, that was an important addition to the, to the, um, to the uh, program that we got from that report. Um, the next layer, digital illiteracy accessibility. Um, we, have, we have a number of organizations in Canada that do digital, digital literacy work, but as we heard in the privacy, uh, the, the public partnerships group, much more work like that has to be done all over the place and it needs to be sustainable. It can't be one-shot deals and then the, you know people don't have anywhere to turn when they actually have a problem. Um, yeah, no, not there and there. Uh, we have a lot of provincial programs. P provincial government also gets involved, and um, <laughs> I'm almost at the end. I'm at other sources of funding. Um, so, other sources of funding come from the community, from the actual provinces who put money in, and then they share uh, some of the load. The municipal, local, and community initiatives are also important. We're going to be having a panel um, at um, uh, ICANN, which is in, going to include some community members to talk about what they're going to be doing. But we heard some really great stuff at the uh, public-private partnerships one. People are doing work at the community level, which is, uh, which is things that uh, are really touching people on the ground. Oh uh, yes, there, there, that one. We, we, we've already been there. <laughs> and then we, the one thing I wanted to say is that at that time, we had a lot of advocacy networks and research networks who were looking into this and speaking to policymakers about what needs to be done. We have another list here on, on you know, the slides that I did. It's a shorter list. These people are still working. Maybe in your countries. Think about it. How many people are out there holding the government to account for what's actually happening? Because that's what needs to happen. People need to get out there and make sure their voices are heard. The telcos are out there with their big lobbyists and their voices are heard. So if there's nothing coming from the general public and the research network showing how and why this stuff needs to happen and get to the people on the ground and be sustainable and accessible, then we haven't got a national access strategy. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That was 15 minutes. <laughs> Excellent. Grace, you're up. 10 to 15, you pick. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Grace Abu Hamid. I'm at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is the, the big um, 
gov federal entity in the United States that is in sort of uh, administering the broadband, the internet access uh, work in this administration. I don't have any slides for you, but I did uh, pass around, or with the help of Jothan, passed around a set of um, one-pagers. I won't be going through all of them in detail, but I thought they would be helpful for you because there are a lot of different programs that we're administering. They have different purposes, uh, different amounts of money associated to them, et cetera. So sometimes having a leave behind, it's also online on the resources page, but it just helps, it helps me on a daily basis keep track of all the programs. Most of you know, uh, we've been talking about the digital divide for over 20 years now. And in fact, the term itself was coined by a former administrator of the, the agency that I work for. This is um, a historic moment for the US government. We have been given this ambitious, uh, simple but ambitious mission, which is to connect everyone in the United States. And that is a huge project because it has been attempted a few times before, but this time the difference is there is a very, very big, uh, very, very big investment being associated to it. So I'll walk through this for you, but this administration um, and Congress passed the, what we call the bipartisan infrastructure law in November of 2021. And that included roughly $65 billion for infrastructure investment in different connectivity uh, funds in the United States. And that includes uh, the 50 states and territories of the United States. So it is a big program when you think of where Guam is located and other, other territories of the United States, right? There are some key pieces of this. You know, I'll walk you through each one of the programs, but the, the sort of the, the simple mission here is also, so, so connect everyone in the United States and connect them with reliable and affordable internet service. So there's no point, I think Marita said this earlier, there's no point really in connecting people if they can't use the service, if they can't afford the service, and if the service in some way is unreliable, then they, they're not really using the service, right? So we've defined, I challenge you a little bit, as part of preparing for this panel, I did a lot of comparing of Canada and the US. I challenge you a little bit to think about that and your respective countries when we're, as we're discussing the topic. We define what reliable service is differently than the way Canada has defined it. We've put a different set of um, restrictions or, or even sort of, not restrictions, but sort of requirements on the program and different than what Canada has provided. We have different sources of funding, different programs. So we can compare and contrast all of those shortly in the discussion, but as we're going through the presentations, I, I challenge you to think about that a little bit. Um, the theme for this uh, school, the Internet Governance School, is access and inclusion, right? And if you think about the Internet today, it's not, you, you understand why this mission was key um, for this administration. The internet is an essential tool now. It's not, it's not a, a luxury. It's not something that's fun, uh, a hobby for people. It might have started off that way for some, but today it's an essential tool to provide access to work, uh, health care, justice. Uh, we've talked a little bit about different examples of that throughout the day, but you know, this is a, a very big initiative. And in part, in some ways, despite how difficult the COVID-19 pandemic was, I think it, it demonstrated to people the need for this essential service and essential tool. So you'll, you can look at the, the handout I gave, but basically there are five key programs that we're administering. Not all of them were funded purely out of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Some of them had funding that existed before and were either re-upped or, um, yes, sort of re-upped or coordinated in, with by my agency as part of this effort. So we call this, for sh as the shorthand, we call it the Internet for All program, and there are five different pieces of it. So the first one and the largest one is the Broadband Equity Access and Development Program. We call that the BEAD program. And that is a big state grant program. That, again, this is a, for a comparison point for you, Canada has a number of provinces, we have a number of states and territories. The way that the BEAD program uh, is designed is that it is a 42, 
roughly $42 billion program with money going directly to the states and to the territories. So we, if, you know, would we as the federal agencies uh, grant them the, the funds and from there they develop programs that are best suited to their specific state. You can imagine, just like in Canada and other parts of the world, each state has a different geography, a different um, local community, et cetera. And so we want to give the states some flexibility in how they design those programs. There are, however, requirements for how they design the programs, and that is part of the sort of the federal state interaction. One of the key pieces in a lot of these programs, but especially in BEAD, is that they're required to do local coordination. So when we're talking about multi-stakeholder engagement and internet governance and sort of the, the work that we're doing here, it's an interesting piece that the sort of the states are doing the same and they're required to do that and demonstrate that they've engaged with their communities as they're building out these programs. The second key program is the Digital Equity Act, the Digital Equity Program. So there's two pieces of them, but roughly they're three billion dollars there for either state level grants or uh, sort of a competitive grant program. This is to provide, again, Marita talked about this, the devices, the skills, um, the training that for people, once they come online, or even for people who are already online but need additional skills, these are programs designed for that capacity building exercise. The third program is another roughly $3 billion program for tribal or indigenous community grants um, to households or local anchor institutions. So again, focusing there in, on a particular community. The indigenous communities are covered in the other two programs, but this was a specific, we're going to give a specific pot of money dedicated to indigenous connectivity in the United States. We say tribal, but indigenous, First Nation, essentially the same thing. The Fourth program on your sheet is what we call the Middle Mile Grant Program. That's a billion dollars dedicated to middle mile infrastructure. So maybe not as, uh, you know, maybe not as cool and engaging as some of the other programs because the, it's, your, your end user is less engaged on a middle mile program, but very important in terms of keeping costs low. So when you think about and maybe Ron will talk a little bit about this in his presentation, but sort of when, you, when you're developing uh, infrastructure, you've got the big capacity that happens sort of at one level, then you've, you're, you've got um, you know, your middle mile connection, and then you've got your last mile connection where you want to make sure there's a, that's where the users are paying for service, engaging, and you want to make sure there's a, enough competition across the board, but especially at the last mile level. So the middle mile piece, really the goal of that program is to reduce the cost of the last mile connections for users. And then the, f the last program, which was not through the bipartisan infrastructure law, but we uh, have sort of grouped it together in our work, is a pilot program called the Connecting Minority Communities Program. And that is uh, the smallest uh, $260 million in for us to connect and do skill building with historically black communities and universities, uh, minority serving institutions, some uh, tribal institutions, um, and a variety of other sort of covered populations or minority populations in the United States that would benefit from sort of a, a con concrete effort on skill building. So that, that program is designed to go to institutions that would then uh, initiate or, or manage programs uh, for building skills across the, the United States. So we have a, those are the variety of programs. We can talk more about what each of them mean, how they're going, what we can learn from other countries as we develop them. Um, I think Canada's program for 2030 is ambitious. Ours is ambitious as well. Um, we look forward to sort of inspiring other countries to do the same or learning from their experiences. I'll hand it over to Ron. Excellent. And we have Ron. And Ron, um, you have a couple slides, yes? So. <laughs> we'll, um, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, why don't we just have you start? And you've got 10 to 15, and you're off and running. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to take the um, presentations you got from Rita and from Grace. We're talking about policies and um, funding and really the government's taking an initiative to uh, create incentives and um, really address 
accessibility issues in rural parts of North America. That's fundamentally what is motivating um, a lot of those programs. And I was going to take a different lens and look at it from a business and a technical perspective. How does that actually impact the marketplace and what is going on throughout Canada and throughout the U.S. based on those funds that are that are being pushed through in these variety of programs? I think there's a big one, just to add, Grace, because I, I had a question um, on, on the material you presented around um, the uh, Treasury Department. Yes. They have a separate component, which um, which is another what was on a twenty million twenty billion dollars or something like that, right? What That's was that right. number? I only presented on the programs that my agency runs, but there's a huge number of programs across the federal government, including the the Treasury programs. Um, I think twenty billion might be. Good. Yeah. So there's another very large uh, component in in the U.S. ecosystem that's impacting. Um, businesses and, and operators in their efforts to, to get the, the, the last mile completed in, in many rural and what I would call ultra rural parts of, uh, uh, of the country. And similarly, I think you're seeing that in Canada. So um, that said, I have four slides. Um, and the first two are really going to talk about uh, some of the technology. And then I want to talk about some, some uh, use cases, some examples. So first slide might advance. As we wait for that to show up, uh, it doesn't show there. It doesn't show here either. The, so I'm very high level. What are the technologies that uh, broadband addresses? If you look back into the um, legacy of telecommunications, a lot of it was all twisted pair. Small little pieces of copper stranded along telephone lines all over the place to create telephone services. And those same copper wires were used in the 90s to develop DSL. And DSL was a great bridge technology, enabled tel uh, telecom operators to leverage their, de their um, installed infrastructure to provide more uh, throughput than you could get with a dial-up service. That's really what DSL provided. Is that useful today? A lot of people would argue no. And a lot of these programs aren't really focused on helping create more DSL. It's sort of a, a long-term technology that's lingering. And a lot of communities are now frustrated trying to, I don't know, use Zoom to talk to their family members or to work from home. And that's not really a technology that's going to help. Another is mobile, right? Mobile is really convenient in urban areas where there are plenty of people to justify building towers and there are lots of towers then in place that provide a density and give you reasonable connectivity to make phone calls, maybe do Zoom while you're driving, um, you know, be able to order Amazon while you're supposed to be sitting in a meeting, right? These are the things that maybe your mobile phone will provide you, um, but when you move into urban uh, rural areas or really ultra rural areas, the cell tower density is not there. The, the radio coverage doesn't exist. You, you, the throughput, which is required from the towers to get back to the rest of the world where maybe the uh, data centers are located and where the content is that you're interested in, that doesn't exist either. So even if you might have a good strong carrier, how many of you, you know, looked at your phone and said, I've got five bars, why isn't my Zoom working? Well, you've got radio connectivity, but there's no backhaul. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, so, mobile is interesting, but is it broadband? Is it really impacting the, the rural markets? No, not really. And um, another here is uh, DOCSIS. Cable companies have uh, invested in years in, in cable TV infrastructure, all with coaxial cables, and, uh, and a mix of that and fiber kind of extend their infrastructure out to the uh, end users. But again, in most cases, that's in suburban and urban areas. It's not really that prevalent in, um, in, in rural markets, um, especially ultra rural markets. So even though there are capabilities on, uh, with the DOCSIS specifications to push higher uh, bit rates through on coaxial and, and fiber systems, um, it really is not that impactful for rural markets. So next slide. So those are things that aren't working. Uh, some other things that are being attempted, wireless, and what I mean by wireless is uh, licensed and unlicensed spectrum done in sort of a directional wireless transmission, and then when it's in a small cluster of homes, use um, unlicensed spectrum like you would a big Wi-Fi hotspot. Think of it that way. That provides some value. It provides some connectivity, but again, it's really hard to scale that when you have no density. If everybody lives miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers from each other, 
a simple radio to do you know public Wi-Fi is not going to help anybody other than the one barn on somebody's farm right so interesting has its place not really addressing the the rural market um, and then Leo right there's all this cool stuff that you're probably hearing about these new companies doing this low orbit uh, satellite infrastructure and uh, yes that might fill some of the gaps not only in rural markets but think of national parks think of floating around in the middle of the ocean. I mean, large chunks of this planet are nowhere near anything of interest from an infrastructure standpoint. Maybe that's gonna provide some, some coverage. Um, technologically, sure. Economically, there are a lot of questions about the cost to throw all those uh, satellites in the sky, the cost to aggregate all that traffic and do something with it, and um, will the economics really make sense? I mean, you see that in the funding that's going to some of these startups around uh, low, low orbit uh, uh, internet services. It's a question mark. I don't know the answer. Maybe it's going to be something useful. Maybe not. And then lastly, fiber. Fiber, OK, I'll share my bias. Yes, I like fiber. Um, it's a great technology. It's got um, a lot of uh, transmission capability across it, but it's very expensive. We talked about um, economics of getting to these, you know, long distance locations where fiber doesn't exist. So talking about that middle mile, it is not there, right? And if without a middle mile, you can't have a last mile. And um, that's one of the reasons why the NTIA is focused on that. Um, a lot of the, uh, I think some of the um, applicants for the funds in Canada are also including middle mile infrastructure to get out to rural parts of the, of the countryside. Think of a, a small hamlet, two, three, four hundred people that maybe live in, in, in a small area. And between them and the next hamlet, miles, miles, kilometers, kilometers. There's a lot of distance. If there's no extension cord, you're not putting anything there that's going to be useful. So that's really from a tech standpoint, fiber would be great if it were cheap. Fiber would be great if you can just magically make it happen, but you can't. And, uh, and that's really driving some of the incentives from the government to help um, coordinate with the states, coordinate with uh, uh, private money, um, coordinate with operators to find some way to really incentivize getting that last mile done for rural America, rural Canada, and the farthest remotest parts of uh, North America. Next slide. So that's the tech. I want to provide an example. So I sit, I live here. I'm in the DC suburbs. I live in uh, Loudoun County. That's pictured in the map here. Um, you can see DC is way over here where it says Washington and this big funny looking shape that's uh, got a red outline to the left. That's the county where I live. And if you uh, are from out of town and you flew into the Dulles Airport, that's in like the sort of the right edge of that big red county um, outline. Uh, so you just landed in uh, the edge of Loudoun County and then came into D.C. if you flew in um, to Dulles Airport. Well, I live right there. Um, I'm on the Communications Commission for Loudoun County. I've gotten visibility in that capacity, not only what's happening with the broadband operators in the county, but um, also what, how are these programs we're talking about impacting rural communities? Why? Well, if you divide Loudoun County in half, you can see a highway right in the middle called the yellow line from you know, Leesburg down called Route 15. Um, there are some 400 plus thousand people that live in the county. 80% of them live to the right of that yellow line. The other 20%, it's mostly a rural farm community. Uh, a lot of horse farms, a lot of um, uh, cows, a lot of uh, uh, um, crops, um, and a lot of trees, a lot of, a lot of great, I mean, you can see this bottom, bottom left picture. This is what you look, when you look west, in the western half of the county out towards the Blue Ridge Mountains, this is what you see. It's beautiful. What does that mean? Well, the people who live out there, they don't want some big ugly cell tower there. So there aren't any cell towers. Cell, cell coverage is abysmal. Um, there's, you know, the density out there is, is very low. Like I said, 80% of the county lives east of the Route 15. 20% of the county is spread out all over the other half. And um, the economics just don't make sense on their own. If I'm a service provider and I'm looking at spending $20,000 to put a 100, 100 meg bi-directional fiber connection to your farm and I can charge you 100 bucks a month, somebody do the quick math. How long does it take for me to actually turn a profit? That's just the capital cost to build the thing. But I still have an operating cost annually to you know, maintain and then to grow because you know, capacity is going to continue to um, drive demand. So it's not just the cash up front. There's an ongoing cost. So the economics just don't make sense, right? So that's what we had in Western Loudoun. 
And um, through these programs, um, there were roughly 8,600 homes that we identified, 8,600 farms basically, in the western part of the county that had zero internet access. Their mobile coverage was abysmal. They had, there's no such thing as DSL. Some of them tried some of the, you know, line of sight radio infrastructure. Yeah, it worked for maybe one or two of them, but think what happens when you have a bunch of hills. It's kind of hard to like get a radio signal line of sight like to somebody's house if there's a bunch of trees and a bunch of uh, dirt and rock in your way. So not a really good option. 8,600 uh, 8, homes were identified and we came together. So talking earlier about private um, public partnership arrangements and also about NTIA and treasury funding options. Also, the state of Virginia has its own incentives to try to encourage to close that um, digital divide throughout the state. So these organizations came together. Segra, um, who was looking to initially no negotiate uh, just a basic fiber infrastructure um, uh, sale to the county, um, the commission got involved and we, you know, we said, well, this is great. It's useful for the schools. It's useful for the public utilities and, and uh, public uh, infrastructure parts of the county that they're responsible for. But if we can leverage that as last mile, find a way to encourage the operator to put extra infrastructure in place um, beyond what they need just to meet the, the county's needs, then they could use that as a way to in incentivize um, other broadband operators to jump into the western part of the county. And uh, so we were su successful at that, getting it added to the contract and having a way to um, ensure anybody can come and use that as a, as a, as a last mile, uh, sorry, as a middle mile um, way to get out to the western part of the county. So that existed. And then um, All Points Broadband is, a, is an operator, um, uh, I think they're middle of the state um, based, and they're, they're hitting lots of markets in a rural, rural way throughout Virginia and also North Carolina and some of the surrounding states. And um, so they came, along with many others, bid on an opportunity to um, get some county funding, some state funding, um, federal funding, and mix all that together and, and really address these 8,600 uh, homes that are left. Um, so from the Virginia fund, they were able to, so this is 60 million, think about it, 8,600 homes, 60 million bucks to build it. Quick math, how much is that? 7,000 bucks, something like that, order of magnitude. So, Let's say they're not an ACP, and remember that term from earlier, uh, affordable care program, a way to get internet access for 30 bucks a month. Let's pretend like you're not one of those. And uh, you're a hundred, maybe $100 a month, uh, 100 meg service or one gig service or whatever, right? How many, how many months does it take to get your capital back if you spend $7,000 to build out to one of these things? That's like five plus years, right? That's not a good business plan. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. So, but if you take some of that cost off the table through the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative, that's the VADI, um, they were awarded 18 million bucks. Oh, by the way, I, I'm sharing all this because by sitting on the commission, this is all public information. So I was able to just kind of use this as a great example um, without having to go through NDA issues I've got from other programs but I do for my consulting practice. So that's where this is coming from. Um, so they got, you know, just under 18 million bucks um, and then through the uh, ARPA plan that's, that's administered through um, the Treasury Department, they got another 12 million bucks um, and, and then the company itself went to at private equity, uh, mentioned down here Searchlight, kind of backed them and gave them some cash from a private equity standpoint. Um, and then they did some partnerships with some of the uh, utilities in the, in, in, in the area. Dominion um, Energy is the uh, primary uh, electrical supply uh, utility for the state of Virginia. And um, they have right-of-ways that go through a lot of this infrastructure, uh, a lot of the countryside, where they have their you know, high, high uh, uh, power delivery infrastructure. And um, that gives them an easy way to put you know, new lines down and reach throughout the county. Same with Novak. Novak is a, um, a utility um, co-op. Uh, in, in part of the uh, Northern Virginia area. So by leveraging partnerships with both of them, as well as um, having access to Segra for some of the middle mile and then the federal funds and um, you know, put it all together, now it works. The, you know, the numbers work, the build works. Um, they're a couple of years out from having service delivered to these 8,600 homes. So great example applied there. Jane. We're at time. We're at time. Well, one last slide. So that's Loudoun. Let me talk about a couple of different issues when you go rural and you go north. Like in Canada, 
So same kind of stuff applies that I just talked about um, in rural parts. But big chunks of Canada are frozen for a big chunk of the year. You can't do construction. You can't build. Even if you have the money, you, you cannot go out and do the work. So they got to wait until it thaws and it's soft enough that you can go dig in the ground and put uh, infrastructure in. It's a little different. Um, distances are considerably longer. Um, you know, so you have to leverage other technologies as a way to try to make that work and still not break the economics, right? If I'm talking about 8,600 homes packed into, um, you know, half of the county and you put, I don't know, Marita, uh, 800 homes packed into northern Ontario, like the economics are very, very different They hit them than it is the 8,600 in western Loudoun. Um, so, yeah, so other limitations there. And, and I question the whole everybody's going to get it if you're counting mobile because my, my non... Um, uh, my generality of like what mobile is like in rural parts of Canada is it sucks. I don't think they're counting <laughs> mobile when they're doing the charts. Yeah, so they're not counting mobile when they're doing the charts, that's what Marita said. Um, but I, you know, I want to make sure if somebody's out in rural parts of uh, Manitoba or whatever um, and they have mobile, they're probably not happy and they're used to not having internet. So there's that whole education thing we talked about earlier until they know what, they, what they're missing and, and how this might enhance and make their lives better. They may not be complaining, right? The mobile is not good. They don't know why they need internet. Um, so there's an education component to it. So that is uh, a couple of ways that these programs are impacting uh, North America and uh, how I think collectively that's helping address some of the um, digital divide and get some inclusivity in place. Jane. Excellent. So for some of our guests here in the room from other countries, basically Canada and the United States are getting subsidies from their governments, yeah, for the infrastructure, and because it's so expensive to build out. Um, so it's more of a Kickstarter, isn't it, in some ways, because the estimates are upwards of $100 billion, I think, for the United States if you're going to try and cover a lot of the U.S. Um, Question for you on digital equity and inclusion, because this is a big buzzword in the United States right now, and every person um, that's working with uh, funding programs is talking about digital equity and inclusion. Do you train people first and then give them broadband, or do you give them broadband and train them after? What do you think? So one minute answers, if we can, so that we can do some speed rounds here. Marita, you're up. You can't train people if you don't have any internet there to train them on. So you have to do many of these things at the same time. There's some offline broadband tools that people are using in developing countries. I've spent 25 years working around the planet. So um, you can use a MacBook with, or a, a, you know, a, a different device with different information on it to do some offline training. But that's a really great point. So Grace, what do you think? We're doing both. And um, we're working with communities to do to get them excited about what the possibilities are. And when you, can you kind of start imagining the possibilities, then it sort of takes you in different directions. Yeah, obviously I'd say both too, but I'm gonna point back to Grace, something you said earlier, which is, hey, COVID helped. That was like a big education for a lot of people. Um, you know, just living in Loudoun County and hearing the challenges of Western part of the county of kids are now supposed to do school, but what is Zoom? How does that work? They don't have internet. So they're like literally sitting in the parking lot of, uh, McDonald's or, or the library because the libraries are closed by the way so you can't go in the library but maybe you can sit in the parking lot and hope to get a you know a spot of uh, Wi-Fi so that education part of why you might need it I think was accelerated by COVID. So digital marginalization or the digital divide um, as Grace had said Larry Irving who's a former administrator at the NTIA who was my boss when I worked there um, helped coin the term in the United States for those of you that might know what the International Telecommunication Union is, the ITU, if you look back 50 years, almost 40, there's something called the Maitland Commission Report. It's called the Missing Link Report. That report was about the telco fact, the fact that there wasn't tele telecom lines, some of the copper deployed throughout the world. So now we have these gaps that are out there. There's been marginalization. Um, is this what the the US program is gonna try and help solve right now is that marginalization. Because some of these communities are a little cranky, particularly in the southeast part of the United States. I work with some folks in what are called the black indigenous people of color, the BIPOC communities. So if, if they don't have internet and they've got some really bad copper and the COVID did say, gosh, you know, this is the best advertising for building networks ever. It was for, for me and the communities I was working with. 
How do you work with other government agencies, Grace? Because this is one of the big deals. Government agencies weren't talking to each other before the pandemic. Some were, they were trying, right? So now what other agencies are you working with across the US government? And I'm gonna to go to Marita after that, and then Ron, explanation about a little bit of what you're doing at the local level to get up to the state level. So yeah. Grace, uh, who else does NTIA coordinate with? That's a good, so you heard when Ron was presenting, he asked about the treasury program, and I gave the wrong number. It's actually 10 billion for treasury, not 20. Big, big difference. Um, but the, so to Jane's point, when we mean connect everyone, we really mean connect everyone. That's, we take that very seriously. Congress takes that very seriously. And they put, they designed the programs in a way that there's sort of a, it's an all of the above approach, right? So there are grants that are administrated, administered by the federal government. There are grants that are administered by states with some oversight. There are grants that are um, directed at rural communities. There are grants that are directed at uh, people, uh, pop BIPOC communities, uh, minorities, uh, indigenous communities, et cetera. So there's all kinds of approaches here, and that's why I tried to outline some of them for you, because they all have a different flavor and a different mission and set of requirements associated to them. In terms of coordinating, so you know that was the sort of in instruction from Congress. Um, in terms of coordinating in the government, I talked a lot about the Department of Commerce programs, the NTA programs. Those are the ones where there's the majority of this broadband infrastructure funding. But uh, like in Canada, we have an independent regulator, the Federal Communications Commission. They have had funds. Uh, that they've administered historically, some of them like the ones that Marita mentioned that are funded uh, with a sort of a public service commitment or sort of a tax on private companies, um, and others that, are, that were granted during this um, investment. So we work with the Federal Communications Commission. We work with the Department of Treasury. So they have the Capital Projects Fund, this $10 billion fund. That was designed primarily as a... Uh, in the context of the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, trying to create investments in all kinds of different pieces, economic recovery, right? So broadband is a piece of that, but it's not the only piece of that program. We work with the Department of Agriculture. They have a billion dollar program that is specific to uh, expanding access in rural communities because the, the main community of the Department of Agriculture is, is, uh, is the farming community and they are primarily based in rural areas. So giving them access has a sort of a specific mission and connotation there. Um, so those are the, the, the overview programs, but I can tell you from the inside, <laughs> there are lots of coordination meetings inside the, in the federal government with lots of different agencies because even though those are the agencies, the ones that I just named are the ones that are the primary agencies administering these programs, you know, we work with all of them because, you know, there's an education component, there's a healthcare component, um, there's an energy and utility component to this. So there's a lot of coordination. The Department of Transportation is doing a lot of investment in infrastructure. Can we work with them so that we don't, um, you know, when we're building and doing all these big projects uh, that they can be sort of coordinated you're digging once, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of work across the government, a lot of coordination, and a lot of engagement at the federal, at the state level too. Um, I mentioned this to some of you earlier, but at NTIA, this is the first time we've had, since the bipartisan infrastructure laws passed, it's really the first time we've had a remote workforce. We talked a little bit about working remote earlier today. Um, and some po folks talked about how the government is increasing that access. We are kind of doing it by, you know, just because we have to, by necessity, because we wanted to make sure that we had one NTIA employee in every state and territory across the United States, because we wanted to make sure that their job was to coordinate, ensure local coordination, work with state broadband offices. In order for that engagement to happen, we had to put people there, and we had to make them remote. Up until then, we had a staff that was primarily based in Washington, D.C., and um, some based in our research lab in Boulder, Colorado, but we didn't have a staff that was based uh, across the United States. Um, as the operations person for the agency, that changes the dynamic a lot. Every time there's a hurricane or emergency, I've got to find where people are, and it's uh, I can't just focus on two locations. I'm focusing on 56. So um, there's a lot of coordination 
in the government, within the agency, across the government, federal, state, et cetera. And internationally, we work a lot with the ITU. We work with other governments. So we're, it's a lot of work. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Marita, you had mentioned um, indigenous communities or the First Nations in Canada. How, are, how is the Canadian government coordinating with the First Nations communities? Well, there, is that on? Yes, there's a, there, there's, there is a particular fund focused particularly on the First Nations communities. Uh, and um, the government has been very active in trying to connect them. As I, as I mentioned, they have been pretty proactive uh, in, in telling the government exactly what it is that, that they required and how they wanted to see it rolled out. Uh, quite a number of communities have got their own broadband uh, networks. British Columbia has particularly been good at this in, you know, in that they've, they've, had a, they've had a First Nations Technology Council since I can remember in the mid-90s, uh, and it has always been active. And, and BC has been busy, but they're still not finished. None of this stuff is finished. It's so remote, some of these places, it's hard to get to them. And, the, and as we're saying, coordination of all this stuff is, is really difficult. Uh, some of this stuff has been going on for so many years, I, uh, and it's still not done. And the money doesn't always get spent is the way it's supposed to get spent. Is, you know, we have this $4 billion program uh, about small business adoption program. 3% of its budget was spent in the first year. So they're just not being able to roll it out. Got, the business says, oh, well, it's too complicated and there's too much red tape. You have to fix it before we can really use it. So there's, there's still a lot of grit in the system. I don't know whether we're really going to get to 100% by that time, but I'm glad to see that people are actually talking about it, working on it, and I think it's the pandemic that did it. That we suddenly, everybody woke up and said, hey, we've got to do this. I'm going to come back to the point you just made about accountability in a sec, but Ron, you have a unique perspective because you're on a commission. Could you explain for some of our colleagues from other countries what that means and how you coordinate at, this, with, at the commission level in your city up to the state? Uh, yeah, and then I would love to make a comment about the Indigenous Canadian uh, market challenges. Um, the county of uh, Loudoun has, uh, from a government standpoint, there are eight elected representatives. Um, the county is kind of broken up into, remember I said there were 400,000 plus people there, so they're broken up into um, eight times 40 to 50,000 people per, right? So it's divided by population. Um, and like I said, like only two of them are in the western half, the other only. And, uh, and then there's an at-large uh, supervisor that's elected. So each um, district represents their, uh, sorry, elects their representative. So those are the nine representatives in the, in the, um, the commission is really um, there to serve the supervisors, the elected officials, and advise them on uh, primarily, it, it generated from cable TV days, um, on franchise uh, agreements for cable TV distribution throughout the county, but it's evolved to be um, not just video uh, distribution, but also broadband related activity. So that's really the role. And um, so our interactions uh, as a commission with our supervisors, as well as with county staff on activities that are going on from a legislative standpoint in the state of Virginia or um, legislative uh, things that are coming out of the federal government, we interact with the legislative uh, liaison and advise them and give them direction. We we work with the uh, the, the the grants and the IT program uh, facilitators in the county who um, are the primary ones that are working with the state and then th um, through the state's help or directly with the federal uh, programs. Um, so we we kind of work through that system. That's kind of a local view up into into how that comes from a, uh, a public version. But back to the Indigenous Canadian comment just for a minute. I, I think one thing that I've seen um, in Canada that's that's been um, exciting is um, in some of the indigenous communities, you have a tribal council that can make a decision for the entire community to say, yep, we're putting broadband everywhere. <laughs> and just wholesale, like, we're going to build the whole community and be done with it. And, you know, you still have to connect it. You have to backhaul it to somewhere. Um, but uh, it makes the construction so much easier than um, in, you know, <laughs> primarily uh, a consumer environment where you need permission to go onto their property and dig it up and put a hole in their wall and stuff like that. Without permission, you're kind of limited what you can do. But if the tribal council says, yeah, we're doing everybody, you can just go and do it all. So that's kind of an interesting uh, pr perspective on what's going on in Canada. 
Yeah, and if you, there's more data on the Indigenous Connectivity Summit website, if any of you are interested, both at the Internet Society and Connect Humanity, the Indigenous Connectivity Summit, give us a seventh one, was just held in um, Alaska. I was part of the, the creation of that with Mark Buell, who many of you know, who's from Canada and worked for the Canadian Internet Registry Authority, CIRA, years ago, and he's also at Connect Humanity. But that ICS is a way, as Ron is saying, where a lot of the tribes do come together in the First Nations. Some sacred land you can't build on. You've got to figure out how to deal with that at the tribal level. So there's lots of different governance um, issues there. We're at about um, a speed round of a minute left for each of you because I want to make sure we get the other panel up here for their start. But accountability is something that's really important. And Marita, you had talked about the fact that maybe some of the money hadn't been spent in Canada. And Grace, you're up to around 60 billion that needs to be accounted for. Um, this is a huge issue. And uh, many of the communities at the local level are gonna hold people accountable for A, either getting connectivity or not, B, where that money goes, and how are we keeping track of it? This is a massive issue. And um, some people I know are actually putting local covenants together at the local level to hold network providers responsible for connecting the un and underserved first. So that's something that is a tactic that people are using at the local level, at the local last mile level, um, where if there's a build out, you've got to get to those folks that are unconnected uh, first or underserved. So Ron, what would you say about accountability? Minute and a half. Yeah, I, I've seen, um it's being implemented differently in each state. And it's really, I think, more of a state level that's then partnering with the locality. Um, and I'm encouraged to hear NTI is really ramping up their focus to help with that process. Because I think that's overall going to gonna, um, address the accountability component. Um, I know here in Virginia, um, you know, the, the Department of um, Housing and... Oh, shoot, I forget the rest of the acronym stands for. Um, you know, they're, they're leading that for the state. And, um, and they're putting a dashboard together and they're presenting to the to the citizens of, of Virginia, here's where that money is going. Here's the, so the accountability pieces, which, you know, who got awarded what money to where and how far are they along with their process and stuff. So it's, it's there, but that um, is very different in other states. So I think that's a challenge and I'm glad to hear NTI is, uh, that's on their radar. And you have open meetings, yes, at your yes. Com county level, right? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to say that. So for those of you that may work with regulators or policymakers or civil society and want to get in and talk to your governments, there are ways to obviously force that. And Marita, I turn to you at the end here after Grace to help us with civil society and working with government and accountability. So Grace, you're, you're in an agency and you have a lot of funding that's going out the door. How are you holding um, the people that you're giving that money to accountable? So there's two pieces to this. Uh, the There's engagement and there's some technology. I'll start, the, but I've already talked about how the programs were designed by Congress. They have, they're pretty, they have a lot of requirements in them. If you pull the, um, the, the statute and then the notice of funding opportunities that we sent out, there's a, they're pretty involved. So there's a lot that we're sort of pre-setting here and requiring at the outset when states submit their plans. So that's one piece to sort of set the expectations. But the two pieces that I want to get to in the one minute here is engagement and technology, right? So in this case, again, unprecedented for NTIA level of engagement. We're out in every state. We're working with them. We're ex explaining the requirements. We're providing assistance where some of those requirements may be difficult for folks on workforce, on um, you know, how they're going to serve, build out estimates, et cetera. So we're engaged deeply with communities, and I think they hold themselves more accountable when they know that they're engaged and that their local communities are engaged and watching too, right? So there's a lot of coordination, both from the federal side and local communities on that piece. And then the technology piece, really interesting. Again, I come from a, at this from mostly the operational side of NTA, but we have technology now and software that allows us to really track status of funds in a you know daily minute minute by minute we're we're really keeping up to speed so we're building a lot of that capacity at NTI right now and it's new this is government technology procurement i will spare you the details but it's a it's a process um, so we're we're but we're doing that we're building out some pretty state of the art or you know for government state of the art tech and it's going to help us also track and monitor the funds that are administered at the state level Excellent. Marita, in a minute and a half, accountability, Canada, citizen level, interface with government. Pick, pick, <laughs> pick, pick one of those. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Um, I think everybody's going to anticipate my answer. Um, the resources for that kind of thing are really, really slim. Uh, they used to be better in, as I said, government was actually looking to civil society for some answers and some guidance. That is no longer really the case. Uh, it's always the opposition. And the voice is, it's very hard to get the voice in because obviously uh, the lobbying um, that goes on in the background with the big telcos, that's, you know, that's, wh that's where the government ears really are. We do what we can. We don't have access to the kind of trust funds that you have in the states. So, you know, that's just not, and, and you know, public uh, advocacy groups don't really like to go to, you know, um, vested interests uh, for a lot of money because that doesn't look very good if you're being sponsored by Google or Facebook. So you can't go there either. So it, it's a very hard thing. I was, I have to say, I was so grateful when Zoom came around and was, uh, was everybody could access it and there was a free part of it. We could actually meet as a group on Zoom. We hadn't been able to do that for years. Wonderful. Give this panel a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we thank you all for listening. And we're going to turn it over to the next panel. But thank you for the great perspectives. Okay, everyone, are you going to do your voice thing or no? Should I do it? Sure, I'll do the voice thing. Uh, okay. <laughs> please take your seats. We're going to go right into the next panel. Yeah, let's get started. Okay, everyone, we're going to get this last panel for today started. Um, this panel is proof that we always save the best for last in any program. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for sticking with us. Um, I'm Naila Saras. I am the uh, Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement for the North America region. So my job is to look after North America. Um, we don't like that, okay. <laughs> well, this is the NASIG. <laughs> and in that capacity, my team, the Global Stakeholder Engagement Team, really our job is to work with stakeholders around the world uh, to engage with them on all kinds of policy and engagement issues that happen within the ICANN uh, realm. Um, and I'm very uh, honored and happy to be here today for today's panel, which is titled Women, um, Pi Pi Women Pioneers and Inclusion is the title of today's panel. I will quickly go through uh, the list of panelists that we have today, but I'm also going to have them also, uh, give a little bit of introduction about themselves. And this panel was kind enough to let me just come up with questions. Um, so they don't have slides, which we don't have to have that uh, challenge. I will uh, I'll ask them questions and ask them to answer. So 
on um, today's panel, we have, the first one is Tripti Sinha, right here in the middle. Um, and I'll read from the introduction that is uh, well documented on the, on the NASIG uh, page. So I'll just quickly give a highlight, but please uh, go there because those introductions are well documented there. Tripti is the Assistant Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at the University of Maryland in the Division of Information Technology. She leads Advanced Cyber Infrastructure and Internet Global Services, ACIGS, and the Mid-Atlantic Cro Crossroads, MAX. Um, she has over three decades of progressive experience in Internet Cyber Infrastructure Technologies, um, and so that's her role, but I'm also here. She's worked also hosting her here as the chair of the ICANN Board of Directors and has previously served as co-chair of ICANN's Root Server System Advisory Committee, RSAC. Tripti has also served on several other boards that are mentioned on the webpage if you go look up the um, bios of our uh, panelists today. Next, we have Kathy Kleiman. Kathy is an author, lawyer, programmer, data security auditor, and professor who discovered the ENIAC programmers uh, while studying at Harvard. Her passion for their story led her to an award-winning documentary called The Computers, and uh, the book called Proving Ground, which we saw uh, was outside earlier today. After college, Kathy worked in data centers, attended Boston University School of Law, and co-founded her firm's, her firm's Internet Law and P Policy Group. She later became a uh, part of the group that founded ICANN, the organization that I work for. Kathy also co-founded ICANN's non-commercial user constituency, or we refer to as the NCUC, right? And founded one of the first internet law uh, practices. And she served on several other um, organizations. Also, that's documented in the, in the ICANN, on the NASIC page. And last but not least, Marita was introduced in the last uh, um, uh, panel. I'll just quickly say Marita is somebody I work very closely with in her Naralo capacity, North America Regional At-Large Organization. Uh, she's also been on the board of CIRA, the organization that looks after .ca. She's also been part of ALAC, the At-Large Advisory Committee uh, of ICANN, and she's very, very uh, active in internet governance uh, fora um, that I work with Marita on. So that's a quick introduction of our panelists. And as I said, um, all the panelists were kind enough to let me come up with questions, so I'll just go through my questions. And um, some questions will be directed to the whole panel, and some will be only directed to specific uh, panelists, because we don't have time to have them answer all the questions. But I'm hoping we have time afterwards during the reception uh, to ask more questions of the panelists. So question number one, very simple. Uh, please tell us a little about yourself. Uh, what drew you to your line of work, and what keeps you engaged in it? Uh, we'll start from the right. Um, Kathy, go ahead, please. Is this on? Yes, it is. Terrific. Um, I started in this area when I was the age of many of the people in this room. And um, I took a lot of computer science and I got very interested in networking and bringing things together. That was when the internet was still an educational and research tool that connected colleges and universities mostly. And um, commercial traffic was not allowed on, which I know sounds like it was a long time ago, but really it wasn't. And um, so I was fascinated by this network. Um, and I thought, you know, there are going to be legal issues there. And I went to law school and came out. And of course, there were fascinating legal issues. But I went into telecommunications. So everything you heard on the last panel is what I spent um, my first 10 years in law doing was working in front of the US Federal Communications Commission on licensing radio and television and satellite um, and microwave and all sorts of fascinating things, the, the, way, the way we get communications around. But then this internet thing popped up and there were domain name questions and early domain name disputes came to my desk and I said, this is, this is where the action will be. And as you said, we founded um, an internet law and policy group in my law firm. I also went to work for .org, uh, came back to my law firm, continued that work, and then I decided we needed a lot more leaders in the world 
like you, and I went to law school, this time as a professor. Yeah. And so I teach internet technology and governance and intellectual property and try to inspire more people to come into internet and technology policy like you because we need you. Thank you. Tripti. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So first, Nayla, thank you very much for having me, for inviting me to this event. I appreciate it. So how did I get into this field? Um, much like Kathy, I started off um, studying computer science. That was my uh, um, area of focus, and um, I was always very strong in the science and math uh, fields, and I initially thought I was going to be a math major, and then physics, and then I ended up with computer science. And um, believe it or not, this was a long time ago, 30 years ago, um, my focus was going to be artificial intelligence, which we're hearing so much about today, and neural networks. And so I actually worked for an artificial uh, intelligence and neural networks-based company, but 30 years ago, the processors were not where they are today. So, you know, we programmed at Lisp and so forth. But anyway, one thing led to another. I ended up at the University of Maryland. I was a software engineer um, um, by training and then got into networking eventually. So uh, systems, and I, as I've told the story before, I started um, at the you know bottom of the stack and then moved up the stack in management, bottom of the technology stack, that is. So so as I moved, well, no, I started at the t as a developer and then moved down the stack into networking and then moved up the stack in management, is, is how I put it. So um, essentially, I worked the entire stack and then came into networking. And at the University of Maryland, uh, we run um, one of the D DNS root servers. And that, that's how I came into ICANN, if you want to know how I ended up here. But what I do in my day job is um, uh, I run a, a very advanced cyber infrastructure uh, for the Washington metro region. And actually, Grace was here earlier talking about the NTIA uh, broadband initiative that directly speaks to one of my core areas that I work in um, in my day job. So uh, essentially, what um, uh, my focus is is on offering advanced um, technologies uh, to accelerate science, and we also have a research arm where, where we do research, and my current research focus is on quantum networking and quantum technologies, and, um, and my third focus is ICANN and governance and policy making, because with any new enabling technology, you have an infrastructure of policy that's required, how do you govern it, and, and that's how I got into this field, so. Thank you, Tripti. Um, and over to you, Marita. Okay, Nayala, uh, if this is a field, I've never been paid a nickel for working in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when I was working, I was working in libraries. And the first time I ever saw any digital download thing, it was through something called an acoustic coupler. Does anybody ever seen one of those? All right. <laughs> yeah, it was a telephone. You stuck it on a thing that had a couple of like earmuffs and you dialed the right numbers and your 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 research was downloaded uh on paper okay <laughs> uh yeah uh, but then i really got involved very deeply in this uh, in uh, 1994 when the internet um started to become public and the free nets started to uh evolve i had read um howard rheingold's uh virtual reality and I thought, oh, that's where all the internet, all the interesting people are. Uh, so uh, I, I started working with that. That was also like a big volunteer thing where people worked very hard to build up the free nets in the early days. And people were dying to get online, even though there was nothing there. Uh, hardly anything there, but it was just so exciting. Thing about it uh, is uh, there's a lot of passion uh, involved in getting uh, when you, when you get involved in a new technology that's really disruptive and you know it is, you know it's going to change everything, and you want to be there at the beginning because you might just have a little window to have a little voice in how that evolves. And that's why I, w I am still involved, but that's why it was originally. Thank you. Um, okay. So in this, in this today's... Um, the, the entire um, theme of the of the session here at NASIG is inclusion and accessibility, and and this is why we're talking to 
um, you women as leaders in your fields and ones that have had to deal with inclusion issues and accessibility and, 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 and advocating for yourselves. So as a leader in your field, um, I guess my question is, what challenges have you had getting into this? And really knowing you, it's probably a challenge that you turned in, into an opportunity. Uh, but um, can you share with us challenges that you've had or barriers that you've had in this, uh, it, working in this, in this area, in this field? Um, start with you again, uh, Kathy. Sure. Um, challenges in the field. Well, the first one was when I started going into upper level computer science classes and there was only one woman in the room, uh, one other woman, and sometimes I was the only woman in the room and I see heads nodding. Um, and I'm, I'm amazed and shocked and saddened that that is still the case. Uh, it shouldn't be, but it is. And so that was the first thing. Um, and I think we're going to have later questions where I talk about the women I met who changed, but we should wait on that, right? Let's do, that. Um, let's do it now. Let's, let's, let's do it later. Um, and then it, um, yep, that's good. I don't know, I think that's it. Go ahead. So, Oops. so unlike um, Kathy, <laughs> um, I believe it or not went to an all women's college. And oh. um, so, and Almost my entire middle school and high school was all women's. So the, the classroom belonged to me. I was surrounded by women. However, I had exactly the same experience Kathy had when I went to graduate school at Maryland. And I walk into the classroom and I'm the only woman. And I was like, wait a minute, something feels wrong here. You know, why, what's wrong with this picture? <coughs> and to add insult to injury, Professor walks in, looks at his roster, looks around the room, looks at me, looks at me again, and says, "Are you in the right class?" Oh. Ouch. And I, sa I asked him if he could read off the roster, and I said, "That's me. <laughs> I'm in the right class." But anyway, it's it's incidences like that. And 30 years ago, well, there were computer science majors because I went to Smith College in Massachusetts. But there's still a problem today. There just aren't women, enough women in this field, and we've got to change that. So sadly, there was a big push 30 years ago. There still needs to be a push that hasn't changed that much. Rita. And in my case, I'm going to bring in the fact that, you know, as a working mother uh, with a job and trying to do a whole bunch of stuff off the side of my desk, it was always a time issue. Um, and, you know, as women always taking on all the jobs and doing the great multitasking stuff that we do, um, yeah, you do get pretty exhausted and stressed out by the lack of time to do the things that you really feel you want to do. Totally agree. And always feeling like you're not giving everything your 150%. And, and when it's your family, that's really terrible, <laughs> um, the guilt. But uh, Tripti, you led me into my next question, which I'm going to direct to you, which is about change in organizations. Because you're right, things have not changed very quickly, um, not much. And I bring this up because change in organizations, um, um, it's, easy for, it's easy for us as women to be told, well, advocate for yourself, negotiate for yourself, don't take it a job that you know, isn't what you think is your worth. And those are, that's all good and well, right? That's good advice. But I think there is a responsibility that's directly on organizations to also make the change. Changes are going to happen if organizations make them happen. So don't put the problem back on us, right? We'll advocate for ourselves. So with that change, I want to jump into uh, some of the statistics that I was, as I was preparing these questions and some of the numbers I found. And I apologize, this, these numbers apply to US markets only. So I didn't have time to research everybody. But the numbers are pretty appalling, uh, really, in terms of, for example, as women in organizations first promoted into that first step of being um, managers, um, only 86% of those women make it to that first step of managers. And then the number is even lower for women in the tech field. And so that first step of going to manager, if, if less women are going up, then the pipeline only shrinks even more and more as you go up that stack, that managerial stack, not the data stack. 
So then it's very obvious why at the top you have very little women to promote from, right? Because the, the pipeline has been empty from the beginning. So how do we get around that? How do we start making changes in organizations to make sure that women are, are promoted and are given that opportunity that others are afforded so that the pipeline is fuller as you get higher in the, in the, in the managerial stack? So uh, thank you for the question. And that is indeed a problem. So uh, just to let you know, I, in my day job, I, I was just filled up an empty position, a senior position, and um, you know I was very anxious to hire a woman, and all the applicants were men, and we tried. The first search failed, tried the second search. In the end, I hired a very qualified man. The problem is the dearth of women in the field. There really is. And um, how do we overcome that problem? So. I think it really starts with early childhood, to be honest with you. I think uh, uh, you have to go down to early, you know, kindergarten, elementary school, middle school. Girls need to be encouraged to study, you know, the sciences and math. I, I was encouraged from childhood. I'm, you know, I come from an academic family, so I had no such barriers. Yeah. But uh, when I t um, run into other women in fields, I hear stories, and I've been on... National Science Foundation, you know, uh, meetings where they've t women have shared their stories of, um, you know, middle school uh, incidences that were discouraging women from going into these fields. So I think we really need to start there. That's where it really starts. And uh, you create an even playing field and, you know, and then open up opportunities. But we are where we are. How do we promote when you're once in the, in the uh, you know, in the workforce? So there are a couple of things that are at play. I've noticed that men, because you've dominated the workforce for centuries now, have uh, developed a very strong network. And men are very supportive of each other. You compete for positions, but you also support each other. Women are still uh, we're a few decades behind in doing that. Yeah. So I think we have to work very hard to get we are where we are, and then you you, you tend to not support other women. I've seen that a lot, and that has to change. We have to now support each other and promote each other. And so that's one aspect of it. There's another, which is you have to be very, very conscious in how you um, look for women. For example, as you all know, we're looking for um, the next ICANN CEO. So when I uh, constructed the search committee, if you've looked at it, it's 50% women. And that was something that was very important to me. Because when you bring candidates in, one, when the candidate interviews, he and she wants to see someone who looks like them, right? And I've been on many, many interviews where it's mostly men. I walk into rooms where it's mostly men. So it, it becomes a more calming environment for some an individual to interview. when you, If it's a man and he says 50, sees 50% 50 of the uh, you know, the, uh, the committee's uh, men, it makes it much easier, right? So that's one thing. And then you make a conscious effort to go out there and dig deeper and bring women into the fold. So th you, it, there's just many things, many cylinders you need to fire on to make it, you know, more equitable. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. And um, I want to say I, I have the privilege, had the privilege of working um, with Tripti when she was the co-chair of the Root Service System Advisory Committee. And, and, and sadly, it is no joke that there were many times, I'm, I was the liaison from ICANN IANA department to RSAC. And there were many times that I attended meetings of RSAC and Tripti was literally the only woman in there uh, on that committee. And, and sadly, it hasn't changed much, um, but I think, it's, I think it's becoming very, very obvious that, yeah that things need to change. Great, thank you. Um, so then that, that leads us to our next question, which is directed at Kathy. Kathy, who worked on uh, something called the ENIAC project, E-N-I-A-C, right? Is that how you refer to it? Um, so your project on the ENIAC project showed that women have been there all along. Uh, it's not new uh, that women you know, are now coming into the workforce that we were you know, doing other things are now coming in. We've been there for years, for decades. Um, but we, are, we're, we weren't getting the attention that we, the recognition that we need to. So first, I'd like you to please tell us a little bit about the ENIAC project so the audience is aware of it. And then uh, a little bit of advice on how we, as women, 
uh, make change in organizations to make sure that we're included, we're part of the decisions, we're part of the, the structure of an organization that makes an organization uh, tick. Is that not working? Absolutely. Okay, great. It's a good question, and it just so happens because we had books outside, I brought posters. So I can tell the story with some pictures, which is when I took my computer science class, I wanted to know if there were women in computing, especially when I kept walking into the upper level rooms, like my LISP course and C course, and, and there were almost no one. So of course we know about Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper, but that's it. One woman in the 19th century, one woman in the 20th century. That's one woman a century. I mean, that's, that's continuing the old story. Um, I found these pictures of ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, the world's first all-electronic, general-purpose, programmable computer. Who's heard about it here, the ENIAC, right? We study it in computer history, eight feet tall, 80 feet long, black, steel. Um, we know about Bletchley Park now, which we didn't know about for 50 years because it was secret, and breaking, uh, that's in the UK, and they broke... Um, the Enigma code, the German code with the Colossus machine and Alan Turing. Who saw the imitation game? Great, lots of people here. So Kiera Knightley, I just want you to know, she represents four to 6,000 women that were at Bletchley Park, all reduced to Kiera Knightley. She's brilliant, but I think there should have been a few more women in that, uh, in that film. Um, this was the secret US Army project in Philadelphia. And so when I found these pictures, I was like, huh, there seem to be women in them, right? And the men were in the captions and the women weren't. I'm like, hmm, okay. And I was kind of told the women were models. Oh, no. hmm. Hmm. So I went looking farther, further. This is also a picture of ENIAC. We've got two women very, very clearly in the pictures. And I'd like to introduce you to Jean Jennings Bardick and Fran Belis Spence, two of the original six ENIAC programmers, all of the original programmers of the ENIAC were young women. All six of them were young women recruited by the Army to calculate ballistics trajectories, the path of a shell from the time it leaves the muzzle of a big cannon, a big piece of artillery, until it hits a target. It was a differential calculus equation, and we went all across the country. Jean comes in from a farm in Missouri. Fran was in Philadelphia already, and they all come to Philadelphia, and they are selected from a group of about 100 women who are calculating these trajectories and um, to program ENIAC, because that was ENIAC's program. They were the subject matter experts. So why they were dismissed as models for decades and decades is another story. It's written about in book, and I won't talk about it too much, but I got to know four of the original six ENIAC programmers. They were my role models. So that's why I love, I'm not, I'm not pushing the book. There are just six wonderful pictures of these women, and four of the six talked to me. They were in their 80s. And they said, of course women belong in the field. Of course you belong, so stay and do. And when I called them when we were founding ICANN, when we were holding the first ICANN meetings, I'd walk in the room and it was mostly men. We're not bashing you guys, we like you. I mean, you've always been nice and wonderful and warm, but still, you know, you look to the left and you look to the right. And they're like, especially Jean, again, from the farm in Missouri would like, She'd be like, give them hell, Kathy. Just go in, do what you have to do. And so I had these mentors. You've got these mentors um, and role models. Um, how do we change things? We do it together. It's not just, as you said, it's not just a woman's job. It's a man's job, too. I was just at the Computer History Museum talking about this story. And the last question was from a young man who said, how do we improve the workforce so that women feel more welcome? And I'm like, that is the question. And everyone probably has a different answer to it. But the key is, I mean, I've worked with so many of the men in this room as well um, as the women. Um, the key is, is to make everyone feel as warm and comfortable and argue equally with everybody. Right, right Jonathan, we've, we've argued for years. Um, <laughs> and then gone out and had a drink. So um, make everyone in the room feel comfortable. Introduce yourself to the strangers and absolutely go and promote everyone you can and promote not just, not just women, people of color are facing even more discrimination uh, in the tech field. So um, go, go look harder than just what's on the top of the stack. Thanks. Thank you, excellent. Go ahead, please, Tripti. If I could just add one thing to what Kathy said. So the reason I got where I got to in the end is because men promoted me. So 
men played a strong role and don't give up on uh, the humanity of individuals because eventually when you stay the course, when you present your skill set, your capabilities, people recognize it. They do, and no matter what your gender. So um, yes, they do. And you can argue that, well, men were there. That's Who else was there but men in the room, right? So I got promoted. But regardless, I have met some amazing men who are very, very supportive of women. So people do recognize that. So don't give up on that, on that faith and that hope. Thank you. That's really well said. Yeah. And I'd just like to say that when we kind of we don't usually think about this as a collective responsibility in the public policy area. Um, it's not just about men and women, it's, that it's because the system has become calcified in many ways and it's really hard to break out of a calcified system. When I was working and making decisions in a support role and supervising people, there really wasn't any way to break through that until there was a government affirmative action pro program that made every every organization do an audit on its staff and find out what these people did and everybody got points on what they did well that's how i broke the glass ceiling it wasn't because it was a male decision it was because there was a public policy that said we have to fix this we know this is happening we have to fix it so sometimes it happens that way too i know it's unusual this canada uh, we, sometimes we get socialist government <laughs> That's what happened. Whatever it takes. Um, no, and, and I'm really actually, um, as someone, I, I'm originally Palestinian. Uh, it's not, it, this is not something to take for granted that governments do make those conscious decisions, right? I mean, there are governments where that's not necessarily an, uh, a priority in their agenda, so something very appreciated for sure. Okay, I'll keep going with my questions, but I promise there will be quite a time for questions uh, from you guys at the, um, at the end that I will make sure we'll have, we keep time for. Um, Tripti, back to you, because I think you, you mentioned a little bit about um, uh, going up the um, managerial stack is how you refer to it. Um, and so I want to go talk a little bit about um, breaking what we refer to as the glass ceiling but not just the glass ceiling through corporations. I think around the world there's many glass ceilings that we all have to face, um, especially as you, me you mentioned minority women. Uh, in parts of the world, there's women still have a difficult, uh, difficulty getting access to finance, to loans, to lodge their businesses. Um, other places, including myself, are, uh, women still have um, issues with inheritance, um, rights to inheritance uh, from, from their families. Um, you've certainly one that broke a lot of those glass ceilings. You've gone up the uh, managerial stack in your organization and, and you've served on, on many boards as uh, chair of the board um, and other organizations. What, what advice do you have for us in terms of how to get to that level? Um, and as women uh, find themselves being challenged by this, what, what, yeah, what, what words of wisdom can you um, offer to that issue? So I don't know if this is a stroke of luck or, or happenstance, but I picked a field that I really truly like. So first, whatever you pursue in life, make sure you, you, know, you, you have a passion for it. And, and be authentic. And I'm an extremely hardworking person. And, uh, and work hard and stay the course and you know you're going i always say this you're going to have bumps and bruises along the way but don't let that hold you back and uh, just keep 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 at it and um have a lot of faith in people around you because people do ultimately recognize capabilities when they see it and um and help others along the way yeah. and uh, there's one thing that my father taught me my late father which is um, he said, if you, uh, if you fail at something, throw that behind you. Don't think about it because that failures oftentimes will hold you back. If you're successful, put that behind you as well because that too could hold you back. It could go to your head and you could kind of re relax on your laurels, you know. So whatever happened yesterday happened. Learn from it. Enjoy the moment if it's a good one. Move on to your next challenge. So just focus on what comes next and you know just stay the course and be ready there are you're going to have you know 
difficult moments ahead of you. Everyone does. And um, I, that's, I mean, that really is, there's no other secret to it. That's just the way I broke the ceiling. You just uh, keep at it and build relationships along the way. Yeah. 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 Maybe I can also ask a, a follow-up to that. Are you encouraged by what you're seeing? Um, do, you think, do you think there's enough change and advancement of women that's happening? Are you, do, you, do you think our organizations are getting there? Do you think, do you, are you hopeful? Well, and it's funny, I was, uh, Vint and I were talking recently, and he said um, the age of the matriarchs, because with Doreen at the helm of the ITU, and you've got a, um, me as chair of ICANN board, and Sally as interim CEO, it's like, it's nice to see so many women. In the, uh, so I think it is changing, yes. The more f women faces that you see will bring about change. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, Marita. Uh, when, I, when I ran for the um, CIRA board, the uh, Canadian Internet Registry, uh, Registration Authority, the .ca domain name people, um, one of my platforms was there have to be more women on this board. That was 2013. Now there are already more than half of the board is women. So that is really changing. It changed very quickly um, because it became a policy thing. People became aware of it. And, and people who were in a position to, like in my case, elect, they, they, they agreed there had to be more women. And now they're working towards getting more minorities on the board. I mean, it's, just, it's a process. It's, a, it, it's happening. Not instant, but happening. No, that, that's good, Marita, because that feeds um, into the question I wanted to ask you specifically is, are you encouraged by what you're seeing in the internet governance area um, that we both work in? Are you encouraged by your see what, what you're seeing? With respect to women or? Well, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, with respect <laughs> to women and inclusion of women, yes. Yeah, there, there are a lot of women involved in the multi-government, in the, in the, in the multi-stakeholder system here, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, you see, like we've been saying many years ago, you didn't see that much. Um, and, and so, yeah. It, it, the, what I was really encouraged by was there's, it's actually a policy. It, there has to be diversity, gender diversity, um, and all the other kinds of diversities have to be reflected. Well, you didn't used to see that sort of thing, and it's right there, and working towards it, uh, yes, yeah, it is encouraging. Good. Yeah, I, I was working on putting a panel for ICANN's uh, 77 meeting next week, and um, um, we were naming people that we wanted on the panel, and, and one of the first things, one of the organizers jumped up and said, this is a manual, this is not a panel, so come on, let's work on a little bit on diversity. And I was really, really, I mean, <laughs> uh, it was really nice to see and, and, and a good reminder um, that, that it's no longer, you, you, have to, you, you have to put other considerations, right? It, it's no longer just the best man for the job. I mean, we are always focusing on the best panelists, but we do have, it, it's no longer just, um, same old is not gonna work anymore, thankfully. Um, Kathy, um, Tripti took us down the STEM road, science, technology, engineering, math fields. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that because I think you're 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 in that space, um, and 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 sadly, we're still seeing few women going into STEM uh, um, jobs clusters. Um, so, for example, according to the numbers I was looking at, um, in engineering, women's shares have inched up only slightly from 12% uh, in 1990 to 15% uh, today. And the share of women in computer occupations owed, um, was even went down this during this period. In 1990, 32% of workers in computer occupations uh, were women. Today, it's only 25%. And that percentage hasn't changed since 2016. What do you think should be done uh, to encourage more women to go into these fields? And what resources um, can women turn to uh, for guidance to help them uh, to achieve success in, this field, in STEM fields? Great. Um, you, you've got the statistics and they sound difficult. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise some good news. So I, with the book, I've been all over the United States, um, and I look forward to hearing what's happening in your countries uh, on this. But I've been all over the United States, and the STEM program is strong. We're working hard at every level, whether it's kindergarten through sixth grade. Um, 
seventh grade, which is the beginning of our middle school, junior high school, seventh grade to eighth and ninth grade, and then into high school and into college. And I'm working on graduate programs, making sure uh, kids come into the PhD and law programs so that we have graduate women and, and people of color working on tech and internet policy, as we were talking about. Um, there's just amazing efforts. There's an enormous amount of money. That's been a theme through throughout today, is that where there's money, where there's incentives, where there's money for people with good ideas. There are great projects. There are lots of projects for people with really good ideas to share them. So I was at um, a, a STEM teachers fair in Massachusetts, and it was teachers sharing ideas with each other of programs that really excited their kids in different, their kids, their students in different areas of STEM. Um, I went to the Computer Science Teachers Association regional meeting in one part of the country and talked to the teachers and gave them the history, which they will now put into their classrooms as well. They thought it was very inspirational and that their students would be inspirational. We have to find more ways to share programs. We have a group, something called CS for All um, and NCWIT, the National Council for Women in Technology, but we just need much more involvement. And as Tripti said, we have to start early. Yeah. And um, and frankly, I think it's starting with games. I got to raise two children while doing all this crazy work. And um, we tried to make science and technology fun. And we tried to make it as interesting as possible. But my daughter came home in middle school and said, Mom, I can't do math or computer science. And I'm like, hmm, where did she get that? This is somebody who met the ENIAC programmers. Oh. And it's coming in from peers. It's coming in from the media media, you know, a lot of money has been spent to try to figure out what went wrong. Um, but our answer was interesting. Uh, a, a few weeks later, she asked for a, com a new computer. I'm like, what do you need that for? She's like, games. I'm like, hmm. And I thought about it, and I'm like, you could have a new computer if you build it. And her stepfather, who should raise his hand, Mark Massey, and my daughter built a computer together. And I never again heard a problem about I can't do computer science. I heard mom hasn't built a computer yet. <laughs> mom, get to it. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's, that's really great. All right. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So I want to go to one more question, um, Tripti. Um, this is... Um, I, I, um, the, the, again, the, um, our theme here is um, inclusion uh, as DASIG. So, and I think you've touched on this a little bit before um, about women and helping other women and being good mentors of other women. Um, and, and, and the data shows and the, and the research that we look at says that women do take the time to be more mentoring and, and helping of other women in the workplace um, and taking them on as um, trainees and, and, and um, answer questions uh, from, from, from fellow women because they're interested in seeing them advance. But at the same time, sometimes that um, hinders women advancement themselves because now they're they're taking time out of their busy, uh, you know, in, away from work to help others and be kind. Um, how do you deal with that in the organization to make sure that women continue to give, men, men, women and men continue to give time to, and effort to DEI without it being looked at as, um, here comes Tripti with her DEI agen agenda, you know, that it's taking time away from um, actual work or the perception that it's taking time away from uh, actual work. You know, I don't know any other way to do it, I'll be honest. We just have to set aside the time and and make an effort to do it. And just to add to a point, a very good point that Kathy just made and uh, to expand on a little bit about stereotypes. You know, we need to change the way s society looks at women. For example, I'll tell you what really irritates me is when I watch TV commercials. Mm. And when it's laundry detergent or soap, uh, who's showcasing it? A woman. It's always a woman, right? It's all, yeah. We've got to change that. Little girls are watching television, and that's what they see in their future, right? Yes. Why don't Why don't we? You know, uh, or, uh, you know. As you know, I'm of Indian descent. And I always joke about how you watch um, it, it, these sitcoms, and who's the doctor? It's always the nerdy Indian doctor, right? <laughs> I mean, it's the way we portray people. It's, we're always stereotyping people. Yeah. Let's break out of that model, you know, right? So, I, I've, so that's one thing I just wanted to comment on. But I, I'm not sure which, what other way to do it. You have to set aside time. Yeah. 
And um, there, I'm, <laughs> the irony is right now I'm um, the diversity officer for my unit at the university. <laughs> but but, but I, I make time to do it. Yeah. And um, I, I just don't, I don't know what else you could do. Yeah, you might get labeled as someone who's taking time away, but how else would you do it? And you have to integrate it into your work, workplace. Fair enough. And I can say, uh, sorry, go ahead, Kathy. You want to add to that? And Marita, you want? Yeah. That was, yeah. Uh, did you want to add anything to it, Kathy? No, totally agree uh, with you, Tripti. And I have to say, I've been one of those people that were on the, um, uh, uh, that took advantage of the fact that Tripti was always willing to share her professional um, experience and her opinions. And, and really, I've never seen her not give us time when we needed it. So definitely somebody who practices what she says. Um, this audience has been very active with questions. So I'm going to give each one of you about a minute and a half to give us advice to other women on um, how to make sure that they're, you know, what advice would you give to other women to make sure that um, inclusion is a priority for them, for their organizations, uh, what things that they should be working on to make change in the f to, so to make the future better for us and for generations to come. So I'll give each one of you about a, a minute to answer that and then I'm going to go to the audience. Uh, Marita, let's start with you. I'm not into really, I don't know. Uh, Can you microphone? <laughs> it depends on the context you're in. You know, you have to find the places in the context you're in that you can do that. It's kind of giving advice is, is really, I, I can't give specific advice on that. Uh, everybody can find a place where they can help with these kind of things. As I said, I, when I went around for the board of directors, you know, that was one of my platforms. So that was one place where, you know, I could do something, but you know, that kind of opportunity doesn't arise very often. So whatever you can do in your place, that's what I'd say. So what advice would I give to women? Yes. And um, the advice I give is work hard, stay the course, um, support each other, and um, don't, I, don't treat men any differently either. Don't, that's another piece of advice I'd like to give is, they're not necessarily, <laughs> they're, you, you, men are not necessarily evil or bad or anything. It's just the way our, the world evolved is where we, we are. And to undo that or make it evolve further, you just need to put in the extra effort to integrate women into the workforce, be supportive, hold the door open for others, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. that, those are my words of what. Thank advice. you. Okay, Kathy. Um, and I'll be brief as well, because I, I feel a lot of questions in the room. And not questions, also statements and experiences that other people want to share. So both to, to women and to men, um, very, very similar. Walk into the room, know that you belong there. Know that there is a history of all of us in computer science, whether you've been taught it or not. We're, we're all there. The pictures, the pictures don't lie. We, we, were, we were all there. The first teams were women and men. My next book will be telling the story of UNIVAC, the first commercial computer that launched the commercial computer industry. There were African-American engineers, women engineers, Jewish engineers. It was a time of racism, sexism, anti-Semitism in the United States in the 1950s. 50s, and yet all these amazing people came together. Um, so you belong in the room, know you belong in the room, walk into it like you have every right to be there. Do yourself a favor and help others. Listen for the quiet voices in the room. It's not just women. It's often people from other cultures, people who are speaking English as a second, third, or fifth language. Yeah. Um, help them communicate, and they will return the favor. They, you will be building your networks, because there are a lot of people in these rooms. We're international, and they all want to speak. But sometimes they need an invitation, and sometimes in their cultures they need an invitation. Um, so call on them, even if, even if they're the quiet people in the room. I just did that with a student, PhD student from China, and it turns out if I called on him in my class, he was ready to answer, but he wouldn't raise his hand. Um, and um, do your research. Do your research again. Do it three times. Do it four times. Um, because if you feel, it, it will make you feel better when you walk in the room, and it will make you sound like the expert that you are. And um, uh, Oh, and I was going to say, if you want to vet something, if you want to check out, sometimes you want to check out your ideas in new areas. New ideas are a little hard. You may 
put together a team of people who have different views than you do and run it by them and practice. And also practice public speaking. Um, that's one of the best skills I know in this area. Being able to say something in two or three minutes, which I might not have done here, is, is a really good skill. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really uh, excellent advice from everyone. Thank you, panel. It's been great. I know this audience has a lot of uh, comments probably to make, questions, so we'll go to the audience and you're helping us with the mic, so thank you. Um, questions? I see a hand, let's start from the closest over there uh, with Dr. Cogburn and then, down, and then down the circle to the other end, then back here to you. Thanks, Thomas. You didn't have to start with me. Um, You're our host. Thank, thank you, you very thank much you. for making this happen. Uh, we're so excited about this. We're just delighted to have everyone here, and the conversation has been just spectacular, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. And uh, Eduardo is on my bad list because he assigned me the task of summarizing these two days, and after just one day, I, I'm not sure I can do it. But I'm going to try, Eduardo. Um, so. This has been such a great panel. I wasn't going to make this comment, but this has been such a great panel that I, um, I feel like I can make, the, make this comment. And, and you've alluded to it as well. So for me, one of the things that I find particularly challenging is that as we focus on all of these wonderful strategies, strategies that we've talked about to get women involved, uh, I see so much progress with getting women involved and where I still see such profound disappointment and lack of participation is amongst uh, people of color, particularly African Americans, particularly African Americans. So if you look around the room and you see how many women are in the room, you're encouraged, right? Yeah. Look around the room and how many, see how many African Americans are in the room. Think about every room you'll be in next week and how many African Americans are in those rooms. When you go to ICANN, when you go to, not ICANN, uh, IGF, uh, every, all of those rooms, the number of African Americans is just very, very small, men or women. And to me, I just don't know what additional strategies we need to pursue to address that. So all of the strategies you talked about could be used for African Americans as well. And I know several of you mentioned that, um, but it's just a real concern of mine as we pr 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 promote the inclusion and uh, participation strategies, not to forget that very specific group. And there are other specific groups, but that's a very specific group that I would hope that we continue to look for. Thank, thank you, Derek. Very well said. Anyone wants to comment on this? I mean, that's a very good statement. Go ahead. Yeah, I would just say that in my lifetime, I've found that affirmative action programs have not been popular among a lot of people, but they have worked. Uh, and and uh, they particularly focused on women, you know, in the, in the past years. And then I think we need to do more focus, as you say, on, on, on uh, um, African Americans, indigenous people. We're talking about that now. So there's more work to do. We've only done a part of the work, but we're... We're only human, right? Thanks. Um, we're going to go down that semicircle, and we'll come back and circle back. So over there, yeah. Uh, the hand up there, yeah. Uh, thank you, all the speakers. Uh, my name is Sridhi Pramaji. I'm from Nepal. And uh, uh, you know, it's quite interesting to hear women leaders like this. Uh, but coming down from Nepal, it is like, you know, when you uh, talk about things as rightly said by Tripti, you know, the stereotype thinking has been a major problem, especially in Asia Pacific for women. Uh, you know, women are given education, but it's the mentality where they are told that these works are supposed to be done by men and these are not supposed to be done by women. So that is what is hindering it all. And apart from that, when we look at, you know, I've been in engaged with APR, IGF, APSIG, things like this. And a lot of the times, uh, the women participation is very less very less and we try to promote uh, them but but at the end of the day it, it is the fact that uh, you know women are coming and I think we, we we have to from our level from our societies from our uh, you know backgrounds we have to treat women we have to treat our daughters equally we have to teach them the value of equality that is what is lacking that is where you know uh, whether you look at all these forums uh, you know even 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 the smallest idea of uh, of uh, inclusion represent 
presentation has a challenge in terms of uh, whether we are going about matrix, whether we are going about, uh, you know, things like these come up. Because these are smaller issues where the values are important, where we have to treat pe people equally. Uh, you know, I, I've worked as a, uh, worked in a uh, software company and I hired more women than men. Why? I'll tell you. Men, they go out to take the group, smoke out. They, they are like that. Women, they are more sincere. That is a reality. Let me tell you, they are more sincere. They focus, they work. They gossip, they do gossip, but it is not like men. Men go out more frequently out for the smoke breaks and stuff like that. So I'm a strong supporter. I have my daughter as well. Uh, when she was there, you know, I was like hell scared. Do you know why? I was like hell scared because if there is a son, I could like beat him, but with a girl, I cannot. <laughs> like, and, and, and then when she touched me, when she touched me, I cried like a baby. And, and I'm proud to say I have a daughter and I will raise her like my son. She's going to be my son and, and she's going to you know, make me proud. I know that. Thank you. Excellent statement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to go down here to Jonathan. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I know that in the end it's a human problem, but as an engineer, my first impulse is to dehumanize it, so I apologize in advance. <clears throat> Every system has a built-in bias where you are um, a, a framework by which you break ties. And so very often when a bias is built into a system and people are used to a particular bias in the system, the way to correct it is to create the opposite bias to the system. In other words, as you say, um, I'm going to make this panel of uh, the CEO selection committee be half and half, even though it meant that I had to dig much deeper in, in order to do that. And, and, and so what I think has, ends up happening, a phenomenon I'm seeing in, in a lot of different areas, is that whoever previously benefited from the bias, even if they believe in fairness, um, believe that the next version should be perfect. In other words, uh, it should not be absolutely fair, right? And don't, don't create a new bias. It's, it's fear of the pendulum or something like that, I guess, is the way I would think about it. And that I feel like that's one of the biggest challenges, is that any time we're trying to make an overt effort to bring things to equal, it requires a form of inequality in the near term to accomplish it. And I think that can create pushback and fear on the part, in this case, men, right? But whoever is, whichever parties are, uh, were, the, were the beneficiaries beforehand. Thanks, Jonathan. Well this said. Is, oh. This is why I said, Jonathan, affirmative action was not a popular program. A lot of pushback. Right. Yeah, I know. And, and reasonably so, understanding, understandably. But it worked. You know, it, yeah, it hurts. John, Jonathan, I would say that's what's called evolution. You have winners and losers. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ron, you want to give it to Ron? Yeah, and then we go back to you. Go ahead, Ron. Thanks. I think related to the topic we just talked about, about um, um, prioritization, right? There's always that, um, I don't know, I'm just trying to project a little bit and imagine you're, you're all very successful, uh, so I want to commend you for that. And there's got to be this temptation sometimes that people look at you and like, you're only successful because you're a woman, right? And um, and I know that's not true, knowing knowing each of you, but how do you in, how do you internally address that? Like, does somebody really think I'm just here because I'm a woman and I got some special you know special preferential treatment? Or more importantly, women who are maybe earlier in their career and they're struggling with that dynamic of well, I don't want to just be advanced because you know I happen to be a woman. I want to be advanced because I'm really good at what I do. Like, how do you how do you manage that dynamic? Um, how have you managed it? And what would you say to other women in the room? How do they manage that going forward? Please. Honestly, I don't think about it. I, I don't. I can't be worried about it. There's so much to do. It'll hold you back. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's the way I deal with it. I don't even understand the question that you're asking. <laughs> when, I, when I started at ICANN, there was a group of technical people kids in their 20s and 30s in the black t-shirts. And there was a group of older men 
intellectual property attorneys in their blue and black suits and their gold cufflings, and they were in two different rooms. And I was the only one who spoke both languages. Uh, <laughs> and my job was to bang heads together and say, you guys have to talk to each other, particularly talking to the lawyers, much older than me. And generally, I was pregnant at the time. And they just looked at me. But um, you know that, that the lawyers had to talk to the young technologists and understand what was going on, or they wouldn't be able to create policy and law that made any sense. So I, we don't no, there was no affirmative action. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, totally. Um, Nyala had a question, uh, and you haven't picked it up. It was about something called the imposter syndrome. You know, I've, 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 I've experienced exactly what you said, and, and also felt like, am I an imposter? Because I'm a woman, you know, and maybe I'm, people think I shouldn't be here. Just have to push through it. That's all. <laughs> you know, just push through it, that it doesn't matter. I didn't pick it up because of time, but also honestly, because the more I thought about this, this is on them. If they think I don't belong, that's their problem. <laughs> um, I think we had a question from this gentleman in the, yeah. Hello, my name is Raymond Mamata from Accra, Ghana. I'm part of the team that organized the Ghana School on Internet Governance Fellowship. One challenge that I have noticed for the ladies in participating in the IG program when I interact with them is most of them say I don't have an IT background, so I don't see how I can engage in IG effectively. So fortunately, all of you have IT background, so it supports what they are claiming. What would be your advice to such people who say, I don't have IT background, so I wouldn't be very effective in the IG ecosystem? How will you encourage them to engage? Okay, sounds like great. Uh, I, I don't have an IT background. Um, so uh, there are a lot of other, there's a lot of other work to do. Um, you don't, I mean, you do have to, you do have to learn the language. You, know, you, do, you do have to know how to speak to people. You do have to do your homework and learn what's being talked about, but I have found it perfectly possible to work in this particular environment um, for many years without an IT background. So it can be done. You don't absolutely have to do it. Thank you. Did you want to add to that, Tripti? No? no? Okay. I think I do, actually. You do? Please, um, Kathy. First, encourage them. They, they can, they can, everybody's a user now, and uh, there's so much online that they, they can learn in so many online courses. But also, what we were talking about, raise your daughters and, and sons to pursue STEM. It's in, I, I found historically, unfortunately, that many of the women in computer science had a parent who was in computing. My father was an electrical engineer. We shouldn't, it, this is not true. For many years, it used to be that lawyers raise lawyers and doctors raise doctors, and now computer scientists and engineers raise computer scientists and engineers. There is so much need now in computing and in medicine and in law. You shouldn't have to have a parent to open the door for you. So we have to open the door and just encourage lots and lots of people to go in so that they have the backgrounds and they have the jobs. There are jobs out there, enormous, and the jobs are growing. And so um, everyone should, should be able to fill these. It's a good question. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, we are running out of time. Y no, you're okay? Um, Naila, I'm over here. I just want to make a point. If you if Go you ahead, mind. Alfredo. Uh, yeah. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Alfredo Calderon. For the past five or six years uh, with Eduardo Diaz, we were the founders or are the founders of the North American School of Internet Governance, and we've managed it. Uh, and I just want to, wanted to make the point to, to Raymond, I don't have an IT background. I'm a chemist. I'm a co-founder of the Virtual School of Internet Governance, and I don't, know, don't have a background in IG. I'm learning as we go forward. And I'm building these programs specifically because I want people to learn, and I'm learning with you guys. Every session that we have, I'm learning. And I want other people to learn the same way I'm learning together. So let's try, and, and this is a proposal that I have for all the men here. Let's build a program where we integrate women into the program, like this session. This is teaching and learning by example. So let's do that, okay? Thank you, Alfredo.
Thank you. Um, if I can just add one, are, po one point to that. Go ahead. So we used to talk a lot about pipelines and pipelines into STEM disciplines. And if you think about pipelines, that sort of suggests that you have to be there at the beginning to get into that pipeline in order to come out the other side. But the National Science Foundation and others are now talking about pathways because now there are multiple ways to get there. And Marita's last comment, you still have to know these things. And, and, and Kathy was saying there's so much content that you can learn these things. You can learn how to program. You can learn about the technology. You can learn these things. So you still have to have that knowledge uh, base. But there are now many ways to get there and not just a pipeline that if you miss it at the beginning, you're out. So. Very good point. Thank you. If if everyone is okay with staying, I know you guys are all busy. So yeah, please go ahead. Actually, it's an, this is Shah from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the things uh, is going to be changed. Like uh, in Asia, uh, most of the, uh, I will specifically say that South Asia, the women uh, they are a little bit shy. So still they are feeling hesitant speaking public uh, uh, places. But uh, uh, the things uh, uh, is day by day changing. For example, uh, in APRIGF, Asia Pacific Regional, we are encouraging women. Uh, we are giving fellowship more in 60% women and then 40% male. APC as well, we are uh, trying to follow these uh, rules as well. So what I feel that, uh, like last year's in Singapore, we did that both joint program. So from my country, Bangladesh, uh, one of the women selected, but her family members is restricted to, to go her allow in outside uh, the country. So the <laughs> family members is uh, in person meeting me that uh, whether it's uh, very safety or some things like that. So it's still in our country or the developing country or the poor countries that family is thinking about their daughters, however that <laughs> they could go outside and can be independently move around that. So I think uh, the, if the family supports comes from there, then women could go far away from uh, their position as well because they are very much talented and they have their capabilities in, and I seen that uh, the women are more dynamic than men's as well. So uh, everyone, if, if this uh, panel have a very great uh, experience uh, and very enthusiastic. Those women have heard, I think they will be very encouraged in uh, their future life. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Th thank, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate it. Can I make a quick comment? Sure. Oh, uh, I wanted to call one thing out. First, I appreciate all the questions that have been asked, but thus far they've all been men. Where are my women? Hi, my name is Nancy Chang. I'm from Seattle. And so I'm going to do a juicy, a very juicy one um, on, um, based off of what Shia said, was that, you know, why those families don't want their daughters to leave is because they're afraid of their safety. And so I know I'm not in technology. I've been technology adjacent. I worked a lot at the city of Redmond um, and, you know, just immersed in technology. But I think the issue is there's a lot of violence towards women and whether it's sexual harassment or seeing women as not as capable and um, you know knuckle dragging and insubordination and I, I think that those are big issues to have to ask men to raise you know the boys or I mean the whole community needs to raise boys in a way where they are respecting women and not seeing them as a threat but as part of a team to solve problems and so I guess my question is have you experienced that type of violence um, and and if you haven't or seen it um, I guess what can companies be better at doing, or is it a regulatory thing, or is it just calling the cops? But if people don't want to call the cops, then it's just a problem that's going to continue to happen. So I, I said a lot of things, so <laughs> respond however you need. So there was a lot packed in there. So I think there are multiple responses to that. First, what you were saying, it's, there has to be a cultural change. And those are very hard to change, but it needs to happen. And that, so you have to go deep into the culture and they have to recognize that, you know, it's time for them to evolve and make it an even playing field and respect women. And as you were also saying, right? And um, when it comes to violence, there's a cultural, cultural component to it. 
And in the professional world, we address that with policy, right? Anti-harassment policy and so forth. And, um, and I, I would challenge every man in this room to go back and, you know, if you see it, stand up for women and, um, you know, look at every female you see as your sister, as your mother, as your grandmother. Once you put on that lens, you'll treat women differently as your daughter, right? You wouldn't want your child to be treated that way. So it, it, that's, that's, you know, you hit the nail on the head. It's a complex, non-trivial problem, and it's worldwide. Okay. Because Tripti invited women to speak, I'm going to give the last word to Juliana. Thank you very much. I feel super inspired when I see women like you here, like giving the speech that inspire me, and I guess is it inspire other girls. I'm a, a young woman that works in the internet governance uh, environment, and I feel pleasant because there is kind of um, gender equality uh, concern in the events as well like uh, EGF, Internet Governance Forum. They care about gender equality during the panels. Uh, I was like in an event last week and they care about it as well. And there, I mean in the event that I was, we talk about um, the right of reproduction, the right of our bodies, about abortion online, and I guess we need to discuss these topics because we want to know about our bodies, we want to know about our sexuality, and we want to know our place in companies as well because I'm a software developer and I know there is other software developer girls here. And I remember like when I was re reading the profile of the the, my colleagues here, I was super happy because I saw at least 50% of women there and people that can be my colleague here and can be a partner in the future because I really, I really like the idea of having uh, projects about feminism and about um, inter, the interconnection of like um, uh, men and women working together to have a safe and healthy place and word to us, so I'm happy about it. Thank you, Juliana. I'm happy you're happy, thank you. Okay, I think we're really gonna end now. We're 10 minutes over time. Apologies to the organizers, but thank you deeply for putting this together, um, for putting NASIG all together, and then for calling for a specific panel like this to happen during NASIG. Thank you so much. <laughs> And really a huge thanks to all the panelists. I know they're very busy. Um, I know Kathy spent the whole day with us. I know Tripti is running a whole ICANN meeting. Uh, Marita's gonna do a lot of ALAC stuff next week and at large. So thank you so much uh, for t giving us your time this week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess, are you wrapping up? Yes. Yes. I will. I will take. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Can you take a picture? Uh, sure, sure. Mira, Senor Jose. Okay. Picture from for them. Okay. I guess uh, to the left. Vente para que le Oh, yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Well, they are taking the picture. I have a couple of announcements. I want to wrap up the day. Thank you so much. I think we have uh, top quality uh, sessions today. And uh, the people that are staying in the Marriott Courtyard, there will be a bus uh, sometime after 7, uh, so we can have a social reception now uh, by the uh, place where we have uh, lunch. And uh, so that's so we can keep talking and have some networking. And then we, from there we go to the uh, hotel.
Tomorrow is important. We live at the same time as today, at 7.45 in the morning, but you have to check out of the room. Okay? No, no. Tomorrow morning, burial, you know, just check out. Bring your luggage. We're going to put it in the bus, and we're going to leave it in the bus the whole day. Because after, uh, how many people are going back to the Mario Courtyard tomorrow that they're staying? You know, well, look, we're, we're all, no, no, I'm talking, I'm talking tomorrow Sunday. From here, you know, we are going to the Mario Marquis down, we, down uh, by the conference center where the ICANN meeting is going to be, okay? So that's why you need to bring your luggage and then you're going to check in there when we get there. So, uh, a, uh, all the slides for the present, all the presentations, all the slides, all the record, all the transcripts will be put in the website at, by the end of this month, okay? So you will have that record if you want to come back and all this has been recorded. It's, it's been transmitted through around 10 social uh, channels at the same time, including YouTube. So all these uh, uh, proceedings have been, is, are there for your record. Now, before you go to the social, now, take your stuff, you know, like this, and clean it up because, and there's, there are trash cans over there for, you know, just take your, our stuff and, and put it there. So don't, don't leave anything in the room because I don't think it's going to be clean Saturday. And uh, I want to thank our sponsors. Remember this morning that we have a PIR, Paul Diaz, I call Paul Diaz, that's that guy over there talking. Paul, I talked to you this morning, I presented PIR, the dot org. He has been supporting us since the first schools in, tw in 2018. So thanks, thanks to their sp his sponsorship. And as well, you know, we will talk about the sponsors tomorrow again. Thank you so much.